Today's book is 48 Laws of Power. Before we start, please subscribe and like the video to make more videos, and leave book suggestions in the comments. Law 22. Use the surrender tactic, transform weakness into power. Judgment when you are weaker, never fight for honor's sake, choose surrender instead. Surrender gives you time to recover, time to torment and irritate your conqueror, time to wait for his power to wane. Do not give him the satisfaction of fighting and defeating you, surrender first. By turning the other cheek you infuriate and unsettle him. Make surrender a tool of power. The chestnut and the fig tree A man who had climbed upon a certain fig tree, was bending the boughs toward him and plucking the ripe fruit, which he then put into his mouth to destroy and gnaw with his hard teeth. The chestnut, seeing this, tossed its long branches and with tumultuous rustle exclaimed, O oh fig! How much less protected by nature you are than I! See how my sweet offspring are set in close array, first clothed in soft wrappers over which is the hard but softly lined husk. And not content with this much care, nature has also given us these sharp and close-set spines, so that the hand of man cannot hurt us. Then the fig tree began to laugh, and after the laughter it said, You know well that man is of such ingenuity that he will bereave even you of your children. But in your case he will do it by means of rods and stones, and when they are felled he will trample them with his feet or hit them with stones, so that your offspring will emerge from their armor. Crushed and maimed, while I am touched carefully by his hands, and never, like you, with Roughness Leonardo da Vinci, 1452-1519 Transgression of the law The island of Melos is strategically situated in the heart of the Mediterranean. In classical times, the city of Athens dominated the sea and coastal areas around Greece, but Sparta, in the Peloponnese, had been Melos's original colonizer. During the Peloponnesian War, then, the Melians refused to ally themselves with Athens and remained loyal to Mother Sparta. In 416 BC the Athenians sent an expedition against Melos. Before launching an all-out attack, however, they dispatched a delegation to persuade the Melians to surrender and become an ally rather than suffer devastation and defeat. You know as well as we do, the delegate said, that the standard of justice depends on the equality of power to compel, and that in fact the strong do what they have the power to do and the weak accept what they have to accept. When the Melians responded that this denied the notion of fair play, the Athenians said that those in power determined what was fair and what was not. The Melians argued that this authority belonged to the gods, not to mortals. Our opinion of the gods and our knowledge of men, replied a member of the Athenian delegation, lead us to conclude that it is a general and necessary law of nature to rule whatever one can. The Melians would not budge. Sparta, they insisted, would come to their defense. The Athenians countered that the Spartans were a conservative, practical people, and would not help Melas because they had nothing to gain and a lot to lose by doing so. Finally the Melians began to talk of honor and the principle of resisting brute force. Do not be led astray by a false sense of honor, said the Athenians. Honor often brings men to ruin when they are faced with an obvious danger that somehow affects their pride. There is nothing disgraceful in giving way to the greatest city in Hellas when she is offering you such reasonable terms. The debate ended. The Melians discussed the issue among themselves, and decided to trust in the aid of the Spartans, the will of the gods, and the rightness of their cause. They politely declined the Athenians' offer. A few days later the Athenians invaded Melos. The Melians fought. Nobly, even without the Spartans, who did not come to their rescue. It took several attempts before the Athenians could surround and besiege their main city, but the Melians finally surrendered. The Athenians wasted no time, they put to death all the men of military age that they could capture, they sold the women and children as slaves, and they repopulate the island with their own colonists. Only a handful of Melians survived. Interpretation The Athenians were one of the most eminently practical people in history, 
and they made the most practical argument they could with the Melians, when you are weaker, there is nothing to be gained by fighting a useless fight. No one comes to help the weak, by doing so they would only put themselves in jeopardy. The weak are alone and must submit. Fighting gives you nothing to gain but martyrdom, and in the process a lot of people who do not believe in your cause will die. Weakness is no sin, and can even become a strength if you learn how to play it right. Had the Melians surrendered in the first place, they would have been able to sabotage the Athenians in subtle ways, or might have gotten what they could have out of the alliance and then left it when the Athenians themselves were weakened, as in fact happened several years later. Fortunes change and the mighty are often brought down. Surrender conceals great power, lulling the enemy into complacency, it gives you time to recoup, time to undermine, time for revenge. Never sacrifice that time in exchange for honor in a battle that you cannot win. Voltaire was living in exile in London at a time when anti-French sentiment was at its highest. One day walking through the streets, he found himself surrounded by an angry crowd. Hang him! Hang the Frenchman, they yelled. Voltaire calmly addressed the mob with the following words, Men of England. You wish to kill me because I am a Frenchman. Am I not punished enough in not being born an Englishman? The crowd cheered his thoughtful words, and escorted him safely back to his lodgings. The Little, Brown Book of Anecdotes, Clifton Fadiman, ed., 1985. Weak people never give way when they ought to. Cardinal de Retz, 1613-1679. Observance of the law sometime in the 1920s the German writer Bertolt Brecht became a convert to the cause of communism. From then on his plays, essays, and poems reflected his revolutionary fervor, and he generally tried to make his ideological statements as clear as possible. When Hitler came to power in Germany, Brecht and his communist colleagues became marked men. He had many friends in the United States, Americans who sympathized with his beliefs, as well as fellow German intellectuals who had fled Hitler. In 1941, accordingly, Brecht emigrated to the United States, and chose to settle in Los Angeles, where he hoped to make a living in the film business. Over the next few years Brecht wrote screenplays with a pointedly anti-capitalist slant. He had little success in Hollywood, so in 1947, the war having ended, he decided to return to Europe. That same year, however, the U.S. Congress's House Un-American Activities Committee began its investigation into supposed communist infiltration in Hollywood. It began to gather information on Brecht, who had so openly espoused Marxism, and on September 19, 1947, only a month before he had planned to leave the United States, he received a subpoena to appear before the committee. In addition to Brecht, a number of other writers, producers, and directors were summoned to appear as well, and this group came to be known as the Hollywood 19. Before going to Washington, the Hollywood 19 met to decide on a plan of action. Their approach would be confrontational. Instead of answering questions about their membership, or lack of it, in the Communist Party, they would read prepared statements that would challenge the authority of the committee and argue that its activities were unconstitutional. Even if this strategy meant imprisonment, it would gain publicity for their cause. Brecht disagreed. What good was it, he asked, to play the martyr and gain a little public sympathy if in the process they lost the ability to stage their plays and sell their scripts for years to come. He felt certain they were all more intelligent than the members of the committee. Why lower themselves to the level of their opponents by arguing with them? Why not outfox the committee by appearing to surrender to it while subtly mocking? It The Hollywood 19 listened to Brecht politely, but decided to stick to their plan, leaving Brecht to go his own way. The committee finally summoned Brecht on October 30th. They expected him to do what others among the Hollywood 19 who had testified before him had done, argue, refuse to answer questions, challenge the committee's right to hold its hearing, even yell and hurl insults. Much to their surprise, however, Brecht was the very picture of congeniality. He wore a suit, something he rarely did, smoked a cigar, 
he had heard that the committee chairman was a passionate cigar smoker, answered their questions politely, and generally deferred to their authority. Unlike the other witnesses, Brecht answered the question of whether he belonged to the Communist Party, he was not a member, he said, which happened to be the truth. One committee member asked him, is it true you have written a number of revolutionary plays? Brecht had written many plays with overt communist messages, but he responded, I have written a number of poems and songs and plays in the fight against Hitler and, of course, they can be considered, therefore, as revolutionary because I, of course, was for the overthrow of that government. This statement went unchallenged. Brecht's English was more than adequate, but he used an interpreter throughout his testimony, a tactic that allowed him to play subtle games with language. When committee members found communist leanings in lines from English editions of his poems, he would repeat the lines in German for the interpreter, who would then retranslate them, and somehow they would come out innocuous. At one point a committee member read one of Brecht's revolutionary poems out loud in English, and asked him if he had written it. No, he responded, I wrote a German poem, which is very different from this. The author's elusive answers baffled the committee members, but his politeness and the way he yielded to their authority made it impossible for them to get angry with him. After only an hour of questioning, the committee members had had enough. Thank you very much, said the chairman, you are a good example to the other witnesses. Not only did they free him, they offered to help him if he had any trouble with immigration officials who might detain him for their own reasons. The following day, Brecht left the United States, never to return. Interpretation The Hollywood 19th confrontational approach won them a lot of sympathy, and years later they gained a kind of vindication in public opinion. But they were also blacklisted, and lost valuable years of profitable working time. Brecht, on the other hand, expressed his disgust at the committee more indirectly. It was not that he changed his beliefs or compromised his values, instead, during his short testimony, he kept the upper hand by appearing to yield while all the time running circles around the committee with vague responses, outright lies that went unchallenged because they were wrapped in enigmas, and word games. In the end he kept the freedom to continue his revolutionary writing, as opposed to suffering imprisonment or detainment in the United States, even while subtly mocking the committee and its authority with his pseudo-obedience. Keep in mind the following, people trying to make a show of their authority are easily deceived by the surrender tactic. Your outward sign of submission makes them feel important, satisfied that you respect them, they become easier targets for a later counterattack, or for the kind of indirect ridicule used by Brecht. Measuring your power over time, never sacrifice long-term maneuverability for the short-lived glories of martyrdom. When the great lord passes, the wise peasant bows deeply and silently farts. Ethiopian Proverb Keys to power What gets us into trouble in the realm of power is often our own overreaction to the moves of our enemies and rivals. That overreaction creates problems we would have avoided had we been more reasonable. It also has an endless rebound effect, for the enemy then overreacts as well, much as the Athenians did to the Melians. It is always our first instinct to react, to meet aggression with some other kind of aggression. But the next time someone pushes you and you find yourself starting to react, try this, do not resist or fight back, but yield, turn the other cheek, bend. You will find that this often neutralizes their behavior, they expected, even wanted you to react with force and so they are caught off guard and confounded by your lack of resistance. By yielding, you in fact control the situation, because your surrender is part of a larger plan to lull them into believing they have defeated you. This is the essence of the surrender tactic, inwardly you stay firm, but outwardly you bend. Deprived of a reason to get angry, your opponents will often be bewildered instead. And they are unlikely to react with more violence, which would demand a reaction from you. Instead you are allowed the time and space to plot the countermoves that will bring them down. In the battle of the intelligent against the brutal and the aggressive, the surrender tactic is the supreme weapon. 
It does require self-control, those who genuinely surrender give up their freedom, and may be crushed by the humiliation of their defeat. You have to remember that you only appear to surrender, like the animal that plays dead to save its hide. We have seen that it can be better to surrender than to fight, faced with a more powerful opponent and a sure defeat, it is often also better to surrender than to run away. Running away may save you for the time being, but the aggressor will eventually catch up with you. If you surrender instead, you have an opportunity to coil around your enemy and strike with your fangs from close up. In 473 BC, in ancient China, King Go Jin of Yu suffered a horrible defeat from the ruler of Wu in the Battle of Fujiao. Go Jin wanted to flee, but he had an advisor who told him to surrender and to place himself in the service of the ruler of Wu, from which position he could study the man and plot his revenge. Deciding to follow this advice, Go Jin gave the ruler all of his riches, and went to work in his conqueror's stables as the lowest servant. For three years he humbled himself before the ruler, who then, finally satisfied of his loyalty, allowed him to return home. Inwardly, however, Go Jin had spent those three years gathering information and plotting revenge. When a terrible drought struck Wu, and the kingdom was weakened by inner turmoil, he raised an army, invaded, and won with ease. That is the power behind surrender, it gives you the time and the flexibility to plot a devastating counterblow. Had Go Jin run away, he would have lost this chance. When foreign trade began to threaten Japanese independence in the mid-19th century, the Japanese debated how to defeat the foreigners. One minister, Hatamasa Yoshi, wrote a memorandum in 1857 that influenced Japanese policy for years to come, I am therefore convinced that our policy should be to conclude friendly alliances, to send ships to foreign countries everywhere and conduct trade, to copy the foreigners where they are at their best and so repair our own shortcomings, to foster our national strength and complete our armaments, and so gradually subject the foreigners to our influence until in the end all the countries of the world know the blessings of perfect tranquility and our hegemony is acknowledged throughout the globe. This is a brilliant application of the law, you surrender to gain access to your enemy. Learn his ways, insinuate yourself with him slowly, outwardly conform to his customs, but inwardly maintain your own culture. Eventually you will emerge victorious, for while he considers you weak and inferior, and takes no precautions against you, you are using the time to catch up and surpass him. This soft, permeable form of invasion is often the best, for the enemy has nothing to react against, prepare for, or resist. And had Japan resisted Western influence by force, it might well have suffered a devastating invasion that would have permanently altered its culture. Surrender can also offer a way of mocking your enemies, of turning their power against them, as it did for Brecht. Milan Kundera's novel The Joke, based on the author's experiences in a penal camp in Czechoslovakia, tells the story of how the prison guards organized a relay race, guards against prisoners. For the guards this was a chance to show off their physical superiority. The prisoners knew they were expected to lose, so they went out of their way to oblige, miming exaggerated exertion while barely moving, running a few yards and collapsing, limping, jogging ever so slowly while the guards raced ahead at full speed. Both by joining the race. And by losing it, they had obliged the guards obediently, but there. Overobedience had mocked the event to the point of ruining it. Overobedience, surrender, was here a way to demonstrate superiority in a reverse manner. Resistance would have engaged the prisoners in the cycle of violence, lowering them to the guards' level. Overobeying the guards, however, made them ridiculous, yet they could not rightly punish the prisoners, who had only done what they asked. Power is always in flux, since the game is by nature fluid and an arena of constant struggle, those with power almost always find themselves eventually on the downward swing. If you find yourself temporarily weakened, the surrender tactic is perfect for raising yourself up again, it disguises your ambition, it teaches you patience and self-control, key skills in the game, and it puts you in the best possible position for taking advantage of your oppressor's sudden slide. If you run away or fight back, in the long run you cannot win. If you surrender, 
you will almost always emerge victorious. Image, an oak tree. The oak that resists the wind loses its branches one by one, and with nothing left to protect it, the trunk finally snaps. The oak that bends lives longer, its trunk growing wider, its roots deeper and more tenacious. Authority, ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let them have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Jesus Christ, in Matthew 5 verses 38-41 Reversal the point of surrendering is to save your hide for a later date when you can reassert yourself. It is precisely to avoid martyrdom that one surrenders, but there are times when the enemy will not relent, and martyrdom seems the only way out. Furthermore, if you are willing to die, others may gain power and inspiration from your example. Yet martyrdom, surrender's reversal, is a messy, inexact tactic, and is as violent as the aggression it combats. For every famous martyr there are thousands more who have inspired neither a religion nor a rebellion, so that if martyrdom does sometimes grant a certain power, it does so unpredictably. More important, you will not be around to enjoy that power, such as it is. And there is finally something selfish and arrogant about martyrs, as if they felt their followers were less important than their own glory. When power deserts you, it is best to ignore this law's reversal. Leave. Martyrdom alone, the pendulum will swing back your way eventually, and you should stay alive to see it. Law 23. Concentrate your forces. Judgment can serve your forces and energies by keeping them concentrated at their strongest point. You gain more by finding a rich mine and mining it deeper, than by flitting from one shallow mine to another, intensity defeats extensity every time. When looking for sources of power to elevate you, find the one key patron, the fat cow who will give you milk for a long time to come. The goose and the horse a goose who was plucking grass upon a common thought herself affronted by a horse who fed near her, and, in hissing accents, thus addressed him, I am certainly a more noble and perfect animal than you, for the whole range and extent of your faculties is confined to one element. I can walk upon the ground as well as you, I have, besides, wings, with which I can raise myself in the air, and when I please, I can sport on ponds and lakes, and refresh myself in the cool waters. I enjoy the different powers of a bird, a fish, and a quadruped. The horse, snorting somewhat disdainfully, replied, It is true you inhabit three elements, but you make no very distinguished figure in any one of them. You fly, indeed, but your flight is so heavy and clumsy, that you have no right to put yourself on a level with the lark or the swallow. You can swim on the surface of the waters, but you cannot live in them as fishes do, you cannot find your food in that element, nor glide smoothly along the bottom of the waves. And when you walk, or rather, waddle, upon the ground, with your broad feet and your long neck stretched out, hissing at everyone who passes by, you bring upon yourself the derision of all beholders. I confess that I am only formed to move upon the ground, but how graceful is my make! How well turned my limbs! How highly finished my whole body! How great my strength! How astonishing my speed! I had much rather be confined to one element, and be admired in that, than be a goose in all. Fables from Boccaccio and Chaucer, Dr. John Aiken, 1747 to 1822. Transgression of the law in China in the early 6th century BC, the Kingdom of Wu began a war with the neighboring northern provinces of the Middle Kingdom. Wu was a growing power, but it lacked the great history and civilization of the Middle Kingdom, for centuries the center of Chinese culture. By defeating the Middle Kingdom, the King of Wu would instantly raise his status. The war began with great fanfare and several victories, but it soon bogged down. A victory on one front would leave the Wu armies vulnerable on another. 
The king's chief minister and advisor, Wu Tzu Su, warned him that the barbarous state of Yu, to the south, was beginning to notice the kingdom of Wu's problems and had designs to invade. The king only laughed at such worries, one more big victory and the great middle kingdom would be his. In the year 490, Wu Tzu Su sent his son away to safety in the kingdom of Qi. In doing so he sent the king a signal that he disapproved of the war. And that he believed the king's selfish ambition was leading Wu to ruin. The king, sensing betrayal, lashed out at his minister, accusing him of a lack of loyalty and, in a fit of anger, ordered him to kill himself. Wu Tzuzi obeyed his king, but before he plunged the knife into his chest, he cried, Tear out my eyes, O king, and fix them on the gate of Wu, so that I may see the triumphant entry of you. As Wu Tzu Su had predicted, within a few years a Yu army passed beneath the gate of Wu. As the barbarians surrounded the palace, the king remembered his minister's last words, and felt the dead man's disembodied eyes watching his disgrace. Unable to bear his shame, the king killed himself, covering his face so that he would not have to meet the reproachful gaze of his minister in the next world. Interpretation The story of Wu is a paradigm of all the empires that have come to ruin by overreaching. Drunk with success and sick with ambition, such empires expand to grotesque proportions and meet a ruin that is total. This is what happened to ancient Athens, which lusted for the faraway island of Sicily and ended up losing its empire. The Romans stretched the boundaries of their empire to encompass vast territories, in doing so they increased their vulnerability, and the chances of invasion from yet another barbarian tribe. Their useless expansion led their empire into oblivion. For the Chinese, the fate of the Kingdom of Wu serves as an elemental lesson on what happens when you dissipate your forces on several fronts, losing sight of distant dangers for the sake of present gain. If you are not in danger, says Sun Tzu, do not fight. It is almost a physical law, what is bloated beyond its proportions inevitably collapses. The mind must not wander from goal to goal, or be distracted by success from its sense of purpose and proportion. What is concentrated, coherent, and connected to its past has power. What is dissipated, divided, and distended rots and falls to the ground. The bigger it bloats, the harder it falls. Observance of the Law The Rothschild banking family had humble beginnings in the Jewish ghetto of Frankfurt, Germany. The city's harsh laws made it impossible for Jews to mingle outside the ghetto, but the Jews had turned this into a virtue, it made them self-reliant, and zealous to preserve their culture at all costs. Mayor Amschkel, the first of the Rothschilds to accumulate wealth by lending money, in the late 18th century, well understood the power that comes from this kind of concentration and cohesion. First, Mayor Amschkel allied himself with one family, the powerful princes of Thurn Und Taxis. Instead of spreading his services out, he made himself these princes' primary banker. Second, he entrusted none of his business to outsiders, using only his children and close relatives. The more unified and tight-knit the family, the more powerful it would become. Soon Mayor Amschkel's five sons were running the business. And when Mayor Amschkel lay dying, in 1812, he refused to name a principal heir, instead. Setting up all of his sons to continue the family tradition, so that they would stay united and would resist the dangers of diffusion and of infiltration by outsiders. Once Mayor Amschkel's sons controlled the family business, they decided that the key to wealth on a larger scale was to secure a foothold in the finances of Europe as a whole, rather than being tied to any one country or prince. Of the five brothers, Nathan had already opened up shop in London. In 1813 James moved to Paris. Amschkel remained in Frankfurt, Salomon established himself in Vienna, and Karl, the youngest son, went to Naples. With each sphere of influence covered, they could tighten their hold on Europe's financial markets. Beware of dissipating your powers, strive constantly to concentrate them. Genius thinks it can do whatever it sees others doing, but it is sure to repent of every ill-judged outlay. Johann von Goethe, 1749-1832
This widespread network, of course, opened the Rothschilds to the very danger of which their father had warned them, diffusion, division, dissension. They avoided this danger, and established themselves as the most powerful force in European finance and politics, by once again resorting to the strategy of the ghetto, excluding outsiders, concentrating their forces. The Rothschilds established the fastest courier system in Europe, allowing them to get news of events before all their competitors. They held a virtual monopoly on information. And their internal communications and correspondence were written in Frankfurt Yiddish, and in a code that only the brothers could decipher. There was no point in stealing this information, no one could understand it. Even the Shodas bankers cannot find their way through the Rothschild maze, admitted a financier who had tried to infiltrate the clan. In 1824 James Rothschild decided it was time to get married. This presented a problem for the Rothschilds, since it meant incorporating an outsider into the Rothschild clan, an outsider who could betray its secrets. James therefore decided to marry within the family, and chose the daughter of his brother Salomon. The brothers were ecstatic, this was the perfect solution to their marriage problems. James's choice now became the family. Policy, two years later, Nathan married off his daughter to Salomon's son. In the years to come, the five brothers arranged 18 matches among their children, 16 of these being contracted between first cousins. We are like the mechanism of a watch, each part is essential, said brother Salomon. As in a watch, every part of the business moved in concert with every other, and the inner workings were invisible to the world, which only saw the movement of the hands. While other rich and powerful families suffered irrecoverable downturns during the tumultuous first half of the 19th century, the tight-knit Rothschilds managed not only to preserve but to expand their unprecedented wealth. Interpretation The Rothschilds were born in strange times. They came from a place that had not changed in centuries, but lived in an age that gave birth to the Industrial Revolution, the French Revolution, and an endless series of upheavals. The Rothschilds kept the past alive, resisted the patterns of dispersion of their era and for this are emblematic of the law of concentration. No one represents this better than James Rothschild, the son who established himself in Paris. In his lifetime James witnessed the defeat of Napoleon, the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy, the bourgeois monarchy of Orleans, the return to a republic, and finally the enthronement of Napoleon III. French styles and fashions changed at a relentless pace during all this turmoil. Without appearing to be a relic of the past, James steered his family as if the ghetto lived on within them. He kept alive his clan's inner cohesion and strength. Only through such an anchoring in the past was the family able to thrive amidst such chaos. Concentration was the foundation of the Rothschild's power, wealth, and stability. The best strategy is always to be very strong, first in general, then at the decisive point. There is no higher and simpler law of strategy than that of keeping one's forces concentrated. In short the first principle is, act with the utmost concentration. On war, Karl von Clausewitz, 1780-1831. Keys to power the world is plagued by greater and greater division, within countries, political groups, families, even individuals. We are all in a state of total distraction and diffusion, hardly able to keep our minds in one direction before we are pulled in a thousand others. The modern world's level of conflict is higher than ever, and we have internalized it in our own lives. The solution is a form of retreat inside ourselves, to the past, to more concentrated forms of thought and action. As Schopenhauer wrote, intellect is a magnitude of intensity, not a magnitude of extensity. Napoleon knew the value of concentrating your forces at the enemy's weakest spot, it was the secret of his success on the battlefield. But his willpower and his mind were equally modeled on this notion. Single-mindedness of purpose, total concentration on the goal, and the use of these qualities against people less focused, people in a state of distraction, such. An arrow will find its mark every time and overwhelm the enemy. 
Casanova attributed his success in life to his ability to concentrate on a single goal and push at it until it yielded. It was his ability to give himself over completely to the women he desired that made him so intensely seductive. For the weeks or months that one of these women lived in his orbit, he thought of no one else. When he was imprisoned in the treacherous, leads, of the Doge's palace in Venice, a prison from which no one had ever escaped, he concentrated his mind on the single goal of escape, day after day. A change of cells, which meant that months of digging had all been for naught, did not discourage him, he persisted and eventually escaped. I have always believed, he later wrote, that when a man gets it into his head to do something, and when he exclusively occupies himself in that design, he must succeed, whatever the difficulties. That man will become Grand Vizier or Pope. Concentrate on a single goal, a single task, and beat it into submission. In the world of power you will constantly need help from other people, usually those more powerful than you. The fool flits from one person to another, believing that he will survive by spreading himself out. It is a corollary of the law of concentration, however, that much energy is saved. And more power is attained, by affixing yourself to a single, appropriate source of power. The scientist Nikola Tesla ruined himself by believing that he somehow maintained his independence by not having to serve a single master. He even turned down J. P. Morgan, who offered him a rich contract. In the end, Tesla's independence meant that he could depend on no single patron, but was always having to toady up to a dozen of them. Later in his life he realized his mistake. All the great Renaissance painters and writers wrestled with this problem, none more so than the 16th century writer Pietro Aretino. Throughout his life Aretino suffered the indignities of having to please this prince and that. At last, he had had enough, and decided to woo Charles V, promising the emperor the services of his powerful pen. He finally discovered the freedom that came from attachment to a single source of power. Michelangelo found this freedom with Pope Julius II, Galileo with the Medicis. In the end, the single patron appreciates your loyalty and becomes dependent on your services, in the long run the master serves the slave. Finally, power itself always exists in concentrated forms. In any organization it is inevitable for a small group to hold the strings. And often it is not those with the titles. In the game of power, only the fool flails about without fixing his target. You must find out who controls the operations, who is the real director behind the scenes. As Richelieu discovered at the beginning of his rise to the top of the French political scene during the early 17th century, it was not King Louis XIII who decided things, it was the king's mother. And so he attached himself to her, and catapulted through the ranks of the courtiers, all the way to the top. It is enough to strike oil once, your wealth and power are assured for a lifetime. Image, the arrow. You cannot hit two targets with one arrow. If your thoughts stray, you miss the enemy's heart. Mind and arrow must become one. Only with such concentration of mental and physical power can your arrow hit the target and pierce the heart. Authority, prize intensity more than extensity. Perfection resides in quality, not quantity. Extent alone never rises above mediocrity, and it is the misfortune of men with wide general interests that while they would like to have their finger in every pie, they have one in none. Intensity gives eminence, and rises to the heroic in matters sublime. Baltasar Gratian, 1601-1658 Reversal There are dangers in concentration, and moments when dispersion is the proper tactical move. Fighting the nationalists for control of China, Mao Zedong and the communists fought a protracted war on several fronts, using sabotage and ambush as their main weapons. Dispersal is often suitable for the weaker side, it is, in fact, a crucial principle of guerrilla warfare. When fighting a stronger army, concentrating your forces only makes you an easier target, better to dissolve into the scenery and frustrate your enemy with the elusiveness of your presence. Tying yourself to a single source of power has one preeminent danger, 
if that person dies, leaves, or falls from grace, you suffer. This is what happened to Cesare Borgia, who derived his power from his father, Pope Alexander VI. It was the Pope who gave Cesare armies to fight with and wars to wage in his name. When he suddenly died, perhaps from poison, Cesare was as good as dead. He had made far too many enemies over the years, and was now without his father's protection. In cases when you may need protection, then, it is often wise to entwine yourself around several sources of power. Such a move would be especially prudent in periods of great tumult and violent change, or when your enemies are numerous. The more patrons and masters you serve the less risk you run if one of them falls from power. Such dispersion will even allow you to play one off against the other. Even if you concentrate on the single source of power, you still must. Practice caution, and prepare for the day when your master or patron is no longer there to help you. Finally, being too single-minded in purpose can make you an intolerable bore, especially in the arts. The Renaissance painter Paolo Uccello was so obsessed with perspective that his paintings look lifeless and contrived. Whereas Leonardo da Vinci interested himself in everything, architecture, painting, warfare, sculpture, mechanics. Diffusion was the source of his power. But such genius is rare, and the rest of us are better off erring on the side of intensity. Law 24. Play the perfect courtier. Judgment the perfect courtier thrives in a world where everything revolves around power and political dexterity. He has mastered the art of indirection, he flatters, yields to superiors, and asserts power over others in the most oblique and graceful manner. Learn and apply the laws of courtiership and there will be no limit to how far you can rise in the court. Court society It is a fact of human nature that the structure of a court society forms itself around power. In the past, the court gathered around the ruler, and had many functions, besides keeping the ruler amused, it was a way to solidify the hierarchy of royalty, nobility, and the upper classes, and to keep the nobility both subordinate and close to the ruler, so that he could keep an eye on them. The court serves power in many ways, but most of all it glorifies the ruler, providing him with a microcosmic world that must struggle to please him. The two dogs Barbos, the faithful yard dog who serves his master zealously, happens to see his old acquaintance Juju, the curly lapdog, seated at the window on a soft down cushion. Sidling fondly up to her, like a child to a parent, he all but weeps with emotion, and there, under the window, he whines, wags his tail, and bounds about. What sort of life do you lead now, Jujutka, ever since the master took you into his mansion? You remember, no doubt, how we often used to suffer hunger out in the yard. What is your present service like? It would be a sin in me to murmur against my good fortune, answers Jujutka. My master cannot make enough of me. I live amidst riches and plenty, and I eat and drink off silver. I frolic with the master, and, if I get tired, I take my ease on carpets or on a soft couch. And how do you get on? I, replies Barbos, letting his tail dangle like a whip, and hanging his head. I live as I used. To do. I suffer from cold and hunger, and here, while guarding my master's house, I have to. Sleep at the foot of the wall, and I get drenched in the rain. And if I bark at the wrong time, I am whipped. But how did you, Juju, who were so small and weak, get taken into favor, while I jump out of my skin to no purpose? What is it you do? What is it you do? A pretty question to ask, replied Juju, mockingly. I walk upon my hind legs. Fables, Ivan Krilov, 1768-1844 To be a courtier was a dangerous game. A 19th-century Arab traveler to the court of Darfur, in what is now Sudan, reported that courtiers there had to do whatever the sultan did, if he were injured, they had to suffer the same injury, if he fell off his horse during a hunt, they fell, too. Mimicry like this appeared in courts all over the world. More troublesome was the danger of displeasing the ruler, one wrong move spelled death or exile. 
The successful courtier had to walk a tightrope, pleasing but not pleasing too much, obeying but somehow distinguishing himself from the other courtiers, while also never distinguishing himself so far as to make the ruler insecure. Great courtiers throughout history have mastered the science of manipulating people. They make the king feel more kingly, they make everyone else fear their power. They are magicians of appearance, knowing that most things at court are judged by how they seem. Great courtiers are gracious and polite, their aggression is veiled and indirect. Masters of the word, they never say more than necessary, getting the most out of a compliment or hidden insult. They are magnets of pleasure, people want to be around them because they know how to please, yet they neither fawn nor humiliate themselves. Great courtiers become the king's favorites, enjoying the benefits of that position. They often end up more powerful than the ruler, for they are wizards in the accumulation of influence. Many today dismiss court life as a relic of the past, a historical curiosity. They reason, according to Machiavelli, as though heaven, the sun, the elements, and men had changed the order of their motions and power, and were different from what they were in ancient times. There may be no more sun kings but there are still plenty of people who believe the sun revolves around them. The royal court may have more or less disappeared, or at least lost its power, but courts and courtiers still exist because power still exists. A courtier is rarely asked to fall off a horse anymore, but the laws that govern court politics are as timeless as the laws of power. There is much to be learned, then, from great courtiers past and present. The Laws of Court Politics Avoid ostentation. It is never prudent to prattle on about yourself or call too much attention to your actions. The more you talk about your deeds the more suspicion you cause. You also stir up enough envy among your peers to induce treachery and backstabbing. Be careful, ever so careful, in trumpeting your own achievements, and always talk less about yourself than about other people. Modesty is generally preferable. Practice nonchalance. Never seem to be working too hard. Your talent must appear to flow naturally, with an ease that makes people take you for a genius rather than a workaholic. Even when something demands a lot of sweat, make it look effortless, people prefer to not see your blood and toil, which is another form of ostentation. It is better for them to marvel at how gracefully you have achieved your accomplishment than to wonder why it took so much work. Be frugal with flattery. It may seem that your superiors cannot get enough flattery, but too much of even a good thing loses its value. It also stirs up suspicion among your peers. Learn to flatter indirectly, by downplaying your own contribution, for example, to make your master look better. It is a wise thing to be polite, Consequently, it is a stupid thing to be rude. To make enemies by unnecessary and willful incivility, is just as insane a proceeding as to set your house on fire. For politeness is like a counter, an avowedly false coin, with which it is foolish to be stingy. A sensible man will be generous in the use of it. Wax, a substance naturally hard and brittle, can be made soft by the application of a little warmth, so that it will take any shape you please. In the same way, by being polite and friendly, you can make people pliable and obliging, even though they are apt to be crabbed and malevolent. Hence politeness is to human nature what warmth is to wax. Arthur Schopenhauer, 1788-1860 Arrange to be noticed. There is a paradox, you cannot display yourself too brazenly, yet you must also get yourself noticed. In the court of Louis XIV, whoever the king decided to look at rose instantly in the court hierarchy. You stand no chance of rising if the ruler does not notice you in the swamp of courtiers. This task requires much art. It is often initially a matter of being seen, in the literal sense. Pay attention to your physical appearance, then, and find a way to create a distinctive, a subtly distinctive, style and image. Alter your style and language according to the person you are dealing with. The pseudo-belief in equality, the idea that talking and acting the same way with everyone, no matter what their rank, makes you somehow a paragon of civilization, is a terrible mistake. 
those below you will take it as a form of condescension, which it is, and those above you will be offended, although they may not admit it. You must change your style and your way of speaking to suit each person. This is not lying, it is acting, and acting is an art, not a gift from God. Learn the art. This is also true for the great variety of cultures found in the modern court, never assume that your criteria of behavior and judgment are universal. Not only is an inability to adapt to another culture the height of barbarism, it puts you at a disadvantage. Never be the bearer of bad news. The king kills the messenger who brings bad news, this is a cliché but there is truth to it. You must struggle and if necessary lie and cheat to be sure that the lot of the bearer of bad news falls on a colleague, never on you. Bring only good news and your approach will gladden your master. Never affect friendliness and intimacy with your master. He does not want a friend for a subordinate, he wants a subordinate. Never approach him in an easy, friendly way, or act as if you are on the best of terms, that is his prerogative. If he chooses to deal with you on this level, assume a wary chumminess. Otherwise err in the opposite direction, and make the distance between you clear. Never criticize those above you directly. This may seem obvious, but there are often times when some sort of criticism is necessary, to say nothing, or to give no advice, would open you to risks of another sort. You must learn, however, to couch your advice and criticism as indirectly and as politely as possible. Think twice, or three times, before deciding you have made them sufficiently circuitous. Err on the side of subtlety and gentleness. Be frugal in asking those above you for favors. Nothing irritates a master more than having to reject someone's request. It stirs up guilt and resentment. Ask for favors as rarely as possible, and know when to stop. Rather than making yourself the supplicant, it is always better to earn your favors, so that the ruler bestows them willingly. Most important, do not ask for favors on another person's behalf, least of all a friend's. Never joke about appearances or taste. A lively wit and a humorous disposition are essential qualities for a good courtier, and there are times when vulgarity is appropriate and engaging. But avoid any kind of joke about appearance or taste, two highly sensitive areas, especially with those above you. Do not even try it when you are away from them. You will dig your own grave. Do not be the court cynic. Express admiration for the good work of others. If you constantly criticize your equals or subordinates some of that criticism will rub off on you, hovering over you like a gray cloud wherever you go. People will groan at each new cynical comment, and you will irritate them. By expressing modest admiration for other people's achievements, you paradoxically call attention to your own. The ability to express wonder and amazement, and seem like you mean it, is a rare and dying talent, but one still greatly valued. Be self-observant. The mirror is a miraculous invention, without it you would commit great sins against beauty and decorum. You also need a mirror for your actions. This can sometimes come from other people telling you what they see in you, but that is not the most trustworthy method, you must be the mirror, training your mind to try to see yourself as others see you. Are you acting too obsequious? Are you trying too hard to please? Do you seem desperate for attention, giving the impression that you are on the decline? Be observant about yourself and you will avoid a mountain of blunders. Master your emotions. As an actor in a great play, you must learn to cry and laugh on command and when it is appropriate. You must be able both to disguise your anger and frustration and to fake your contentment and agreement. You must be the master of your own face. Call it lying if you like, but if you prefer to not play the game and to always be honest and upfront, do not complain when others call you obnoxious and arrogant. Fit the spirit of the times. A slight affectation of a past era can be charming, as long as you choose a period at least 20 years back, wearing the fashions of 10 years ago is ludicrous, unless you enjoy the role of court jester. Your spirit and way of thinking must keep up with the times, even if the times offend your sensibilities. Be too forward-thinking, however, and no one will understand you. 
It is never a good idea to stand out too much in this area, you are best off at least being able to mimic the spirit of the times. Be a source of pleasure. This is critical. It is an obvious law of human nature that we will flee what is unpleasant and distasteful, while charm and the promise of delight will draw us like moths to a flame. Make yourself the flame and you will rise to the top. Since life is otherwise so full of unpleasantness and pleasure so scarce, you will be as indispensable as food and drink. This may seem obvious, but what is obvious is often ignored or unappreciated. There are degrees to this, not everyone can play the role of favorite, for not everyone is blessed with charm and wit. But we can all control our unpleasant qualities and obscure them when necessary. A man who knows the court is master of his gestures, of his eyes and of his face, he is profound, impenetrable, he dissimulates bad offices, smiles at his enemies, controls his irritation, disguises his passions, belies his heart, speaks and acts against his feelings. Jean de la Bruyere, 1645-1696 Scenes of court life, exemplary deeds and fatal mistakes. Seen I Alexander the Great, conqueror of the Mediterranean basin in the Middle East through to India, had had the great Aristotle as his tutor and mentor, and throughout his short life he remained devoted to philosophy in his master's teachings. He once complained to Aristotle that during his long campaigns he had no one with whom he could discuss philosophical matters. Aristotle responded by suggesting that he take Callisthenes, a former pupil of Aristotle's and a promising philosopher in his own right, along on the next campaign. Aristotle had schooled Callisthenes in the skills of being a courtier, but the young man secretly scoffed at them. He believed in pure philosophy, in unadorned words, in speaking the naked truth. If Alexander loved learning so much, Callisthenes thought, he could not object to one who spoke his mind. During one of Alexander's major campaigns, Callisthenes spoke his mind one too many times and Alexander had him put to death. Interpretation in court, honesty is a fool's game. Never be so self-absorbed as to believe that the master is interested in your criticisms of him, no matter how accurate they are. Scene 2 beginning in the Han Dynasty 2000 years ago, Chinese scholars compiled a series of writings called the 21 Histories, an official biography of each dynasty, including stories, statistics, census figures, and war chronicles. Each history also contained a chapter called Unusual Events, and here, among the listings of earthquakes and floods, there would sometimes suddenly appear descriptions of such bizarre manifestations as two-headed sheep, geese flying backward, stars suddenly appearing in different parts of the sky, and so on. The earthquakes could be historically verified, but the monsters and weird natural phenomena were clearly inserted on purpose, and invariably occurred in clusters. What could this mean? The Chinese emperor was considered more than a man, he was a force of nature. His kingdom was the center of the universe, and everything revolved around him. He embodied the world's perfection. To criticize him, or any of his actions would have been to criticize the divine order. No. Minister or courtier dared approach the emperor with even the slightest. Cautionary word. But emperors were fallible and the kingdom suffered greatly by their mistakes. Inserting sightings of strange phenomena into the court chronicles was the only way to warn them. The emperor would read of geese flying backward and moons out of orbit, and realized that he was being cautioned. His actions were unbalancing the universe and needed to change. Interpretation for Chinese courtiers, the problem of how to give the emperor advice was an important issue. Over the years, thousands of them had died trying to warn or counsel their master. To be made safely, their criticisms had to be indirect, yet if they were too indirect they would not be heeded. The chronicles were their solution, identify no one person as the source of criticism, make the advice as impersonal as possible, but let the emperor know the gravity of the situation. Your master is no longer the center of the universe, but he still imagines that everything revolves around him. When you criticize him he sees the person criticizing, not the criticism itself. 
Like the Chinese courtiers, you must find a way to disappear behind the warning. Use symbols and other indirect methods to paint a picture of the problems to come, without putting your neck on the line. Scene 3 Early in his career, the French architect Jules Manset received commissions to design minor additions to Versailles for King Louis XIV. For each design he would draw up his plans, making sure they followed Louis's instructions closely. He would then present them to His Majesty. The courtier Saint Simon described Manset's technique in dealing with the king, his particular skill was to show the king plans that purposely included something imperfect about them, often dealing with the gardens, which were not Manset's specialty. The king, as Manset expected, would put his finger exactly on the problem and propose how to solve it, at which point Manset would exclaim for all to hear that he would never have seen the problem that the king had so masterfully found and solved. He would burst with admiration, confessing that next to the king he was but a lowly pupil. At the age of thirty, having used these methods time and time again, Manset received a prestigious royal commission, although he was less talented and experienced than a number of other French designers, he was to take charge of the enlargement of Versailles. He was the king's architect from then on. Interpretation As a young man, Manset had seen how many royal craftsmen in the service of Louis XIV had lost their positions not through a lack of talent but through a costly social blunder. He would not make that mistake. Manset always strove to make Louis feel better about himself, to feed the king's vanity as publicly as possible. Never imagine that skill and talent are all that matter. In court the courtier's art is more important than his talent, never spend so much time on your studies that you neglect your social skills. And the greatest skill of all is the ability to make the master look more talented than those around him. Scene 4 Jean-Baptiste Isabe had become the unofficial painter of the Napoleonic court. During the Congress of Vienna in 1814, after Napoleon, defeated, had been imprisoned on the island of Elba, the participants in these meetings, which were to decide the fate of Europe, invited Isabe to immortalize the historic events in an epic painting. When Isabe arrived in Vienna, Talleyrand, the main negotiator for the French, paid the artist a visit. Considering his role in the proceedings, the statesman explained, he expected to occupy center stage in the painting. Isabe cordially agreed. A few days later the Duke of Wellington, the main negotiator for the English, also approached Isabe, and said much the same. Thing that Talleyrand had. The ever-polite Isabe agreed that the great Duke should indeed be the center of attention. Back in his studio, Isabe pondered the dilemma. If he gave the spotlight to either of the two men, he could create a diplomatic rift, stirring up all sorts of resentment at a time when peace and concord were critical. When the painting was finally unveiled, however, both Talleyrand and Wellington felt honored and satisfied. The work depicts a large hall filled with diplomats and politicians from all over Europe. On one side the Duke of Wellington enters the room, and all eyes are turned toward him, he is the center of attention. In the very center of the painting, meanwhile, sits Talleyrand. Interpretation It is often very difficult to satisfy the master, but to satisfy two masters in one stroke takes the genius of a great courtier. Such predicaments are common in the life of a courtier, by giving attention to one master, he displeases another. You must find a way to navigate this Scylla and Charybdis safely. Masters must receive their due, never inadvertently stir up the resentment of one in pleasing another. Scene V. George Brummel, also known as Beau Brummel, made his mark in the late 1700s by the supreme elegance of his appearance, his popularization of shoe buckles, soon imitated by all the dandies, and his clever way with words. His London house was the fashionable spot in town, and Brummel was the authority on all matters of fashion. If he disliked your footwear, you immediately got rid of it and bought whatever he was wearing. He perfected the art of tying a cravat, Lord Byron was said to spend many a night in front of the mirror trying to figure out the secret behind Brummel's perfect knots. One of Brummel's greatest admirers was the Prince of Wales, who fancied himself a fashionable young man. Becoming attached to the Prince's court, and provided with a royal pension, 
Brummel was soon so sure of his own authority there that he took to joking about the prince's weight, referring to his host as Big Ben. Since trimness of figure was an important quality for a dandy, this was a withering criticism. At dinner once, when the service was slow, Brummel said to the prince, Do ring, Big Ben. The prince rang, but when the valet arrived he ordered the man to show Brummel the door and never admit him again. Despite falling into the prince's disfavor, Brummel continued to treat everyone around him with the same arrogance. Without the Prince of Wales patronage to support him, he sank into horrible debt, but he maintained his insolent manners, and everyone soon abandoned him. He died in the most pitiable poverty, alone and deranged. Interpretation Beau Brummel's devastating wit was one of the qualities that endeared him to the Prince of Wales. But not even he, the arbiter of taste and fashion, could get away with a joke about the prince's appearance, least of all to his face. Never joke about a person's plumpness, even indirectly, and particularly when he is your master. The poorhouses of history are filled with people who have made such jokes at their master's expense. Scene 6 Pope Urban VIII wanted to be remembered for his skills in writing poetry, which unfortunately were mediocre at best. In 1629 Duke Francesco d'Est, knowing the Pope's literary pretensions, sent the poet Fulvio Testi as his ambassador to the Vatican. One of Testi's letters to the Duke reveals why he was chosen, once our discussion was over, I kneeled to depart, but His Holiness made a signal and walked to another room where he sleeps, and after reaching a small table, he grabbed a bundle of papers and thus, turning to me with a smiling face, he said, we want your lordship to listen to some of our compositions. And, in fact, he read me two very long Pindaric poems, one in praise of the Most Holy Virgin, and the other one about Countess Matilda. We do not know exactly what Testi thought of these very long poems, since it would have been dangerous for him to state his opinion freely, even in a letter. But he went on to write, I, following the mood, commented on each line with the needed praise, and, after having kissed His Holiness's foot for such an unusual sign of benevolence, the reading of the poetry, I left. Weeks later, when the Duke himself visited the Pope, he managed to recite entire verses of the Pope's poetry and praised it enough to make the Pope so jubilant he seemed to lose his mind. Interpretation in matters of taste You can never be too obsequious with your master. Taste is one of the ego's prickliest parts, never impugn or question the master's taste, his poetry is sublime, his dress impeccable, and his manner the model for all. Scene 7 One afternoon in ancient China, Chao, ruler of Han from 358 to 333 BC, got drunk and fell asleep in the palace gardens. The court crown keeper, whose sole task was to look after the ruler's head apparel, passed through the gardens and saw his master sleeping without a coat. Since it was getting cold, the crown keeper placed his own coat over the ruler, and left. When Chao awoke and saw the coat upon him, he asked his attendants, who put more clothes on my body? The crown keeper, they replied. The ruler immediately called for his official coat keeper and had him punished for neglecting his duties. He also called for the crown keeper, whom he had beheaded. Interpretation Do not overstep your bounds. Do what you are assigned to do, to the best of your abilities, and never do more. To think that by doing more you are. Doing better is a common blunder. It is never good to seem to be trying too hard, it is as if you were covering up some deficiency. Fulfilling a task that has not been asked of you just makes people suspicious. If you are a crown keeper, be a crown keeper. Save your excess energy for when you are not in the court. Scene 8 One day, for amusement, the Italian Renaissance painter Fra Filippo Lippi, 1406-1469, and some friends went sailing in a small boat off Ancona. There they were captured by two Moorish galleys, which hauled them off in chains to Barbary, where they were sold as slaves. For eighteen long months Filippo toiled with no hope of returning to Italy. On several occasions Filippo saw the man who had bought him pass by, and one day he decided to sketch this man's portrait, using burnt coal, charcoal, from the fire. Still in his chains, he found a white wall, where he drew a full-length likeness of his owner in Moorish clothing. 
The owner soon heard about this, for no one had seen such skill in drawing before in these parts, it seemed like a miracle, a gift from God. The drawing so pleased the owner that he instantly gave Filippo his freedom and employed him in his court. All the big men on the Barbary coast came to see the magnificent color portraits that Fra Filippo then proceeded to do, and finally, in gratitude for the honor in this way brought upon him, Filippo's owner returned the artist safely to Italy. Interpretation We who toil for other people have all in some way been captured by pirates and sold into slavery. But like Fra Filippo, if to a lesser degree, most of us possess some gift, some talent, an ability to do something better than other people. Make your master a gift of your talents and you will rise above other courtiers. Let him take the credit if necessary, it will only be temporary, use him as a stepping stone, a way of displaying your talent and eventually buying your freedom from enslavement. Scene 9 Alfonso I of Aragon once had a servant who told the king that the night before he had had a dream, Alfonso had given him a gift of weapons, horses, and clothes. Alfonso, a generous, lordly man, decided it would be amusing to make this dream come true, and promptly gave the servant exactly these gifts. A little while later, the same servant announced to Alfonso that he had had yet another dream, and in this one Alfonso had given him a considerable pile of gold florins. The king smiled and said, Don't believe in dreams from now on, they lie. Interpretation in his treatment of the servant's first dream, Alfonso remained in control. By making a dream come true, he claimed a godlike power for himself, if in a mild and humorous way. In the second dream, however, all appearance of magic was gone, this was nothing but an ugly con game on the servant's part. Never ask for too much, then, and know when to stop. It is the master's prerogative to give, to give when he wants and what he wants, and to do so without prompting. Do not give him the chance to reject your requests. Better to win favors by deserving them, so that they are bestowed without your asking. Scene X The great English landscape painter J. M. W. Turner, 1775-1851, was known for his use of color, which he applied with a brilliance and a strange iridescence. The color in his paintings was so striking, in fact, that other artists never wanted his work hung next to theirs, it inevitably made everything around it seem dull. The painter Sir Thomas Lawrence once had the misfortune of seeing Turner's masterpiece Cologne hanging in an exhibition between two works of his own. Lawrence complained bitterly to the gallery owner, who gave him no satisfaction, after all, someone's paintings had to hang next to. Turner's But Turner heard of Lawrence's complaint, and before the exhibition opened, he toned down the brilliant golden sky in Cologne making it as dull as the colors in Lawrence's works. A friend of Turner's who saw the painting approached the artist with a horrified look, what have you done to your picture, he said. Well, poor Lawrence was so unhappy, Turner replied, and it's only lamp black. It'll wash off after the exhibition. Interpretation Many of a courtier's anxieties have to do with the master, with whom most dangers lie. Yet it is a mistake to imagine that the master is the only one to determine your fate. Your equals and subordinates play integral parts also. A court is a vast stew of resentments, fears, and powerful envy. You have to placate everyone who might someday harm you, deflecting their resentment and envy and diverting their hostility onto other people. Turner, eminent courtier, knew that his good fortune and fame depended on his fellow painters as well as on his dealers and patrons. How many of the great have been felled by envious colleagues? Better temporarily to dull your brilliance than to suffer the slings and arrows of envy. Scene 11 Winston Churchill was an amateur artist, and after World War II his paintings became collector's items. The American publisher Henry Luce, in fact, creator of Time and Life magazines, kept one of Churchill's landscapes hanging in his private office in New York. On a tour through the United States once, Churchill visited Luce in his office, and the two men looked at the painting together. The publisher remarked, it's a good picture, but I think it needs something in the foreground, a sheep, perhaps. Much to Luce's horror, 
Churchill's secretary called the publisher the next day and asked him to have the painting sent to England. Luce did so, mortified that he had perhaps offended the former prime minister. A few days later, however, the painting was shipped back, but slightly altered, a single sheep now grazed peacefully in the foreground. Interpretation in stature and fame, Churchill stood head and shoulders above Luce, but Luce was certainly a man of power, so let us imagine a slight equality between them. Still, what did Churchill have to fear from an American publisher? Why bow to the criticism of a dilettante? A court, in this case the entire world of diplomats and international statesmen, and also of the journalists who court them, is a place of mutual dependence. It is unwise to insult or offend the taste of people of power, even if they are below or equal to you. If a man like Churchill can swallow the criticisms of a man like Luce, he proves himself a courtier without peer. Perhaps his correction of the painting implied a certain condescension as well, but he did it so subtly that Luce did not perceive any slight. Imitate Churchill, put in the sheep. It is always beneficial to play the obliging courtier, even when you are not serving a master. The delicate game of courtiership, a warning Talleyrand was the consummate courtier, especially in serving his master Napoleon. When the two men were first getting to know each other, Napoleon once said in passing, I shall come to lunch at your house one of these days. Talleyrand had a house at Autuil, in the suburbs of Paris. I should be delighted, Mon General, the minister replied, and since my house is close to the Bois de Boulogne, you will be able to amuse yourself with a bit of shooting in the afternoon. I do not like shooting, said Napoleon, but I love hunting. Are there any boars in the Bois de Boulogne? Napoleon came from Corsica, where boar hunting was a great sport. By asking if there were boars in a Paris park, he showed himself still a provincial, almost a rube. Talleyrand did not laugh, however, but he could not resist a practical joke on the man who was now his master in politics, although not in blood and nobility, since. Talleyrand came from an old aristocratic family. To Napoleon's question, then, he simply replied, very few, mon general, but I dare say you will manage to find one. It was arranged that Napoleon would arrive at Talleyrand's house the following day at 7 a.m. and would spend the morning there. The boar hunt would take place in the afternoon. Throughout the morning the excited general talked nothing but boar hunting. Meanwhile, Talleyrand secretly had his servants go to the market, buy two enormous black pigs, and take them to the great park. After lunch, the hunters and their hounds set off for the Bois de Boulogne. At a secret signal from Talleyrand, the servants loosed one of the pigs. I see a boar, Napoleon cried joyfully, jumping onto his horse to give chase. Talleyrand stayed behind. It took half an hour of galloping through the park before the boar was finally captured. At the moment of triumph. However, Napoleon was approached by one of his aides, who knew the creature could not possibly be a boar, and feared the general would be ridiculed once the story got out, sir, he told Napoleon, you realize of course that this is not a boar but a pig. Flying into a rage, Napoleon immediately set off at a gallop for Talleyrand's house. He realized along the way that he would now be the butt of many a joke, and that exploding at Talleyrand would only make him more ridiculous, it would be better to make a show of good humor. Still, he did not hide his displeasure well. Talleyrand decided to try to suit the general's bruised ego. He told Napoleon not to go back to Paris yet, he should again go hunting in the park. There were many rabbits there, and hunting them had been a favorite pastime of Louis XVI. Talleyrand even offered to let Napoleon use a set of guns that had once belonged to Louis. With much flattery and cajolery, he once again got Napoleon to agree to a hunt. The party left for the park in the late afternoon. Along the way, Napoleon told Talleyrand, I'm not Louis XVI, I surely won't kill even one rabbit. Yet that afternoon, strangely enough, the park was teeming with rabbits. Napoleon killed at least fifty of them, and his mood changed from anger to satisfaction. At the end of his wild shooting spree, however, 
the same aide approached him and whispered in his ear, to tell the truth, sir, I am beginning to believe these are not wild rabbits. I suspect that rascal Talleyrand has played another joke on us. The aide was right, Talleyrand had in fact sent his servants back to the market, where they had purchased dozens of rabbits and then had released them in the Bois de Boulogne. Napoleon immediately mounted his horse and galloped away, this time returning straight to Paris. He later threatened Talleyrand, warned him not to tell a soul what had happened, if he became the laughingstock of Paris, there would be hell to pay. It took months for Napoleon to be able to trust Talleyrand again, and he never totally forgave him his humiliation. Interpretation courtiers are like magicians, they deceptively play with appearances, only letting those around them see what they want them to see. With so much deception and manipulation afoot, it is essential to keep people from seeing your tricks and glimpsing your sleight of hand. Talleyrand was normally the grand wizard of courtiership, and but for Napoleon's aid, he probably would have gotten away completely with both pleasing his master and having a joke at the general's expense. But courtiership is a subtle art, and overlooked traps and inadvertent mistakes can ruin your best tricks. Never risk being caught in your maneuvers, never let people see your devices. If that happens you instantly pass in people's perceptions from a courtier of great manners to a loathsome rogue. It is a delicate game you play, apply the utmost attention to covering your tracks, and never let your master unmask you. Law 25 are you create yourself. Judgment do not accept the roles that society foists on you. Recreate yourself by forging a new identity, one that commands attention and never bores the audience. Be the master of your own image rather than letting others define it for you. Incorporate dramatic devices into your public gestures and actions, your power will be enhanced and your character will seem larger than life. Observance of the law I Julius Caesar made his first significant mark on Roman society in 65 BC, when he assumed the post of Aedile, the official in charge of grain distribution and public games. He began his entrance into the public eye by organizing a series of carefully crafted and well-timed spectacles, wild beast hunts, extravagant gladiator shows, theatrical contests. On several occasions, he paid for these spectacles out of his own pocket. To the common man, Julius Caesar became indelibly associated with these much-loved events. As he slowly rose to attain the position of consul, his popularity among the masses served as the foundation of his power. He had created an image of himself as a great public showman. The man who intends to make his fortune in this ancient capital of the world, Rome, must be a chameleon susceptible of reflecting the colors of the atmosphere that surrounds him a Proteus apt to assume every form, every shape. He must be supple, flexible, insinuating, close, inscrutable, often base, sometimes sincere, sometimes perfidious, always concealing a part of his knowledge, indulging in but one tone of voice, patient, a perfect master of his own countenance, as cold as ice when any other man would be all fire, and if unfortunately he is not religious at heart a very common occurrence for a soul possessing the above requisites. He must have religion in his mind, that is to say, on his face, on his lips, in his manners, he must suffer quietly, if he be an honest man, the necessity of knowing himself an errant hypocrite. The man whose soul would loathe such a life should leave Rome and seek his fortune elsewhere. I do not know whether I am praising or excusing myself, but of all those qualities I possessed but one. Namely, flexibility. Memoirs, Giovanni Casanova, 1725-1798 In 49 BC, Rome was on the brink of a civil war between rival leaders, Caesar and Pompey. At the height of the tension, Caesar, an addict of the stage, attended a theatrical performance, and afterward, lost in thought, he wandered in the darkness back to his camp at the Rubicon, the river that divides Italy from Gaul, where he had been campaigning. To march his army back into Italy across the Rubicon would mean the beginning of a war with Pompey. Before his staff Caesar argued both sides, forming the options like an actor on stage, a precursor of Hamlet. Finally, to put his soliloquy to an end. 
He pointed to a seemingly innocent apparition at the edge of the river, a very tall soldier blasting a call on a trumpet, then going across a bridge over the Rubicon, and pronounced, let us accept this as a sign from the gods and follow where they beckon, in vengeance on our double-dealing enemies. The die is cast. All of this he spoke portentously and dramatically, gesturing toward the river and looking his generals in the eye. He knew that these generals were uncertain in their support, but his oratory overwhelmed them with a sense of the drama of the moment, and of the need to seize the time. A more prosaic speech would never have had the same effect. The generals rallied to his cause, Caesar and his army crossed the Rubicon and by the following year had vanquished Pompey, making Caesar dictator of Rome. In warfare, Caesar always played the leading man with gusto. He was as skilled a horseman as any of his soldiers, and took pride in outdoing them in feats of bravery and endurance. He entered battle astride the strongest mount, so that his soldiers would see him in the thick of battle, urging them on, always positioning himself in the center, a godlike symbol of power and a model for them to follow. Of all the armies in Rome, Caesar's was the most devoted and loyal. His soldiers, like the common people who had attended his entertainments, had come to identify with him and with his cause. After the defeat of Pompey, the entertainments grew in scale. Nothing like them had ever been seen in Rome. The chariot races became more spectacular, the gladiator fights more dramatic, as Caesar staged fights to the death among the Roman nobility. He organized enormous mock naval battles on an artificial lake. Plays were performed in every Roman ward. A giant new theater was built that sloped dramatically down the Tarpeian Rock. Crowds from all over the empire flocked to these events, the roads to Rome lined with visitors' tents and in 45 BC, timing his entry into the city. For maximum effect and surprise, Caesar brought Cleopatra back to Rome. After his Egyptian campaign, and staged even more extravagant public spectacles. These events were more than devices to divert the masses, they dramatically enhanced the public sense of Caesar's character, and made him seem larger than life. Caesar was the master of his public image, of which he was forever aware. When he appeared before crowds he wore the most spectacular purple robes. He would be upstaged by no one. He was notoriously vain about his appearance, it was said that one reason he enjoyed being honored by the Senate and people was that on these occasions he could wear a laurel wreath, hiding his baldness. Caesar was a masterful orator. He knew how to say a lot by saying a little, intuited the moment to end a speech for maximum effect. He never failed to incorporate a surprise into his public appearances, a startling announcement that would heighten their drama. Immensely popular among the Roman people, Caesar was hated and feared by his rivals. On the Ides of March, March 15, in the year 44 BC, a group of conspirators led by Brutus and Cassius surrounded him in the Senate and stabbed him to death. Even dying, however, he kept his sense of drama. Drawing the top of his gown over his face, he let go of the cloth's lower part so that it draped his legs, allowing him to die covered and decent. According to the Roman historian Suetonius, his final words to his old friend Brutus, who was about to deliver a second blow, were in Greek, and as if rehearsed for the end of a play, You too, my child. Interpretation The Roman theater was an event for the masses, attended by crowds unimaginable today. Packed into enormous auditoriums, the audience would be amused by raucous comedy or moved by high tragedy. Theater seemed to contain the essence of life, in its concentrated, dramatic form. Like a religious ritual, it had a powerful, instant appeal to the common man. Julius Caesar was perhaps the first public figure to understand the vital link between power and theater. This was because of his own obsessive interest in drama. He sublimated this interest by making himself an actor and director on the world stage. He said his lines as if they had been scripted, he gestured and moved through a crowd with a constant sense of how he appeared to his audience. He incorporated surprise into his repertoire, building drama into his speeches, staging into his public appearances. 
His gestures were broad enough for the common man to grasp them instantly. He became immensely popular. Caesar set the ideal for all leaders and people of power. Like him, you must learn to enlarge your actions through dramatic techniques such as surprise, suspense, the creation of sympathy, and symbolic identification. Also like him, you must be constantly aware of your audience, of what will please them and what will bore them. You must arrange to place yourself at the center, to command attention, and never to be upstaged at any cost. Observance of the Law 2 In the year 1831, a young woman named Aurora de Pan Dudevant left her husband and family in the provinces and moved to Paris. She wanted to be a writer, marriage, she felt, was worse than prison, for it left her neither the time nor the freedom to pursue her passion. In Paris she would establish her independence and make her living by writing. Soon after Dudevant arrived in the capital, however, she had to confront certain harsh realities. To have any degree of freedom in Paris you had to have money. For a woman, money could only come through marriage or prostitution. No woman had ever come close to making a living by writing. Women wrote as a hobby, supported by their husbands, or by an inheritance. In fact when Didovant first showed her writing to an editor, he told her, you should make babies, madam, not literature. Clearly Didovant had come to Paris to attempt the impossible. In the end, though, she came up with a strategy to do what no woman had ever done, a strategy to recreate herself completely, forging a public image of her own making. Women writers before her had been forced into a ready-made role, that of the second-rate artist who wrote mostly for other women. Didovant decided that if she had to play a role, she would turn the game around, she would play the part of a man. In 1832 a publisher accepted Didovant's first major novel, Indiana. She had chosen to publish it under a pseudonym, George Sand, and all of Paris assumed this impressive new writer was male. Didovant had sometimes worn men's clothes before creating George Sand, she had always found men's shirts and riding breeches more comfortable, now, as a public figure, she exaggerated the image. She added long men's coats, gray hats, heavy boots, and dandyish cravats to her wardrobe. She smoked cigars and in conversation expressed herself like a man, unafraid to dominate the conversation or to use a saucy word. This strange, male-slash-female, writer fascinated the public. And unlike other women writers, Sand found herself accepted into the clique of male artists. She drank and smoked with them, even carried on affairs with the most famous artists of Europe, Musset, Liszt, Chopin. It was she who did the wooing, and also the abandoning, she moved on at her discretion. Those who knew Sand well understood that her male persona protected her from the public's prying eyes. Out in the world, she enjoyed playing the part to the extreme, in private she remained herself. She also realized that the character of George Sand could grow stale or predictable, and to avoid this she would every now and then dramatically alter the character she had created, instead of conducting affairs with famous men, she would begin meddling in politics, leading demonstrations, inspiring student rebellions. No one would dictate to her the limits of the character she had created. Long after she died, and after most people had stopped reading her novels, the larger-than-life theatricality of that character has continued to fascinate and inspire. Interpretation throughout Sand's public life, acquaintances and other artists who spent time in her company had the feeling they were in the presence of a man. But in her journals and to her closest friends, such as Gustave Flaubert, she confessed that she had no desire to be a man, but was playing a part for public consumption. What she really wanted was the power to determine her own character. She refused the limits her society would have set on her. She did not attain her power, however, by being herself, instead she created a persona that she could constantly adapt to her own desires, a persona that attracted attention and gave her presence. Understand this, the world wants to assign you a role in life. And once you accept that role you are doomed. Your power is limited to the tiny amount allotted to the role you have selected or have been forced to assume. An actor, on the other hand, plays many roles. 
Enjoy that protean power, and if it is beyond you, at least forge a new identity, one of your own making, one that has had no boundaries assigned to it by an envious and resentful world. This act of defiance is Promethean, it makes you responsible for your own creation. Your new identity will protect you from the world precisely because it is not, you, it is a costume you put on and take off. You need not take it personally. And your new identity sets you apart, gives you theatrical. Presence. Those in the back rows can see you and hear you. Those in the front rows marvel at your audacity. Do not people talk in society of a man being a great actor? They do not mean by that that he feels, but that he excels in simulating, though he feels nothing. Dennis Diderot, 1713-1784 Keys to power the character you seem to have been born with is not necessarily who you are, beyond the characteristics you have inherited, your parents, your friends, and your peers have helped to shape your personality. The Promethean task of the powerful is to take control of the process, to stop allowing others that ability to limit and mold them. Remake yourself into a character of power. Working on yourself like clay should be one of your greatest and most pleasurable life tasks. It makes you in essence an artist, an artist creating yourself. In fact, the idea of self-creation comes from the world of art. For thousands of years, only kings and the highest courtiers had the freedom to shape their public image and determine their own identity. Similarly, only kings and the wealthiest lords could contemplate their own image in art and consciously alter it. The rest of mankind played the limited role that society demanded of them and had little self-consciousness. A shift in this condition can be detected in Velázquez's painting Las Meninas, made in 1656. The artist appears at the left of the canvas, standing before a painting that he is in the process of creating, but that has its back to us, we cannot see it. Beside him stands a princess, her attendants, and one of the court dwarves, all watching him work. The people posing for the painting are not directly visible, but we can see them in tiny reflections in a mirror on the back wall, the king and queen of Spain, who must be sitting somewhere in the foreground, outside the picture. The painting represents a dramatic change in the dynamics of power and the ability to determine one's own position in society. For Velázquez, the artist, is far more prominently positioned than the king and queen. In a sense he is more powerful than they are, since he is clearly the one controlling the image, their image. Velázquez no longer saw himself as the slavish, dependent artist. He had remade himself into a man of power. And indeed the first people other than aristocrats to play openly with their image in Western society were artists and writers, and later on dandies and bohemians. Today the concept of self-creation has slowly filtered down to the rest of society, and has become an ideal to aspire to. Like Velázquez, you must demand for yourself the power to determine your position in the painting, and to create your own image. The first step in the process of self-creation is self-consciousness, being aware of yourself as an actor and taking control of your appearance and emotions. As Diderot said, the bad actor is the one who is always sincere. People who wear their hearts on their sleeves out in society are tiresome and embarrassing. Their sincerity notwithstanding, it is hard to take them seriously. Those who cry in public may temporarily elicit Sympathy, but sympathy soon turns to scorn and irritation at their self-obsessiveness, they are crying to get attention, we feel, and a malicious part of us wants to deny them the satisfaction. Good actors control themselves better. They can play sincere and heartfelt, can affect a tear and a compassionate look at will, but they don't have to feel it. They externalize emotion in a form that others can understand. Method acting is fatal in the real world. No ruler or leader could possibly play the part if all of the emotions he showed had to be real. So learn self-control. Adopt the plasticity of the actor, who can mold his or her face to the emotion required. The second step in the process of self-creation is a variation on the George Sand strategy, 
the creation of a memorable character, one that compels attention, that stands out above the other players on the stage. This was the game Abraham Lincoln played. The homespun, common country man, he knew, was a kind of president that America had never had but would delight in electing. Although many of these qualities came naturally to him, he played them up, the hat and clothes, the beard. No president before him had worn a beard. Lincoln was also the first president to use photographs to spread his image, helping to create the icon of the homespun president. Good drama, however, needs more than an interesting appearance or a single standout moment. Drama takes place over time, it is an unfolding event. Rhythm and timing are critical. One of the most important elements in the rhythm of drama is suspense. Houdini for instance, could sometimes complete his escape acts in seconds, but he drew them out to minutes, to make the audience sweat. The key to keeping the audience on the edge of their seats is letting events unfold slowly, then speeding them up at the right moment, according to a pattern and tempo that you control. Great rulers from Napoleon to Mao Zedong have used theatrical timing to surprise and divert their public. Franklin Delano Roosevelt understood the importance of staging political events in a particular order and rhythm. At the time of his 1932 presidential election, the United States was in the midst of a dire economic crisis. Banks were failing at an alarming rate. Shortly after winning the election, Roosevelt went into a kind of retreat. He said nothing about his plans or his cabinet appointments. He even refused to meet the sitting president, Herbert Hoover, to discuss the transition. By the time of Roosevelt's inauguration the country was in a state of high anxiety. In his inaugural address, Roosevelt shifted gears. He made a powerful speech, making it clear that he intended to lead the country in a completely new direction, sweeping away the timid gestures of his predecessors. From then on the pace of his speeches and public decisions, cabinet appointments, bold legislation, unfolded at an incredibly rapid rate. The period after the inauguration became known as the Hundred Days, and its success in altering the country's mood partly stemmed from Roosevelt's clever pacing and use of dramatic contrast. He held his audience in suspense, then hit them with a series of bold gestures that seemed all the more momentous because they came from nowhere. You must learn to orchestrate events in a similar manner, never revealing all your cards at once, but unfolding them in a way that heightens their dramatic effect. Besides covering a multitude of sins, good drama can also confuse and deceive your enemy. During World War II, the German playwright Bertolt Brecht worked in Hollywood as a screenwriter. After the war he was called before the House Committee on Un-American Activities for his supposed communist sympathies. Other writers who had been called to testify planned to humiliate the committee members with an angry emotional stand Brecht was wiser, he would play the committee like a violin, charming them while fooling them as well. He carefully rehearsed his responses, and brought along some props, notably a cigar on which he puffed away, knowing the head of the committee liked cigars. And indeed he proceeded to beguile the committee with well-crafted responses that were ambiguous, funny, and double-edged. Instead of an angry, heartfelt tirade, he ran circles around them with a staged production, and they let him off scot-free. Other dramatic effects for your repertoire include the bow jest, an action at a climactic moment that symbolizes your triumph or your boldness. Caesar's dramatic crossing of the Rubicon was a bow jest, a move that dazzled the soldiers and gave him heroic proportions. You must also appreciate the importance of stage entrances and exits. When Cleopatra first met Caesar in Egypt, she arrived rolled up in a carpet, which she arranged to have unfurled at his feet. George Washington twice left power. With flourish and fanfare, first as a general, then as a president who refused to sit for a third term, showing he knew how to make the moment count, dramatically and symbolically. Your own entrances and exits should be crafted and planned as carefully. Remember that overacting can be counterproductive, it is another way of spending too much effort trying to attract attention. 
The actor Richard Burton discovered early in his career that by standing totally still on stage, he drew attention to himself and away from the other actors. It is less what you do that matters, clearly, than how you do it, your gracefulness and imposing stillness on the social stage count for more than overdoing your part and moving around too much. Finally, learn to play many roles, to be whatever the moment requires. Adapt your mask to the situation, be protean in the faces you wear. Bismarck played this game to perfection, to a liberal he was a liberal, to a hawk he was a hawk. He could not be grasped, and what cannot be grasped cannot be consumed. Image, the Greek sea god Proteus. His power came from his ability to change shape at will, to be whatever the moment required. When Menelaus, brother of Agamemnon, tried to seize him, Proteus transformed himself into a lion, then a serpent, a panther, a boar, running water, and finally a leafy tree. Authority, know how to be all things to all men. A discreet Proteus, a scholar among scholars, a saint among saints. That is the art of winning over everyone, for like attracts like. Take note of temperaments and adapt yourself to that of each person you meet, follow the lead of the serious and jovial in turn, changing your mood discreetly. Baltasar Gratian, 1601-1658 Reversal There can really be no reversal to this critical law, bad theater is bad theater. Even appearing natural requires art, in other words, acting. Bad. Acting only creates embarrassment. Of course you should not be too. Dramatic, avoid the histrionic gesture. But that is simply bad theater. Anyway, since it violates centuries-old dramatic laws against overacting. In. Essence there is no reversal to this law. Law 26. Keep your hands clean. Judgment you must seem a paragon of civility and efficiency, your hands are never soiled by mistakes and nasty deeds. Maintain such a spotless appearance by using others as scapegoats and cat's paws to disguise your involvement. Part 1. Conceal your mistakes, have a scapegoat around to take the blame. Our good name and reputation depend more on what we conceal than on what we reveal. Everyone makes mistakes, but those who are truly clever manage to hide them, and to make sure someone else is blamed. A convenient scapegoat should always be kept around for such moments. Observance of the law I near the end of the 2nd century AD, as China's mighty Han Empire slowly collapsed, the great general and imperial minister Tsao Tsao emerged as the most powerful man in the country. Seeking to extend his power base and to rid himself of the last of his rivals, Tsao Tsao began a campaign to take control of the strategically vital central plain. During the siege of a key city, he slightly miscalculated the timing for supplies of grain to arrive from the capital. As he waited for the shipment to come in, the army ran low on food, and TSAO TSAO was forced to order the chief of commissariat to reduce its rations. Chelm Justice A great calamity befell the town of Chelm one day. The town cobbler murdered one of his customers. So he was brought before the judge, who sentenced him to die by hanging. When the verdict was read a townsman arose and cried out, If your honor pleases, you have sentenced to death the town cobbler. He's the only one we've got. If you hang him who will mend our shoes? Who? Who? cried all the people of Chelm with one voice. The judge nodded in agreement and reconsidered his verdict. Good people of Chelm, he said, what you say is true. Since we have only one cobbler it would be a great wrong against the community to let him die. As there are two roofers in the town let one of them be hanged instead. A treasury of Jewish folklore, Nathan Ozabel, ed. 1948. TSAO TSAO kept a tight rein on the army, and ran a network of informers. His spies soon reported that the men were complaining, grumbling that he was living well while they themselves had barely enough to eat. Perhaps TSAO TSAO was keeping the food for himself, they murmured. If the grumbling spread, 
TSAO TSAO could have a mutiny on his hands. He summoned the chief of commissariat to his tent. I want to ask you to lend me something, and you must not refuse, TSAO TSAO told the chief. What is it, the chief replied. I want the loan of your head to show to the troops, said TSAO TSAO. But I've done nothing wrong, cried the chief. I know, said TSAO TSAO with a sigh, but if I do not put you to death, there will be a mutiny. Do not grieve, after you're gone, I'll look after your family. Put this way, the request left the chief no choice, so he resigned himself to his fate and was beheaded that very day. Seeing his head on public display, the soldiers stopped grumbling. Some saw through TSAO TSAO's gesture, but kept quiet, stunned and intimidated by his violence. And most accepted his version of who was to blame, preferring to believe in his wisdom and fairness than in his incompetence and cruelty. Interpretation TSAO TSAO came to power in an extremely tumultuous time. In the struggle for supremacy in the crumbling Han Empire, enemies had emerged from all sides. The battle for the central plain had proven more difficult than he imagined, and money and provisions were a constant concern. No wonder that under such stress, he had forgotten to order supplies in time. Once it became clear that the delay was a critical mistake, and that the army was seething with mutiny, TSAO TSAO had two options, apology and excuses, or a scapegoat. Understanding the workings of power and the importance of appearances as he did, TSAO TSAO did not hesitate for a moment, he shopped around for the most convenient head and had it served up immediately. Occasional mistakes are inevitable, the world is just too unpredictable. People of power, however, are undone not by the mistakes they make, but by the way they deal with them. Like surgeons, they must cut away the tumor with speed and finality. Excuses and apologies are much too blunt. Tools for this delicate operation, the powerful avoid them. By apologizing you open up all sorts of doubts about your competence, your intentions, any other mistakes you may not have confessed. Excuses satisfy no one and apologies make everyone uncomfortable. The mistake does not vanish with an apology, it deepens and festers. Better to cut it off instantly, distract attention from yourself, and focus attention on a convenient scapegoat before people have time to ponder your responsibility or your possible incompetence. I would rather betray the whole world than let the world betray me. General TSAO TSAO, C. A.D. 155-220 Observance of the law too for several years Cesare Borgia campaigned to gain control of large parts of Italy in the name of his father, Pope Alexander. In the year 1500 he managed to take Romagna, in northern Italy. The region had for years been ruled by a series of greedy masters who had plundered its wealth for themselves. Without police or any disciplining force, it had descended into lawlessness, whole areas being ruled by robbers and feuding families. To establish order, Cesare appointed a lieutenant general of the region, Ramiro de Orco, a cruel and vigorous man, according to Niccolo Machiavelli. Cesare gave de Orco absolute powers. With energy and violence, de Orco established a severe, brutal justice in Romagna, and soon rid it of almost all of its lawless elements. But in his zeal he sometimes went too far, and after a couple of years the local population resented and even hated him. In December of 1502, Cesare took decisive action. He first let it be known that he had not approved of the Orco's cruel and violent deeds, which stemmed from the lieutenant's brutal nature. Then, on December 22, he imprisoned de Orco in the town of Cecina, and the day after Christmas the townspeople awoke to find a strange spectacle in the middle of the piazza, de Orco's headless body, dressed in a lavish suit with a purple cape, the head impaled beside it on a pike, the bloody knife and executioner's block laid out beside the head. As Machiavelli concluded his comments on the affair, the ferocity of this scene left the people at once stunned and satisfied. Interpretation Cesare Borgia was a master player in the game of power. Always planning several moves ahead, he set his opponents the cleverest traps. 
for this Machiavelli honored him above all others in the prince. Cesare foresaw the future with amazing clarity in Romagna, only brutal justice would bring order to the region. The process would take several years, and at first the people would welcome it. But it would soon make many enemies, and the citizens would come to resent the imposition of such unforgiving justice, especially by outsiders. Cesare himself, then, could not be seen as the agent of this justice, the people's hatred would cause too many problems in the future. And so he chose the one man who could do the dirty work, knowing in advance that once the task was done he would have to display the orco's head on a pike. The scapegoat in this case had been planned from the beginning. With TSAO TSAO, the scapegoat was an entirely innocent man, in the Romagna, he was the offensive weapon in Cesare's arsenal that let him get the dirty work done without bloodying his own hands. With this second kind of scapegoat it is wise to separate yourself from the hatchet man at some point, either leaving him dangling in the wind or, like Cesare, even making yourself the one to bring him to justice. Not only are you free of involvement in the problem, you can appear as the one who cleaned it up. The Athenians regularly maintained a number of degraded and useless beings at the public expense, and when any calamity, such as plague, drought, or famine, befell the city. These scapegoats were led about, and then sacrificed, apparently by being stoned outside the city. The Golden Bough, Sir James George Fraser, 1854-1941 Keys to power the use of scapegoats is as old as civilization itself, and examples of it can be found in cultures around the world. The main idea behind these sacrifices is the shifting of guilt and sin to an outside figure, object, animal, or man, which is then banished or destroyed. The Hebrews used to take a live goat, hence the term, scapegoat, upon whose head the priest would lay both hands while confessing the sins of the children of Israel. Having thus had those sins transferred to it, the beast would be led away and abandoned in the wilderness. With the Athenians and the Aztecs, the scapegoat was human, often a person fed and raised for the purpose. Since famine and plague were thought to be visited on humans by the gods, in punishment for wrongdoing, the people suffered not only from the famine and plague themselves but from blame and guilt. They freed themselves of guilt by transferring it to an innocent person, whose death was intended to satisfy the divine powers and banish the evil from their midst. It is an extremely human response to not look inward after a mistake or crime, but rather to look outward and to affix blame and guilt on a convenient object. When the plague was ravaging Thebes, Oedipus looked everywhere for its cause, everywhere except inside himself and his own sin of incest, which had so offended the gods and occasioned the plague. This profound need to exteriorize one's guilt, to project it on another person or object, has an immense power, which the clever know how to harness. Sacrifice is a ritual, perhaps the most ancient ritual of all, Ritual too is a wellspring of power. In the killing of De Orco, note Cesare's symbolic and ritualistic display of his body. By framing it in this dramatic way he focused guilt outward. The citizens of Romagna responded instantly. Because it comes so naturally to us to look outward rather than inward, we readily accept the scapegoat's guilt. The bloody sacrifice of the scapegoat seems a barbaric relic of the past but the practice lives on to this day, if indirectly and symbolically, since power depends on appearances, and those in power must seem never to make mistakes, the use of scapegoats is as popular as ever. What modern leader will take responsibility for his blunders? He searches out others to blame, a scapegoat to sacrifice. When Mao Zedong's Cultural Revolution Failed miserably, he made no apologies or excuses to the Chinese people. Instead, like TSAO TSAO before him, he offered up scapegoats, including his own personal secretary and high-ranking member of the party, CHN Pata. Franklin D. Roosevelt had a reputation for honesty and fairness. Throughout his career, however, he faced many situations in which being the nice guy would have spelled political disaster, yet he could not be seen as the agent of any foul play. For twenty years, then, his secretary, 
Lewis Howe, played the role De Orco had. He handled the backroom deals, the manipulation of the press, the underhanded campaign maneuvers. And whenever a mistake was committed, or a dirty trick contradicting Roosevelt's carefully crafted image became public, Howe served as the scapegoat, and never complained. Besides conveniently shifting blame, a scapegoat can serve as a warning to others. In 1631 a plot was hatched to oust France's Cardinal Richelieu from power, a plot that became known as, the Day of the Dupes. It almost succeeded, since it involved the upper echelons of government, including the Queen Mother. But through luck and his own connivances, Richelieu survived. One of the key conspirators was a man named Marillac, the Keeper of the Seals. Richelieu could not imprison him without implicating the Queen Mother, an extremely dangerous tactic, so he targeted Marillac's brother, a marshal in the army. This man had no involvement in the plot. Richelieu. However, afraid that other conspiracies might be in the air, especially in the army, decided to set an example. He tried the brother on trumped-up charges and had him executed. In this way he indirectly punished the real perpetrator, who had thought himself protected, and warned any future conspirators that he would not shrink from sacrificing the innocent to protect his own power. In fact it is often wise to choose the most innocent victim possible as a sacrificial goat. Such people will not be powerful enough to fight you, and their naive protests may be seen as protesting too much, may be seen, in other words, as a sign of their guilt. Be careful, however, not to create a martyr. It is important that you remain the victim, the poor leader betrayed by the incompetence of those around you. If the scapegoat appears too weak and his punishment too cruel, you may end up the victim of your own device. Sometimes you should find a more powerful scapegoat, one who will elicit less sympathy in the long run. In this vein, history has time and again shown the value of using a close associate as a scapegoat. This is known as the fall of the favorite. Most kings had a personal favorite at court, a man whom they singled out, sometimes for no apparent reason, and lavished with favors and attention. But this court favorite could serve as a convenient scapegoat in case of a threat to the king's reputation. The public would readily believe in the scapegoat's guilt, why would the king sacrifice his favorite unless he were guilty? And the other courtiers, resentful of the favorite anyway, would rejoice at his downfall. The king, meanwhile, would rid himself of a man who by that time had probably learned too much about him, perhaps becoming arrogant and even disdainful of him. Choosing a close associate as a scapegoat has the same value as the fall of the favorite. You may lose a friend or aid, but in the long-term scheme of things, it is more important to hide your mistakes than to hold on to someone who one day will probably turn against you. Besides, you can always find a new favorite to take his place. Image, the innocent goat. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest brings the goat into the temple, places his hands on its head, and confesses the people's sins, transferring guilt to the guiltless beast, which is then led to the wilderness and abandoned, the people's sins and blame vanishing with him. Authority, folly consists not in committing folly, but in being incapable of concealing it. All men make mistakes, but the wise conceal the blunders they have made, while fools make them public. Reputation depends more on what is hidden than on what is seen. If you can't be good, be careful. Balthasar Gratian, 1601-1658 Part 2, Make Use of the Cat's B.A.W. In the fable, the monkey grabs the paw of his friend, the cat, and uses it to fish chestnuts out of the fire, thus getting the nuts he craves, without hurting himself. If there is something unpleasant or unpopular that needs to be done, it is far too risky for you to do the work yourself. You need a cat spa, someone who does the dirty, dangerous work for you. The cat spa grabs what you need, hurts whom you need hurt, and keeps people from noticing that you are the one responsible. Let someone else be the executioner, or the bearer of bad news, while you bring only joy and glad tidings. Observance of the law I in 59 BC, the future Queen Cleopatra of Egypt, then ten years old, 
witnessed the overthrow and banishment of her father, Ptolemy XII, at the hand of his elder daughters, her own sisters. One of the daughters, Berenice, emerged as the leader of the rebellion, and to ensure that she would now rule Egypt alone, she imprisoned her other sisters and murdered her own husband. This may have been necessary as a practical step to secure her rule. But that a member of the royal family, a queen no less, would so overtly exact such violence on her own family horrified her subjects and stirred up powerful opposition. For years later this opposition was able to return Ptolemy to power, and he promptly had Berenice and the other elder sisters beheaded. The Monkey and the Cat A monkey and cat, in roguery and fun sworn brothers twain, both owned a common master, whatever mischief in the house was done by Pug and Tom was contrived each disaster. One winter's day was seen this hopeful pair close to the kitchen fire, as usual, posted. Amongst the red-hot coals the cook with care had plucked some nice plump chestnuts to be roasted, from whence in smoke a pungent odor rose, whose oily fragrance struck the monkey's nose. Tom! Says Sly Pug, pray could not you and I share this dessert the cook is pleased to cater. Had I such claws as yours, I'd quickly try, lend me a hand, t'will be a coup de maitre. So said, he seized his colleague's ready paw, pulled out the fruit, and crammed it in his jaw. Now came the shining mistress of the fane, and off in haste the two marauders scampered. Tom for his share of the plunder had the pain, whilst Pug his palate with the dainties pampered. Fables, Jean de L.A. Fontaine, 1621-1695 In 51 BC Ptolemy died, leaving four remaining children as heirs. As was the tradition in Egypt, the eldest son, Ptolemy XIII, only ten at the time, married the elder sister, Cleopatra, now eighteen, and the couple took the throne together as king and queen. None of the four children felt satisfied with this, everyone, including Cleopatra, wanted more power. A struggle emerged between Cleopatra and Ptolemy, each trying to push the other to the side. In 48 BC, with the help of a government faction that feared Cleopatra's ambitions, Ptolemy was able to force his sister to flee the country, leaving himself as sole ruler. In exile, Cleopatra schemed. She wanted to rule alone and to restore Egypt to its past glory, a goal she felt none of her other siblings could achieve, yet as long as they were alive, she could not realize her dream. And the example of Berenice had made it clear that no one would serve a queen who was seen murdering her own kind. Even Ptolemy. Thirteen had not dared murder Cleopatra, although he knew she would plot against him from abroad. Within a year after Cleopatra's banishment, the Roman dictator Julius Caesar arrived in Egypt, determined to make the country a Roman colony. Cleopatra saw her chance, re-entering Egypt in disguise, she traveled hundreds of miles to reach Caesar in Alexandria. Legend has it that she had herself smuggled into his presence rolled up inside a carpet, which was gracefully unfurled at his feet, revealing the young queen. Cleopatra immediately went to work on the Roman. She appealed to his love of spectacle and his interest in Egyptian history, and poured on her feminine charms. Caesar soon succumbed and restored Cleopatra to the throne. Cleopatra's siblings seethed, she had outmaneuvered them. Ptolemy XIII would not wait to see what happened next, from his palace in Alexandria, he summoned a great army to march on the city and attack Caesar. In response, Caesar immediately put Ptolemy and the rest of the family under house arrest. But Cleopatra's younger sister Arsino escaped from the palace and placed herself at the head of the approaching Egyptian troops, proclaiming herself Queen of Egypt. Now Cleopatra finally saw her chance, she convinced Caesar to release Ptolemy from house arrest, under the agreement that he would broker a truce. Of course she knew he would do the opposite, that he would fight Arsino for control of the Egyptian army. But this was to Cleopatra's benefit, for it would divide the royal family. Better still, it would give Caesar the chance to defeat and kill her. Siblings in Battle Reinforced by troops from Rome, Caesar swiftly defeated the rebels. In the Egyptians' retreat, Ptolemy drowned in the Nile. 
Caesar captured Arsino and had her sent to Rome as a prisoner. He also executed the numerous enemies who had conspired against Cleopatra, and imprisoned others who had opposed her. To reinforce her position as uncontested queen, Cleopatra now married the only sibling left, Ptolemy XIV, only eleven at the time, and the weakest of the lot. Four years later Ptolemy mysteriously died, of poison. The crow hen, the cobra, and the jackal once upon a time there was a crow and his wife who had built a nest in a banyan tree. A big snake crawled into the hollow trunk and ate up the chicks as they were hatched. The crow did not want to move, since he loved the tree dearly. So he went to his friend the jackal for advice. A plan of action was devised. The crow and his wife flew about in implementation. As the wife approached a pond, she saw the women of the king's court bathing, with pearls, necklaces, gems, garments, and a golden chain laying on the shore. The crow hen seized the golden chain in her beak and flew toward the banyan tree with the eunuchs in pursuit. When she reached the tree, she dropped the chain into the hole. As the king's men climbed the tree for the chain, they saw the swelling hood of the cobra. So they killed the snake with their clubs, retrieved the golden chain, and went back to the pond. And the crow and his wife lived happily ever after. A tale from the Panchatantra, 4th century, retold in the craft of Power, R. G. H. Su, 1979. In 41 BC, Cleopatra employed on a second Roman leader, Mark Antony, the same tactics she had used so well on Julius Caesar. After seducing him, she hinted to him that her sister Arsino, still a prisoner in Rome, had conspired to destroy him. Mark Antony believed her and promptly had Arsino executed, thereby getting rid of the last of the siblings who had posed such a threat to Cleopatra. Interpretation legend has it that Cleopatra succeeded through her seductive charms, but in reality her power came from an ability to get people to do her bidding without realizing they were being manipulated. Caesar and Antony not only rid her of her most dangerous siblings, Ptolemy XIII and Arsino, they decimated all of her enemies, in both the government and the military. The two men became her cat's paws. They entered the fire for her, did the ugly but necessary work, while shielding her from appearing as the destroyer of her siblings and fellow Egyptians. And in the end, both men acquiesced to her desire to rule Egypt not as a Roman colony but as an independent allied kingdom. And they did all this for her without realizing how she had manipulated them. This was persuasion of the subtlest and most powerful kind. A queen must never dirty her hands with ugly tasks, nor can a king appear in public with blood on his face. Yet power cannot survive without the constant squashing of enemies, there will always be dirty little tasks that have to be done to keep you on the throne. Like Cleopatra, you need a cat's ball. This will usually be a person from outside your immediate circle, who will therefore be unlikely to realize how he or she is being used. You will find these dupes everywhere, people who enjoy doing you favors, especially if you throw them a minimal bone or two in exchange. But as they accomplish tasks that may seem to them innocent enough, or at least completely justified, they are actually clearing the field for you, spreading the information you feed them, undermining people they do not realize are your rivals, inadvertently furthering your cause, dirtying their hands while yours remain spotless. Observance of the law too In the late 1920s, civil war broke out in China as the nationalist and communist parties battled for control of the country. In 1927 Chiang Kai-shek, the nationalist leader, vowed to kill every last communist, and over the next few years he nearly accomplished his task, pushing his enemies hard until, in 1934 to 1935, he forced them into the Long March, a 6,000-mile retreat from the southeast to the remote northwest, through harsh terrain, in which most of their ranks were decimated. In late 1936 Chiang planned one last offensive to wipe them out, but he was caught in a mutiny, his own soldiers captured him and turned him over to the communists. Now he could only expect the worst. How to broadcast news when Omar, son of Al-Khattab, was converted to Islam, he wanted the news of his conversion to reach everyone quickly. 
he went to see Jamil, son of Mamar al-Jamahi. The latter was renowned for the speed with which he passed on secrets. If he was told anything in confidence, he let everyone know about it immediately. Omar said to him, I have become a Muslim. Do not say anything. Keep it dark. Do not mention it in front of anyone. Jamil went out into the street and began shouting at the top of his voice, Do you believe that Omar, son of Al-Khattab, has not become a Muslim? Well, do not believe that. I am telling you that he has. The news of Omar's conversion to Islam was spread everywhere. And that was just what he intended. The Subtle Ruse, The Book of Arabic Wisdom and Guile, 13th Century Meanwhile, however, the Japanese began an invasion of China, and much to Chang's surprise, instead of killing him the communist leader, Mao Zedong, proposed a deal, the communists would let him go, and would recognize him as commander of their forces as well as his, if he would agree to fight alongside them against their common enemy. Chang had expected torture and execution, now he could not believe his luck. How soft these reds had become! Without having to fight a rearguard action against the communists, he knew he could beat the Japanese, and then a few years down the line he would turn around and destroy the Reds with ease. He had nothing to lose and everything to gain by agreeing to their terms. The communists proceeded to fight the Japanese in their usual fashion, with hit-and-run guerrilla tactics, while the nationalists fought a more conventional war. Together, after several years, they succeeded in evicting. The Japanese. Now, however, Chang finally understood what Mao had. Really planned. His own army had met the brunt of the Japanese artillery, was greatly weakened, and would take a few years to recover. The communists, meanwhile, had not only avoided any direct hits from the Japanese, they had used the time to recoup their strength, and to spread out and gain pockets of influence all over China. As soon as the war against the Japanese ended, the civil war started again, but this time the communists enveloped the weakened nationalists and slowly beat them into submission. The Japanese had served as Mao's cat's paw, inadvertently plowing the fields for the communists and making possible their victory over Chiang Kai-shek. Interpretation Most leaders who had taken as powerful an enemy as Chiang Kai-shek prisoner would have made sure to kill him. But in doing so they would have lost the chance Mao exploited. Without the experienced Chang as leader of the nationalists, the fight to drive the Japanese out might have lasted much longer, with devastating results. Mao was far too clever to let anger spoil the chance to kill two birds with one stone. In essence, Mao used two cats. Pause to help him attain total victory. First, he cleverly baited Chang into taking charge of the war against the Japanese. Mao knew the nationalists led by Chang would do most of the hard fighting and would succeed in pushing the Japanese out of China, if they did not have to concern themselves with fighting the communists at the same time. The nationalists, then, were the first cat's paw, used to evict the Japanese. But Mao also knew that in the process of leading the war against the invaders, the Japanese artillery and air support would decimate the conventional forces of the nationalists, doing damage it could take the communists decades to inflict. Why waste time and lives if the Japanese could do the job quickly? It was this wise policy of using one cat's paw after another that allowed the communists to prevail. A fool and a wise man a wise man, walking alone, was being bothered by a fool throwing stones at his head. Turning to face him, he said, My dear chap, well thrown. Please accept these few francs. You've worked hard enough to get more than mere thanks. Every effort deserves its reward. But see that man over there. He can afford more than I can. Present him with some of your stones, they'll earn a good wage. Lured by the bait, the stupid man ran off to repeat the outrage on the other worthy citizen. This time he wasn't paid in money for his stones. Up rushed serving men, and seized him and thrashed him and broke all his bones. In the courts of kings there are pests like this, devoid of sense, they'll make their master laugh at your expense. To silence their cackle, should you hand out rough punishment? Maybe you're not strong enough. 
better persuade them to attack somebody else, who can more than pay them back. Selected Fables, Jean de L.A. Fontaine, 1621-1695 There are two uses of the cat's paw, to save appearances, as Cleopatra did, and to save energy in effort. The latter case in particular demands that you plan several moves in advance, realizing that a temporary move backward, letting Chang go, say, can lead to a giant leap forward. If you are temporarily weakened and need time to recover, it will often serve you well to use those around you both as a screen to hide your intentions and as a cat's paw to do your work for you. Look for a powerful third party who shares an enemy with you, if for different reasons, then take advantage of their superior power to deal blows which would have cost you much more energy, since you are weaker. You can even gently guide them into Hostilities Always search out the overly aggressive as potential cat's paws, they are often more than willing to get into a fight, and you can choose just the right fight for your purposes. Observance of the Law 3 Kuriyama Daizen was an adept of Chanoyu, hot water for tea, the Japanese tea ceremony, and a student of the teachings of the great tea master Sen no Rikyu. Around 1620 Daizen learned that a friend of his, Hoshino Soman, had borrowed a large sum of money, 300 ryo, to help a relative who had fallen into debt. But although Soman had managed to bail out his relative, he had simply displaced the burden onto himself. Daizen knew Soman well, he neither cared nor understood much about money, and could easily get into trouble through slowness in repaying the loan, which had been made by a wealthy merchant called Kawachiya Senman. Yet if Daizen offered to help Soman pay back the loan, he would refuse, out of pride, and might even be offended. One day Daizen visited his friend, and after touring the garden and looking at Soman's prized peonies, they retired to his reception room. Here Daizen saw a painting by the master Kano Tenyu. Ah, Daizen! exclaimed, a splendid piece of painting. I don't know when I have seen anything I like better. After several more bouts of praise, Soman had no choice, well, he said, since you like it so much, I hope you will do me the favor of accepting it. At first Dai Zen refused, but when Soman insisted he gave in. The next day Soman in turn received a package from Dai Zen. Inside it was a beautiful and delicate vase, which Dai Zen, in an accompanying note, asked his friend to accept as a token of his appreciation for the painting that Soman had so graciously given him the day before. He explained that the vase had been made by Sen no Rikyu himself, and bore an inscription from Emperor Hideyoshi. If Soman did not care for the vase, Daizen suggested, he might make a gift of it to an adherent of Chanoyu, perhaps the merchant Kawachiya Senman, who had often expressed a desire to possess it. I hear, Daizen continued, he has a fine piece of fancy paper, the 300. Rio IOU, which you would much like. It is possible you might arrange an exchange. The Indian bird A merchant kept a bird in a cage. He was going to India, the land from which the bird came, and asked it whether he could bring anything back for it. The bird asked for its freedom, but was refused. So he asked the merchant to visit a jungle in India and announce his captivity to the free birds who were there. The merchant did so, and no sooner had he spoken when a wild bird, just like his own, fell senseless out of a tree onto the ground. The merchant thought that this must be a relative of his own bird, and felt sad that he should have caused this death. When he got home, the bird asked him whether he had brought good news from India. No, said the merchant, I fear that my news is bad. One of your relations collapsed and fell at my feet when I mentioned your captivity. As soon as these words were spoken the merchant's bird collapsed and fell to the bottom of the cage. The news of his kinsman's death has killed him, too, thought the merchant. Sorrowfully he picked up the bird and put it on the windowsill. At once the bird revived and flew to a nearby tree. Now you know, the bird said, that what you thought was disaster was in fact good news for me. And how the message, the suggestion of how to behave in order to free myself, was transmitted to me through you, my captor. And he flew away, free at last. 
Tales of the Dervishes, Idris Shah, 1967. Realizing what his gracious friend was up to, Soman took the vase to the wealthy lender. However did you get this, exclaimed Saman, when Soman showed him the vase. I have often heard of it, but this is the first time I have ever seen it. It is such a treasure that it is never allowed outside the gate. He instantly offered to exchange the debt note for the flower vase, and to give Soman 300 rio more on top of it. But Soman, who did not care for money, only wanted the debt note back, and Saman gladly gave it to him. Then Soman immediately hurried to Dazen's house to thank him for his clever support. Interpretation Kuriyama Daizen understood that the granting of a favor is never simple, if it is done with fuss and obviousness, its receiver feels burdened by an obligation. This may give the doer a certain power, but it is a power that will eventually self-destruct, for it will stir up resentment and resistance. A favor done indirectly and elegantly has ten times more power. Daizen knew a direct approach would only have offended Soman. By letting his friend give him the painting, however, he made Soman feel that he too had pleased his friend with a gift. In the end, all three parties emerged from the encounter feeling fulfilled in their own way. In essence, Daizen made himself the cat's paw, the tool to take the chestnuts out of the fire. He must have felt some pain in losing the vase, but he gained not only the painting but, more important, the power of the courtier. The courtier uses his gloved hand to soften any blows against him, disguise his scars, and make the act of rescue more elegant and clean. By helping others, the courtier eventually helps himself. Dazen's example provides the paradigm for every favor done between friends and peers, never impose your favors. Search out ways to make yourself the cat's paw, indirectly extricating your friends from distress without imposing yourself or making them feel obligated to you. One should not be too straightforward. Go and see the forest. The straight trees are cut down, the crooked ones are left standing. Kautilya, Indian philosopher, 3rd century BC. Keys to power as a leader you may imagine that constant diligence, and the appearance of working harder than anyone else, signify power. Actually, though, they have the opposite effect, they imply weakness. Why are you working so hard? Perhaps you are incompetent, and have to put in extra effort just to keep up, perhaps you are one of those people who does not know how to delegate, and has to meddle in everything. The truly powerful, on the other hand, seem never to be in a hurry or overburdened. While others work their fingers to the bone, they take their leisure. They know how to find the right people to put in the effort while they save their energy and keep their hands out of the fire. Similarly, you may believe that by taking on the dirty work yourself, involving yourself directly in unpleasant actions, you impose your power and instill fear. In fact you make yourself look ugly, and abusive of your high position. Truly powerful people keep their hands clean. Only Good things surround them, and the only announcements they make are of Glorious achievements You will often find it necessary, of course, to expend energy, or to effect an evil but necessary action. But you must never appear to be this action's agent. Find a cat's ball. Develop the arts of finding, using, and, in time, getting rid of these people when their cat's ball role has been fulfilled. On the eve of an important river battle, the great 3rd century Chinese strategist Chukou Liang found himself falsely accused of secretly working for the other side. As proof of his loyalty, his commander ordered him to produce 100,000 arrows for the army within three days, or be put to death. Instead of trying to manufacture the arrows, an impossible task, Liang took a dozen boats and had bundles of straw lashed to their sides. In the late afternoon, when mist always blanketed the river, he floated the boats toward the enemy camp. Fearing a trap from the wily Chukul Liang, the enemy did not attack the barely visible boats with boats of their own, but showered them with arrows from the bank. As Liang's boats inched closer, they redoubled the rain of arrows, which stuck in the thick straw. 
After several hours, the men hiding on board sailed the vessels quickly downstream, where Chuko Liang met them and collected his 100,000 arrows. David and Bathsheba At the turn of the year, when kings take the field, David sent Joab out with his other officers and all the Israelite forces, and they ravaged Ammon and laid siege to Rabbah, while David remained in Jerusalem. One evening David got up from his couch and, as he walked about on the roof of the palace, he saw from there a woman bathing and she was very beautiful. He sent to inquire who she was, and the answer came, it must be Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam and wife of Uriah the Hittite. David wrote a letter to Joab and sent Uriah with it. He wrote in the letter, put Uriah opposite the enemy where the fighting is fiercest and then fall back, and leave him to meet his death. Joab, stationed Uriah at a point where he knew they would put up a stout fight. The men of the city sallied out and engaged Joab, and some of David's guards fell, Uriah the Hittite was also killed. Joab sent David a dispatch with all the news of the battle. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him, and when the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her into his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. Old Testament, 2 Samuel, 11-12 Chuko Liang would never do work that others could do for him, he was always thinking up tricks like this one. The key to planning such a Strategy is the ability to think far ahead, to imagine ways in which other people can be baited into doing the job for you. An essential element in making this strategy work is to disguise your goal, shrouding it in mystery, like the strange enemy boats appearing dimly in the mist. When your rivals cannot be sure what you are after, they will react in ways that often work against them in the long run. In fact they will become your cat's paws. If you disguise your intentions, it is much easier to guide them into moves that accomplish exactly what you want done, but prefer not to do yourself. This may require planning several moves in advance, like a billiard ball that bounces off the sides a few times before heading into the right pocket. The early 20th century American con artist Yellow Kid well knew that no matter how skillfully he homed in on the perfect wealthy sucker, if he, a stranger, approached this man directly, the sucker might become suspicious. So Wilde would find someone the sucker already knew to serve. As a cat's paw, someone lower on the totem pole who was himself an unlikely target, and would therefore be less suspicious. Wilde would interest this man in a scheme promising incredible wealth. Convinced the scheme was for real, the cat's paw would often suggest, without prompting, that his boss or wealthy friend should get involved having more cash to invest, this man would increase the size of the pot, making bigger bucks for all concerned. The cat's paw would then involve the wealthy sucker who had been Wiles' target all along, but who would not suspect a trap, since it was his trusty subordinate who had roped him in. Devices like this are often the best way to approach a person of power, use an associate or subordinate to hook you up with your primary target. The cat's paw establishes your credibility and shields you from the unsavory appearance of being too pushy in your courtship. The easiest and most effective way to use a cat's paw is often to plant information with him that he will then spread to your primary target. False or planted information is a powerful tool, especially if spread by a dupe whom no one suspects. You will find it very easy to play innocent and disguise yourself as the source. The strategic therapist Dr. Milton H. Erickson would often encounter among his patients a married couple in which the wife wanted the therapy but the husband absolutely refused it. Rather than wasting energy trying to deal with the man directly, Dr. Erickson would see the wife alone, and as she talked he would interject interpretations of the husband's behavior that he knew would rile the husband up if he heard them. Sure enough, the wife would tell her husband what the doctor had said. After a few weeks the husband would be so furious he would insist on joining his wife in the session so he could set the doctor straight. Finally, you may well find cases in which deliberately offering yourself as the cat's paw will ultimately gain you great power. This is the ruse of the perfect courtier. Its symbol is Sir Walter Raleigh, 
who once placed his own cloak on the muddy ground so that Queen Elizabeth would not sully her. Shoes As the instrument that protects a master or peer from unpleasantness. Or danger, you gain immense respect, which sooner or later will pay dividends. And remember, if you can make your assistance subtle and gracious rather than boastful and burdensome, your recompense will be that much the more satisfying and powerful. Image, the cat's ball. It has long claws to grab things. It is soft and padded. Take hold of the cat and use its paw to pluck things out of the fire, to claw your enemy, to play with the mouse before devouring it. Sometimes you hurt the cat, but most often it doesn't feel a thing. Authority, do everything pleasant yourself, everything unpleasant through third parties. By adopting the first course you win favor, by taking the second you deflect ill will. Important affairs often require rewards and punishments. Let only the good come from you and the evil from others. Baltasar Gratian, 1601-1658 Reversal The cat's paw and the scapegoat must be used with extreme caution and delicacy. They are like screens that hide your own involvement in dirty. Work from the public, if at any moment the screen is lifted and you are seen as the manipulator, the puppet master, the whole dynamic turns around, your hand will be seen everywhere, and you will be blamed for misfortunes you may have had nothing to do with. Once the truth is revealed, events will snowball beyond your control. In 1572, Queen Catherine de Medicis of France conspired to do away with Gaspard de Coligny, an admiral in the French navy and a leading member of the Huguenot, French Protestant, community. Coligny was close to Catherine's son, Charles IX, and she feared his growing influence on the young king. So she arranged for a member of the guy's family, one of the most powerful royal clans in France, to assassinate him. Secretly, however, Catherine had another plan. She wanted the Huguenots to blame the Guises for killing one of their leaders, and to take revenge. With one blow, she would erase or injure two threatening rivals. Coligny and the Guise family. Yet both plans went awry. The assassin missed his target, only wounding Coligny, knowing Catherine as his enemy, he strongly suspected it was she who had set up the attack on him, and he told the king so. Eventually the failed assassination and the arguments that ensued from it set off a chain of events that led to a bloody civil war between Catholics and Protestants, culminating in the horrifying massacre of St. Bartholomew's Eve, in which thousands of Protestants were killed. If you have to use a cat's paw or a scapegoat in an action of great consequence, be very careful, too much can go wrong. It is often wiser to use such dupes in more innocent endeavors, where mistakes or miscalculations will cause no serious harm. Finally, there are moments when it is advantageous to not disguise your involvement or responsibility, but rather to take the blame yourself for some mistake. If you have power and are secure in it, you should sometimes play. The penitent, with a sorrowful look, you ask for forgiveness from those weaker than you. It is the ploy of the king who makes a show of his own sacrifices for the good of the people. Similarly, upon occasion you may want to appear as the agent of punishment in order to instill fear and trembling in your subordinates. Instead of the cat's paw you show your own mighty hand as a threatening gesture. Play such a card sparingly. If you play it too often, fear will turn into resentment and hatred. Before you know it, such emotions will spark a vigorous opposition that will someday bring you down. Get in the habit of using a cat's paw, it is far safer. Law 27 Play on people's need to believe to Create a cult-like following Judgment people have an overwhelming desire to believe in something. Become the focal point of such desire by offering them a cause, a new faith to follow. Keep your words vague but full of promise, emphasize enthusiasm over rationality and clear thinking. Give your new disciples rituals to perform, 
ask them to make sacrifices on your behalf. In the absence of organized religion and grand causes, your new belief system will bring you untold power. The Science of Charlatanism, or How to Create a Cult In Five Easy Steps In searching, as you must, for the methods that will gain you the most. Power for the least effort, you will find the creation of a cult-like following. One of the most effective. Having a large following opens up all sorts of possibilities for deception. Not only will your followers worship you, they will defend you from your enemies and will voluntarily take on the work of enticing others to join your fledgling cult. This kind of power will lift you to another realm. You will no longer have to struggle or use subterfuge to enforce your will. You are adored and can do no wrong. It was to the charlatan's advantage that the individuals predisposed to credulity should multiply, that the groups of his adherents should enlarge to mass proportions, guaranteeing an ever greater scope for his triumphs. And this was in fact to occur, as science was popularized, from the Renaissance on down through succeeding centuries. With the immense growth of knowledge and its spread through printing in modern times, the mass of the half-educated, the eagerly gullible prey of the quack, also increased, became indeed a majority, real power could be based on their wishes, opinions, preferences, and rejections. The charlatan's empire accordingly widened with the modern dissemination of knowledge, since he operated on the basis of science, however much he perverted it, producing gold with a technique borrowed from chemistry and his wonderful balsams with the apparatus of medicine, he could not appeal to an entirely ignorant folk. The illiterate would be protected against his absurdities by their healthy common sense. His choicest audience would be composed of the semi-literate, those who had exchanged their common sense for a little distorted information and had encountered science and education at some time, though briefly and unsuccessfully. The great mass of mankind has always been predisposed to marvel at mysteries, and this was especially true at certain historic periods when the secure foundations of life seemed shaken and old values, economic or spiritual, long accepted as certainties, could no longer be relied upon. Then the numbers of the charlatans' dupes multiplied, the de self-killers, as a 17th-century Englishman called them. The Power of the Charlatan, Greta de Francesco, 1939 you might think it a gargantuan task to create such a following, but in fact it is fairly simple. As humans, we have a desperate need to believe in something, anything. This makes us eminently gullible, we simply cannot endure long periods of doubt, or of the emptiness that comes from a lack of something to believe in. Dangle in front of us some new cause, elixir, get rich quick scheme or the latest technological trend or art movement and we leap from the water as one to take the bait look at history the chronicles of the new trends and cults that have made a mass following for themselves could fill a library after a few centuries a few decades a few years a few months they generally look ridiculous but at the time they seem so attractive so transcendental so divine Always in a rush to believe in something, we will manufacture saints and faiths out of nothing. Do not let this gullibility go to waste, make yourself the object of worship. Make people form a cult around you. The great European charlatans of the 16th and 17th centuries mastered the art of cult making. They lived, as we do now, in a time of transformation, organized religion was on the wane, science on the rise. People were desperate to rally around a new cause or faith. The charlatans had begun by peddling health elixirs and alchemic shortcuts to wealth. Moving quickly from town to town, they originally focused on small groups, until, by accident, they stumbled on a truth of human nature, the larger the group they gathered around themselves, the easier it was to deceive. The charlatan would station himself on a high wooden platform, hence the term, mountebank, and crowds would swarm around him. In a group setting, people were more emotional, less able to reason. 
Had the charlatans spoken to them individually, they might have found him ridiculous, but lost in a crowd they got caught up in a communal mood of rapt attention. It became impossible for them to find the distance to be skeptical. Any deficiencies in the charlatans' ideas were hidden by the zeal of the mass. Passion and enthusiasm swept through the crowd like a contagion, and they reacted violently to anyone who dared to spread a seed of doubt. Both consciously studying this dynamic over decades of experiment and spontaneously adapting to these situations as they happened, the charlatans perfected the science of attracting and holding a crowd, molding the crowd into followers and the followers into a cult. The gimmicks of the charlatans may seem quaint today, but there are thousands of charlatans among us still, using the same tried and true methods their predecessors refined centuries ago, only changing the names of their elixirs and modernizing the look of their cults. We find these latter-day charlatans in all arenas of life, business, fashion, politics, art. Many of them, perhaps, are following in the charlatan tradition without having any knowledge of its history, but you can be more systematic and deliberate. Simply follow the five steps of cult making that our charlatan ancestors perfected over the years. Step 1, Keep it vague, keep it simple. To create a cult you must first attract attention. This you should do not through actions, which are too clear and readable, but through words, which are hazy and deceptive. Your initial speeches, conversations, and interviews must include two elements, on the one hand the promise of something great and transformative, and on the other a total vagueness. This combination will stimulate all kinds of hazy dreams in your listeners, who will make their own connections and see what they want to see. To make your vagueness attractive, use words of great resonance but cloudy meaning, words full of heat and enthusiasm. Fancy titles for simple things are helpful, as are the use of numbers and the creation of new words for vague concepts. All of these create the impression of specialized knowledge, giving you a veneer of profundity. By the same token, try to make the subject of your cult new and fresh, so that few will understand it. Done right, the combination of vague promises, cloudy but alluring. Concepts and fiery enthusiasm will stir people's souls and a group will form around you. Talk too vaguely and you have no credibility. But it is more dangerous to be specific. If you explain in detail the benefits people will gain by following your cult, you will be expected to satisfy them. The Owl Who Was God Once upon a starless midnight there was an owl who sat on the branch of an oak tree. Two ground moles tried to slip quietly by, unnoticed. You, said the owl. Who? They quavered, in fear and astonishment, for they could not believe it was possible for anyone to see them in that thick darkness. You too, said the owl. The moles hurried away and told the other creatures of the field and forest that the owl was the greatest and wisest of all animals because he could see in the dark and because he could answer any question. I'll see about that, said a secretary bird, and he called on the owl one night when it was again very dark. How many claws am I holding up, said the secretary bird. Two, said the owl, and that was right. Can you give me another expression for, that is to say, or namely? Asked the secretary bird. To wit, said the owl. Why does a lover call on his love? Asked the secretary bird. To woo, said the owl. The secretary bird hastened back to the other creatures and reported that the owl was indeed the greatest and wisest animal in the world because he could see in the dark and because he could answer any question. Can he see in the daytime, too? Asked a red fox. Yes, echoed a dormouse and a French poodle. Can he see in the daytime, too? All the other creatures laughed loudly at this silly question, and they set upon the red fox and his friends and drove them out of the region. Then they sent a messenger to the owl and asked him to be their leader. When the owl appeared among the animals it was high noon and the sun was shining brightly. He walked very slowly, which gave him an appearance of great dignity, and he peered about him with large, staring eyes, which gave him an air of tremendous importance. He's God! screamed a Plymouth Rock hen. And the others took up the cry, He's God! 
So they followed him wherever he went and when he began to bump into things they began to bump into things. 2. Finally he came to a concrete highway and he started up the middle of it and all the other. Creatures followed him. Presently a hawk, who was acting as outrider, observed a truck coming toward them at 50 miles an hour, and he reported to the secretary bird and the secretary bird reported to the owl. There's danger ahead, said the secretary bird. To wit, said the owl. The secretary bird told him. Aren't you afraid? He asked. Who, said the owl calmly, for he could not see the truck. He's God, cried all the creatures again, and they were still crying, he's God, when the truck hit them and ran them down. Some of the animals were merely injured, but most of them, including the owl, were killed. Moral, you can fool too many of the people too much of the time. The Thurber Carnival, James Thurber, 1894-1961 As a corollary to its vagueness your appeal should also be simple. Most People's problems have complex causes, deep-rooted neurosis. Interconnected social factors, roots that go way back in time and are Exceedingly hard to unravel. Few, however, have the patience to deal with. This, most people want to hear that a simple solution will cure their Problems the ability to offer this kind of solution will give you great power and build you a following instead of the complicated explanations of real life return to the primitive solutions of our ancestors to good old country remedies to mysterious panaceas step two emphasize the visual and the sensual over the intellectual once people have begun to gather around you two dangers will present themselves Boredom and skepticism. Boredom will make people go elsewhere, skepticism will allow them the distance to think rationally about whatever it is you are offering, blowing away the mist you have artfully created and revealing your ideas for what they are. You need to amuse the bored, then, and ward off the cynics. The best way to do this is through theater, or other devices of its kind. Surround yourself with luxury, dazzle your followers with visual splendor, fill their eyes with spectacle. Not only will this keep them from seeing the ridiculousness of your ideas, the holes in your belief system, it will also attract more attention, more followers. Appeal to all the senses, use incense for scent, soothing music for hearing, colorful charts and graphs for the eye. You might even tickle the mind, perhaps by using new technological gadgets to give your cult a pseudoscientific veneer, as long as you do not make anyone really think. Use the exotic, distant cultures, strange customs, to create theatrical effects, and to make the most banal and ordinary affairs seem signs of something extraordinary. Step 3. Borrow the forms of organized religion to structure the group. Your cult-like following is growing, it is time to organize it. Find a way both elevating and comforting. Organized religions have long held unquestioned authority for large numbers of people, and continue to do so in our supposedly secular age. And even if the religion itself has faded some, its forms still resonate with power. The lofty and holy associations of organized religion can be endlessly exploited. Create rituals for your followers, organize them into a hierarchy, ranking them in grades of sanctity, and giving them names and titles that resound with religious overtones, ask them for sacrifices that will fill your coffers and increase your power. To emphasize your gathering's quasi-religious nature, talk and act like a prophet. You are not a dictator, after all, you are a priest, a guru, a sage, a shaman, or any other word that hides your real power in the midst of religion. Step 4. Disguise your source of income. Your group has grown, and you have structured it in a church-like form. Your coffers are beginning to fill with your followers' money. Yet you must never be seen as hungry for money and the power it brings. It is at this moment that you must disguise the source of your income. Your followers want to believe that if they follow you all sorts of good things will fall into their lap. By surrounding yourself with luxury you become living proof of the soundness of your belief system. 
Never reveal that your wealth actually comes from your followers' pockets, instead, make it seem to come from the truth of your methods. Followers will copy your each and every move in the belief that it will bring them the same results, and their imitative enthusiasm will blind them to the charlatan nature of your wealth. Step 5. Set up an us versus them dynamic. The group is now large and thriving, a magnet attracting more and more particles. If you are not careful, though, inertia will set in, and time and boredom will demagnetize the group. To keep your followers united, you must now do what all religions and belief systems have done, create an us versus them dynamic. First, make sure your followers believe they are part of an exclusive club, unified by a bond of common goals. Then, to strengthen this bond, manufacture the notion of a devious enemy out to ruin you. There is a force of non-believers that will do anything to stop you. Any outsider who tries to reveal the charlatan nature of your belief system can now be described as a member of this devious force. If you have no enemies, invent one. Given a straw man to react against, your followers will tighten and cohere. They have your cause to believe in and infidels to destroy. Observances of the Law Observance I in the year 1653, a 27-year-old Milan man named Francesco Giuseppe Bori claimed to have had a vision. He went around town telling one and all that the Archangel Michael had appeared to him and announced that he had been chosen to be the Capitano General of the Army of the New Pope, an army that would seize and revitalize the world. The Archangel had further revealed that Bori now had the power to see people's souls, and that he would soon discover the Philosopher's Stone, a long sought after substance that could change base metals into gold. Friends and acquaintances who heard Bori explain the vision, and who witnessed the change that had come over him, were impressed, for Bori had previously devoted himself to a life of wine, women, and gambling. Now he gave all that up, plunging himself into the study of alchemy and talking only of mysticism and the occult. The transformation was so sudden and miraculous, and Bori's words were so filled with enthusiasm, that he began to create a following. Unfortunately the Italian Inquisition began to notice him as well, they prosecuted anyone who delved into the occult, so he left Italy and began to wander Europe, from Austria to Holland, telling one and all that, to those who follow me all joy shall be granted. Wherever Bori stayed he attracted followers. His method was simple, he spoke of his vision, which had grown more and more elaborate, and offered to, look into, the soul of anyone who believed him, and they were many. Seemingly in a trance, he would stare at this new follower for several minutes, then claim to have seen the person's soul, degree of enlightenment, and potential for spiritual greatness. If what he saw showed promise, he would add the person to his growing order of disciples, an honor indeed. The cult had six degrees, into which the disciples were assigned according to what Bori had glimpsed in their souls. With work and total devotion to the cult they could graduate to a higher degree. Bori, whom they called His Excellency, and Universal Doctor, demanded from them the strictest vows of poverty. All the goods and monies they possessed had to be turned over to him. But they did not mind handing over their property, for Bori had told them, I shall soon bring my chemical studies to a happy conclusion by the discovery of the Philosopher's Stone, and by this means we shall all have as much gold as we desire. To become the founder of a new religion one must be psychologically infallible in one's knowledge of a certain average type of souls who have not yet recognized that they belong together. Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844-1900 Given his growing wealth, Bori began to change his style of living. Renting the most splendid apartment in the city into which he had temporarily settled, he would furnish it with fabulous furniture and accessories, which he had begun to collect. He would drive through the city in a coach studded with jewels, with six magnificent black horses at its head. He never stayed too long in one place, and when he disappeared, saying he had more souls to gather into his flock, his reputation only grew in his absence. He became famous, although in fact he had never done a single concrete thing. From all over Europe, the blind, the crippled, and the desperate came to visit Bori, 
for word had spread that he had healing powers. He asked no fee for his services, which only made him seem more marvelous, and indeed some claimed that in this or that city he had performed a miracle cure. By only hinting at his accomplishments, he encouraged people's imaginations. To blow them up to fantastic proportions. His wealth, for example, actually came from the vast sums he was collecting from his increasingly select group of rich disciples, yet it was presumed that he had in fact perfected the philosopher's stone. The church continued to pursue him, denouncing him for heresy and witchcraft, and Bori's response to these charges was a dignified silence, this only enhanced his reputation and made his followers more passionate. Only the great are persecuted, after all, how many understood Jesus Christ in his own time? Bori did not have to say a word, his followers now called the Pope the Antichrist. Men are so simple of mind, and so much dominated by their immediate needs, that a deceitful man will always find plenty who are ready to be deceived. Niccolo Machiavelli, 1469-1527 And so Bori's power grew and grew, until one day he left the city of Amsterdam, where he had settled for a while, absconding with huge sums of borrowed money in diamonds that had been entrusted to him. He claimed to be able to remove the flaws from diamonds through the power of his gifted mind. Now he was on the run. The Inquisition eventually caught up with him, and for the last twenty years of his life he was imprisoned in Rome. But so great was the belief in his occult powers that to his dying day he was visited by wealthy believers, including Queen Christina of Sweden. Supplying him with money and materials, these visitors allowed him to continue his search for the elusive philosopher's stone. The Temple of Health In the late 1780s, the Scottish quack James Graham, was winning a large following and great riches in London. Graham, maintained a show of great scientific technique. In 1772, he had visited Philadelphia, where he met Benjamin Franklin and became interested in the latter's experiments with electricity. These appear to have inspired the apparatus in the Temple of Health, the fabulous establishment he opened in London for the sale of his elixirs. In the chief room, where he received patients, stood the largest air pump in the world to assist him in his philosophical investigations into disease, and also a stupendous metallic conductor, a richly gilded pedestal surrounded with retorts and vials of ethereal and other essences. According to J. Enemoser, who published a history of magic in 1844 at Leipzig, Graham's house united the useful with the pleasurable. Everywhere the utmost magnificence was displayed. Even in the outer court, avert an eyewitness, it seemed as though art, invention, and riches had been exhausted. On the side walls in the chambers an arc-shaped glow was provided by artificial electric light, star rays darted forth, transparent glasses of all colors were placed with clever selection and much taste. All this, the same eyewitness assures us, was ravishing and exalted the imagination to the highest degree. Visitors were given a printed sheet of rules for healthy living. In the great Apollo apartment they might join in mysterious rituals, accompanied by chants, hail, vital air, ethereal. Magnetic magic, hail. And while they hailed the magic of magnetism, the windows were darkened, revealing a ceiling studded with electric stars and a young and lovely, rosy goddess of health, in a niche. Every evening this temple of health was crowded with guests, it had become the fashion to visit it and try the great twelve-foot bed of state, that grand celestial bed, said to cure any disease. This bed, according to Enemoser, stood in a splendid room, into which a cylinder led from an adjoining chamber to conduct the healing currents, at the same time all sorts of pleasing scents of strengthening herbs and oriental incense were also brought in through glass tubes. The heavenly bed itself rested upon six solid transparent pillars, the bedclothes were of purple and sky-blue atlas silk, spread over a mattress saturated with Arabian perfumed waters to suit the tastes of the Persian court. The chamber in which it was placed he called the Sanctum Sanctorum. To add to all this, there were the melodious notes of the harmonica, soft flutes, agreeable voices, and a great organ. The power of the charlatan, 
Greta de Francesco, 1939. Interpretation Before he formed his cult, Bori seems to have stumbled on a critical discovery. Tiring of his life of debauchery, he had decided to give it up and to devote himself to the occult, a genuine interest of his. He must have noticed, however, that when he alluded to a mystical experience, rather than physical exhaustion, as the source of his conversion, people of all classes wanted to hear more, realizing the power he could gain by ascribing the change to something external and mysterious, he went further with his manufactured visions. The grander the vision, and the more sacrifices he asked for, the more appealing and believable his story seemed to become. Remember, people are not interested in the truth about change. They do not want to hear that it has come from hard work, or from anything as banal as exhaustion, boredom, or depression, they are dying to believe in something romantic, otherworldly. They want to hear of angels and out-of-body experiences. Indulge them. Hint at the mystical source of some personal change, wrap it in ethereal colors, and a cult-like following will form around you. Adapt to people's needs, the Messiah must mirror the desires of his followers. And always aim high. The bigger and bolder your illusion, the better. Observance too in the mid-1700s, word spread in Europe's fashionable society of a Swiss country doctor named Michael Schuppach who practiced a different kind of medicine, he used the healing powers of nature to perform miraculous cures. Soon well-to-do people from all over the continent, their ailments both serious and mild, were making the trek to the alpine village of Langnau, where Schuppach lived and worked. Trudging through the mountains, these visitors witnessed the most dramatic natural landscapes that Europe has to offer. By the time they reached Langnau, they were already feeling transformed and on their way to health. Schuppach, who had become known as simply the Mountain Doctor, had a small pharmacy in town. This place became quite a scene, crowds of people from many different countries would cram the small room, its walls lined with colorful bottles filled with herbal cures. Where most doctors of the time prescribed foul-tasting concoctions that bore incomprehensible Latin titles, as medicines often do still, Shepica's cures had names such as, the oil of joy, little flower's heart, or, against the monster, and they tasted sweet and pleasing. Visitors to Langnau would have to wait patiently for a visit with the mountain doctor, because every day some eighty messengers would arrive at the pharmacy bearing flasks of urine from all over Europe. Shuppuck Claimed he could diagnose what ailed you simply by looking at a sample of your urine and reading a written description of your ailment. Naturally he read the description very carefully before prescribing a cure. When he finally had a spare minute, the urine samples took up much of his time, he would call the visitor into his office in the pharmacy. He would then examine this person's urine sample, explaining that its appearance would tell him everything he needed to know. Country people had a sense for these things, he would say, their wisdom came from living a simple, godly life with none of the complications of urban living. This personal consultation would also include a discussion as to how one might bring one's soul more into harmony with nature. Shuppuck had devised many forms of treatment, each profoundly unlike the usual medical practices of the time. He was a believer, for instance, in electric shock therapy. To those who wondered whether this was in keeping with his belief in the healing power of nature, he would explain that electricity is a natural phenomenon, he was merely imitating the power of lightning. One of his patients claimed to be inhabited by seven devils. The doctor cured him with electrical shocks, and as he administered these he exclaimed that he could see the devils flying out of the man's body, one by one. Another man claimed to have swallowed a hay wagon and its driver, which were causing him massive pains in the chest. The mountain doctor listened patiently, claimed to be able to hear the crack of a whip in the man's belly, promised to cure him, and gave him a sedative and a purgative. The man fell asleep on a chair outside the pharmacy. As soon as he awoke he vomited, and as he vomited a hay wagon sped past him, the mountain doctor had hired it for the occasion, 
the crack of its whip making him feel that somehow he had indeed expelled it under the doctor's care. Over the years, the mountain doctor's fame grew. He was consulted by the powerful, even the writer Goethe made the trek to his village, and he became the center of a cult of nature in which everything natural was considered worthy of worship. Shuppuk was careful to create effects that would entertain and inspire his patients. A professor who visited him once wrote, One stands or sits in company, one plays cards, sometimes with a young woman, now a concert is given, now a lunch or supper, and now a little ballet is presented. With a very happy effect, the freedom of nature is everywhere united with the pleasures of the beau monde, and if the doctor is not able to heal any diseases, he can at least cure hypochondria and the vapors. Interpretation Shuppuk had begun his career as an ordinary village doctor. He would sometimes use in his practice some of the village remedies he had grown up with, and apparently he noticed some results, for soon these herbal tinctures and natural forms of healing became his specialty. And in fact his natural form of healing did have profound psychological effects on his patients. Where the normal drugs of the time created fear and pain, Shepika's treatments were comfortable and soothing. The resulting improvement in the patient's mood was a critical element in the cures he brought about. His patients believed so deeply in his skills that they willed themselves into health. Instead of scoffing at their irrational explanations for their ailments, Shuppuk used their hypochondria to make it seem that he had effected a great cure. The case of the mountain doctor teaches us valuable lessons in the creation of a cult-like following. First, you must find a way to engage people's will, to make their belief in your powers strong enough that they imagine all sorts of benefits. Their belief will have a self-fulfilling quality, but you must make sure that it is you, rather than their own will, who is seen as the agent of transformation. Find the belief, cause, or fantasy that will make them believe with a passion and they will imagine the rest, worshipping you as healer, prophet, genius, whatever you like. Second, Shuppet teaches us the everlasting power of belief in nature, and in simplicity. Nature, in reality, is full of much that is terrifying, poisonous plants, fierce animals, sudden disasters, plagues. Belief in the healing, comforting quality of nature is really a constructed myth, a eh? romanticism. But the appeal to nature can bring you great power, especially in complicated and stressful times. The power of a lie in the town of Tarnapal lived a man by the name of Reb Fievel. One day, as he sat in his house deeply absorbed in his Talmud, he heard a loud noise outside. When he went to the window he saw a lot of little pranksters. Up to some new piece of mischief, no doubt, he thought. Children, run quickly to the synagogue, he cried, leaning out and improvising the first story that occurred to him. You'll see there a sea monster, and what a monster. It's a creature with five feet, three eyes, and a beard like that of a goat, only it's green. And sure enough the children scampered off and Reb Fievel returned to his studies. He smiled into his beard as he thought of the trick he had played on those little rascals. It wasn't long before his studies were interrupted again, this time by running footsteps. When he went to the window he saw several Jews running. Where are you running? he called out. To the synagogue, answered the Jews. Haven't you heard? There's a sea monster, there's a creature with five legs, three eyes. And a beard like that of a goat, only it's green. Reb Fievel laughed with glee, thinking of the trick he had played, and sat down again to his Talmud. But no sooner had he begun to concentrate when suddenly he heard a dinning tumult outside. And what did he see? A great crowd of men, women and children, all running toward the synagogue. What's up, he cried, sticking his head out of the window. What a question. Why? Don't you know? They answered. Right in front of the synagogue there's a sea monster. It's a creature with five legs, three eyes, and a beard like that of a goat, only it's green. And as the crowd hurried by, Reb Fievel suddenly noticed that the rabbi himself was among them. Lord of the world, 
he exclaimed. If the rabbi himself is running with them surely there must be something happening. Where there's smoke there's fire. Without further thought Reb Fievel grabbed his hat, left his house, and also began running. Who can tell, he muttered to himself as he ran, all out of breath, toward the synagogue. A Treasury of Jewish Folklore, Nathan Ozabel, ed., 1948. This appeal, however, must be handled right. Devise a kind of theater of nature in which you, as the director, pick and choose the qualities that fit the romanticism of the times. The mountain doctor played the part to perfection, playing up his homespun wisdom and wit, and staging his cures as dramatic pieces. He did not make himself one with nature, instead he molded nature into a cult, an artificial construction. To create a natural effect you actually have to work hard, making nature theatrical and delightfully pagan. Otherwise no one will notice. Nature too must follow. Trends and be progressive. Observance 3 In 1788, at the age of 55, the doctor and scientist Franz Mesmer was at a crossroads. He was a pioneer in the study of animal magnetism, the belief that animals contain magnetic matter, and that a doctor or specialist can effect miraculous cures by working on this charged substance but in Vienna, where he lived, his theories had met with scorn and ridicule from the medical establishment. In treating women for convulsions, Mesmer claimed to have worked a number of cures, his proudest achievement being the restoration of sight to a blind girl. But another doctor who examined the young girl said she was as blind as ever, an assessment with which she herself agreed. Mesmer countered that his enemies were out to slander him by winning her over to their side. This claim only elicited more ridicule. Clearly the sober-minded Viennese were the wrong audience for his theories, and so he decided to move to Paris and start again. Renting a splendid apartment in his new city, Mesmer decorated it. Appropriately. Stained glass in most of the windows created a religious feeling, and mirrors on all the walls produced an hypnotic effect. The doctor advertised that in his apartment he would give demonstrations of the powers of animal magnetism, inviting the diseased and melancholic to feel its powers. Soon Parisians of all classes, but mostly women, who seemed more attracted to the idea than men did, were paying for entry to witness the miracles that Mesmer promised. Inside the apartment, the scents of orange blossom and exotic incense wafted through special vents. As the initiates filtered into the salon where the demonstrations took place, they heard harp music and the lulling sounds of a female vocalist coming from another room. In the center of the salon was a long oval container filled with water that Mesmer claimed had been magnetized. From holes in the container's metal lid protruded long movable iron rods. The visitors were instructed to sit around the container, place. These magnetized rods on the body part that gave them pains or problems, and then hold hands with their neighbors, sitting as close as possible to one another to help the magnetic force pass between their bodies. Sometimes, too, they were attached to each other by cords. Mesmer would leave the room, and assistant magnetizers, all handsome and strapping young men, would enter with jars of magnetized water that they would sprinkle on the patients, rubbing the healing fluid on their bodies, massaging it into their skin, moving them toward a trance-like state. And after a few minutes a kind of delirium would overcome the women. Some would sob, some would shriek and tear their hair, others would laugh hysterically. At the height of the delirium Mesmer would re-enter the salon, dressed in a flowing silk robe embroidered with golden flowers and carrying a white magnetic rod. Moving around the container, he would stroke and soothe the patients until calm was restored. Many women would later attribute the strange power he had on them to his piercing look, which, they thought, was exciting or quieting the magnetic fluids in their bodies. Within months of his arrival in Paris, Mesmer became the rage. His supporters included Marie Antoinette herself, the Queen of France, wife of Louis XVI. 
As in Vienna, he was condemned by the official faculty of medicine, but it did not matter. His growing following of pupils and patients paid him handsomely. Mesmer expanded his theories to proclaim that all humanity could be brought into harmony through the power of magnetism, a concept with much appeal during the French Revolution. A cult of mesmerism spread across the country, in many towns, societies of harmony sprang up to experiment with magnetism. These societies eventually became notorious, they tended to be led by libertines who would turn their sessions into a kind of group orgy. At the height of Mesmer's popularity, a French commission published a report based on years of testing the theory of animal magnetism. The conclusion, magnetism's effects on the body actually came from a kind of group hysteria and autosuggestion. The report was well documented, and ruined Mesmer's reputation in France. He left the country and went into retirement. Only a few years later, however, imitators sprang up all over. Europe and the cult of mesmerism spread once again, its believers more numerous than ever. Interpretation Mesmer's career can be broken into two parts. When still in Vienna, he clearly believed in the validity of his theory, and did all he could to prove it. But his growing frustration and the disapproval of his colleagues made him adopt another strategy. First he moved to Paris, where no one knew him, and where his extravagant theories found a more fruitful soil. Then he appealed to the French love of theater and spectacle, making his apartment into a kind of magical world in which a sensory overload of smells, sights, and sounds entranced his customers. Most important, from now on he practiced his magnetism only on a group. The group provided the setting in which the magnetism would have its proper effect, one believer infecting the other, overwhelming any individual doubter. Mesmer thus passed from being a confirmed advocate of magnetism to the role of a charlatan using every trick in the book to captivate the public. The biggest trick of all was to play on the repressed sexuality that bubbles under the surface of any group setting. In a group, a longing for social unity, a longing older than civilization, cries out to be awakened. This desire may be subsumed under a unifying cause, but beneath it is a repressed sexuality that the charlatan knows how to exploit and manipulate for his own purposes. This is the lesson that Mesmer teaches us, our tendency to doubt, the distance that allows us to reason, is broken down when we join a group. The warmth and infectiousness of the group overwhelm the skeptical individual. This is the power you gain by creating a cult. Also, by playing on people's repressed sexuality, you lead them into mistaking their excited feelings for signs of your mystical strength. You gain untold power by working on people's unrealized desire for a kind of promiscuous and pagan unity. Remember too that the most effective cults mix religion with science. Take the latest technological trend or fad and blend it with a noble cause, a mystical faith, a new form of healing. People's interpretations of your hybrid cult will run rampant, and they will attribute powers to you that you had never even thought to claim. Image, the magnet. An unseen force draws objects to it, which in turn become magnetized themselves, drawing other pieces to them, the magnetic power of the whole constantly increasing. But take away the original magnet and it all falls apart. Become the magnet, the invisible force that attracts people's imaginations and holds them together. Once they have clustered around you, no power can wrest them away. Authority the charlatan achieves his great power by simply opening a possibility for men to believe what they already want to believe. The credulous cannot keep at a distance, they crowd around the wonder worker, entering his personal aura, surrendering themselves to illusion with a heavy solemnity, like cattle. Greta de Francesco Reversal One reason to create a following is that a group is often easier to deceive than an individual, and turns over to you that much more power. This comes, however, with a danger, if at any moment the group sees through you, you will find yourself facing not one deceived soul but an angry crowd that will tear you to pieces as avidly as it once followed you. The charlatans constantly faced this danger, and were always ready to move out of town as it inevitably became clear that their elixirs did not work and their ideas were sham. Too slow and they paid with their lives. 
In playing with the crowd, you are playing with fire, and must constantly keep an eye out for any sparks of doubt, any enemies who will turn the crowd against you. When you play with the emotions of a crowd, you have to know how to adapt, attuning yourself instantaneously to all of the moods and desires that a group will produce. You spies, be on top of everything, and keep your bags packed. For this reason you may often prefer to deal with people one by one. Isolating them from their normal milieu can have the same effect as putting them in a group, it makes them more prone to suggestion and intimidation. Choose the right sucker and if he eventually sees through you he may prove easier to escape than a crowd. Law 28. Enter action with boldness. Judgment if you are unsure of a course of action, do not attempt it. Your doubts and hesitations will infect your execution. Timidity is dangerous, better to enter with boldness. Any mistakes you commit through audacity are easily corrected with more audacity. Everyone admires the bold, no one honors the timid. Boldness and hesitation, a brief psychological comparison. Boldness and hesitation elicit very different psychological responses in there. Targets, hesitation puts obstacles in your path, boldness eliminates them. Once you understand this, you will find it essential to overcome your natural timidity and practice the art of audacity. The following are among the most pronounced psychological effects of boldness and timidity. The two adventurers. The path of pleasure never leads to glory. The prodigious achievements of Hercules were the result of high adventure, and though there is little, either in fable or history, to show that he had any rivals, still it is recorded that a knight-errant, in company with a fellow adventurer, sought his fortune in a romantic country. He had not traveled far when his companion observed a post, on which was written the following inscription, Brave adventurer, if you have a desire to discover that which has never been seen by any knight-errant, you have only to pass this torrent, and then take in your arms an elephant of stone and carry it in one breath to the summit of this mountain, whose noble head seems blended with the sky. But, said the knight's companion, the water may be deep as well as rapid, and though, notwithstanding, we should pass it, why should we be encumbered with the elephant? What a ridiculous undertaking! And Philosophically and with nice calculation, he observed that the elephant might be carried for steps, but for conveying it to the top of the mountain in one breath, that was not in the power of a mortal, unless it should be the dwarf figure of an elephant, fit only to be placed on the top of a stick, and then what honor would there be in such an adventure? There is, said he, some deception in this writing. It is an enigma only fit to amuse a child. I shall therefore leave you and your elephant. The reasoner then departed, but the adventurous man rushed with his eyes closed across the water, neither depth nor violence prevented him, and according to the inscription he saw the elephant lying on the opposite bank. He took it and carried it to the top of the hill, where he saw a town. A shriek from the elephant alarmed the people of the city, who rose in arms, but the adventurer, nothing daunted, was determined to die a hero. The people, however, were awed by his presence, and he was astonished to hear them proclaim him. Successor to their king, who had recently died. Great enterprises are only achieved by Adventurous spirits. They who calculate with too great nicety every difficulty and obstacle which is likely to lie in their way, lose that time and hesitation, which the more daring seize and render available to the loftiest purposes. Fables, Jean de L.A. Fontaine, 1621-1695 The bolder the lie the better. We all have weaknesses, and our efforts are never perfect. But entering action with boldness has the magical effect of hiding our deficiencies. Con artists know that the bolder the lie, the more convincing it becomes. The sheer audacity of the story makes it more credible, distracting attention from its inconsistencies. When putting together a con or entering any kind of negotiation, go further than you planned. Ask for the moon and you will be surprised how often you get it. 
Lions circle the hesitant prey. People have a sixth sense for the weaknesses of others. If, in a first encounter, you demonstrate your willingness to compromise, back down, and retreat, you bring out the lion even in people who are not necessarily bloodthirsty. Everything depends on perception, and once you are seen as the kind of person who quickly goes on the defensive, who is willing to negotiate and be amenable, you will be pushed around without mercy. Boldness strikes fear, fear creates authority. The bold move makes you seem larger and more powerful than you are. If it comes suddenly, with the stealth and swiftness of a snake, it inspires that much more fear. By intimidating with a bold move, you establish a precedent, in every subsequent encounter, people will be on the defensive, in terror of your next strike. Going halfway with half a heart digs the deeper grave. If you enter an action with less than total confidence, you set up obstacles in your own path. When a problem arises you will grow confused, seeing options where there are none and inadvertently creating more problems still. Retreating from the hunter, the timid hare scurries more easily into his snares. Hesitation creates gaps, boldness obliterates them. When you take time to think, to hem and haw, you create a gap that allows others time to think as well. Your timidity infects people with awkward energy, elicits embarrassment. Doubt springs up on all sides. Boldness destroys such gaps. The swiftness of the move and the energy of the action leave others no space to doubt and worry. In seduction, hesitation is fatal, it makes your victim conscious of your intentions. The bold move crowns seduction with triumph, it leaves no time for reflection. Audacity separates you from the herd. Boldness gives you presence and makes you seem larger than life. The timid fade into the wallpaper, the bold draw attention, and what draws attention draws power. We cannot keep our eyes off the audacious, we cannot wait to see their next bold move. Observances of the Law Observance I in May of 1925, five of the most successful dealers in the French scrap metal business found themselves invited to an official, but highly confidential, meeting with the Deputy Director General of the Ministry of Post and Telegraphs at the Hotel Crillon, then the most luxurious hotel in Paris. When the businessmen arrived, it was the Director General himself, a Monsieur Lustig, who met them in a swank suite on the top floor. The businessmen had no idea why they had been summoned to this meeting, and they were bursting with curiosity. After drinks, the director explained. Gentlemen, he said, this is an urgent matter that requires complete secrecy. The government is going to have to tear down the Eiffel Tower. The dealers listened in stunned silence as the director explained that the tower, as recently reported in the news, desperately needed repairs. It had originally been meant as a temporary structure, for the exposition of. 1889, its maintenance costs had soared over the years, and now, in a time of a fiscal crisis, the government would have to spend millions to fix it. Many Parisians considered the Eiffel Tower an eyesore and would be delighted to see it go. Over time, even the tourists would forget about it, it would live on in photographs and postcards. Gentlemen, Lustig said, you are all invited to make the government an offer for the Eiffel Tower. He gave the businessmen sheets of government stationery filled with figures, such as the tonnage of the tower's metal. Their eyes popped as they calculated how much they could make from the scrap. Then Lustig led them to a waiting limo, which brought them to the Eiffel Tower. Flashing an official badge, he guided them through the area, spicing his tour with. Amusing anecdotes at the end of the visit he thanked them and asked them to have their offers delivered to his suite within four days. Several days after the offers were submitted, one of the five, a Monsieur P, received notice that his bid was the winner, and that to secure the sale he should come to the suite at the hotel within two days, bearing a certified check for more than 250,000 francs, the equivalent today of about $1 million, a quarter of the total price. On delivery of the check, he would receive the documents confirming his ownership of the Eiffel Tower. Monsieur P was excited, he would go down in history as the man who had bought and torn down the infamous landmark. But by the time he arrived at the suite, check in hand, 
he was beginning to have doubts about the whole affair. Why meet in a hotel instead of a government building? Why hadn't he heard from other officials? Was this a hoax, a scam? As he listened to, Lustig discussed the arrangements for the scrapping of the tower, he hesitated. And contemplated backing out. Suddenly, however, he realized that the director had changed his tone. Instead of talking about the tower, he was complaining about his low salary, about his wife's desire for a fur coat, about how galling it was to work hard and be unappreciated. It dawned on Monsieur P that this high government official was asking for a bribe. The effect on him, though, was not outrage but relief. Now he was sure that Lustig was for real, since in all of his previous encounters with French bureaucrats, they had inevitably asked for a little greasing of the palm. His confidence restored, Monsieur P slipped the director several thousand francs in bills, then handed him the certified check. In return he received the documentation, including an impressive-looking bill of sale. He left the hotel, dreaming of the profits and fame to come. Always set to work without misgivings on the score of imprudence. Fear of failure in the mind of a performer is, for an onlooker, already evidence of failure. Actions are dangerous when there is doubt as to their wisdom, it would be safer to do nothing. Baltasar Gratian, 1601-1658 Over the next few days, however, as Monsieur P waited for correspondence from the government, he began to realize that something was amiss. A few telephone calls made it clear that there was no deputy. Director General Lustig, and there were no plans to destroy the Eiffel Tower. He had been built of over 250,000 francs. Monsieur P. never went to the police. He knew what kind of reputation he would get if word got out that he had fallen for one of the most absurdly audacious cons in history. Besides the public humiliation, it would have been business suicide. The story of Hu saying in a lowly thatched cottage in the Nam San Valley there lived a poor couple, Mr. and Mrs. Hu Sang. The husband confined himself for seven years and only read books in his cold room. One day his wife, all in tears, said to him, Look here, my good man. What is the use of all your book reading? I have spent my youth in washing and sewing for other people and yet I have no spare jacket or skirt to wear and I have had no food to eat during the past three days. I am hungry and cold. I can stand it no more. Hearing these words, the middle-aged scholar closed his book, rose to his feet and, without saying another word, he went out of doors. Arriving in the heart of the city, he stopped a passing gentleman. Hello, my friend. Who is the richest man in town? Poor countryman. Don't you know Bayansai, the millionaire? His glittering tile-roofed house pierced by twelve gates is just over there. Ha Sang bent his steps. To the rich man's house. Having entered the big gate, he flung the guest room door open and addressed the host, I need 10,000 yang for capital for my commercial business and I want you to lend me the money. All right, sir. Where shall I send the money? To the Ansong market in care of a commission merchant. Very well, sir. I will draw on Kim, who does the biggest commission business in the Ansong market. You'll get the money there. Goodbye, sir. When Ha Seng was gone, all the other guests in the room asked Bayan SSI why he gave so much money to a beggar-like stranger whose family name was unknown to him. But the rich man replied with a triumphant face, even though he was in ragged clothes, he spoke clearly to the point without betraying shame or inferiority, unlike common people who want to borrow money for a bad debt. Such a man as he is either mad or self-confident in doing business. But judging from his dauntless eyes and booming voice he is an uncommon man with a superhuman brain. Worthy of my trust. I know money and I know men. Money often makes a man small, but a man. Like him makes big money. I am only glad to have helped a big man do big business. Behind the scenes of royal palaces in Korea, 
Ha Tae Hung, 1983. Interpretation Had Count Victor Lustig, con artist extraordinaire, tried to sell the Arc de Triomphe, a bridge over the Seine, a statue of Balzac, no one would have believed him. But the Eiffel Tower was just too large, too improbable to be part of a con job. In fact it was so improbable that Lustig was able to return to Paris six months later and resell the Eiffel Tower to a different scrap iron dealer, and for a higher price, a sum in francs equivalent today to over $1,500,000. Largeness of scale deceives the human eye. It distracts and awes us, and is so self-evident that we cannot imagine there is any illusion or deception afoot. Arm yourself with bigness and boldness, stretch your deceptions as far as they will go and then go further. If you sense that the sucker has suspicions, do as the intrepid Lustig did, instead of backing down, or lowering his price, he simply raised his price higher, by asking for and getting a bribe. Asking for more puts the other person on the defensive, cuts out the nibbling effect of compromise and doubt, and overwhelms with its boldness. Observance 2 On his deathbed in 1533, Vasily III, the Grand Duke of Moscow and ruler of a semi-united Russia, proclaimed his three-year-old son, Ivan IV, as his successor. He appointed his young wife, Helena, as regent until Ivan reached his majority and could rule on his own. The aristocracy, the boyars, secretly rejoiced, for years the dukes of Moscow had been trying to extend their authority over the boyars' turf. With Vasily dead, his heir a mere three years old, and a young woman in charge of the dukedom, the boyars would be able to roll back the duke's gains, wrest control of the state, and humiliate the royal family. Aware of these dangers, young Helena turned to her trusted friend Prince Ivan Obolensky to help her rule. But after five years as regent she suddenly died, poisoned by a member of the Shueysky family, the most fearsome boyar clan. The Shueysky princes seized control of the government and threw Obolensky in prison, where he starved to death. At the age of 8, Ivan was now a despised orphan, and any boyar or family member who took an interest in him was immediately banished or killed. And so Ivan roamed the palace, hungry, ill-clothed, and often in hiding from the Shuiskis, who treated him roughly when they saw him. On some days they would search him out, clothe him in royal robes, hand him a scepter, and set him on the throne, a kind of mock ritual in which they lampooned his royal pretensions. Then they would shoo him away. One evening several of them chased the Metropolitan, the head of the Russian church, through the palace, and he sought refuge in Ivan's room, the boy watched in horror as the Shuiskis entered, hurled insults, and beat the Metropolitan mercilessly. Ivan had one friend in the palace, a boyar named Vorontsov who consoled and advised him. One day, however, as he, Vorontsov, and the newest Metropolitan conferred in the palace refectory, several Shuiskis burst in, beat up Vorontsov, and insulted the Metropolitan by tearing and treading on his robes. Then they banished Vorontsov from Moscow. Throughout all this Ivan maintained a strict silence. To the boyars it seemed that their plan had worked, the young man had turned into a terrified and obedient idiot. They could ignore him now, even leave him alone. But on the evening of December 29, 1543, Ivan, now thirteen, asked Prince Andrei Shueysky to come to his room. When the prince arrived, the room was filled with palace guards. Young Ivan then pointed his finger at Andrei and ordered the guards to arrest him, have him killed, and throw his body to the bloodhounds in the royal kennel. Over the next few days Ivan had all of Andrei's close associates arrested and banished. Caught off guard by his sudden boldness, the boyars now stood in mortal terror of this youth, the future Ivan the Terrible, who had planned and waited for five years to execute this one swift and bold act that would secure his power for decades to come. Interpretation The world is full of boyars, men who despise you, fear your ambition, and jealously guard their shrinking realms of power. You need to establish your authority and gain respect, but the moment the boyars sense your growing boldness, they will act to thwart you. This is how Ivan met such a situation. 
He lay low, showing neither ambition nor discontent. He waited, and when the time came he brought the palace guards over to his side. The guards had come to hate the cruel Shuiskis. Once they agreed to Ivan's plan, he struck with the swiftness of a snake, pointing his finger at Shuiskai and giving him no time to react. Negotiate with a boyar and you create opportunities for him. A small compromise becomes the toehold he needs to tear you apart. The sudden bold move, without discussion or warning, obliterates these toeholds, and builds your authority. You terrify doubters and despisers and gain the confidence of the many who admire and glorify those who act boldly. Observance 3 In 1514 the 22-year-old Pietro Aretino was working as a lowly assistant scullion to a wealthy Roman family. He had ambitions of greatness as a writer, to inflame the world with his name, but how could a mere lackey hope to realize such dreams? That year Pope Leo X received from the King of Portugal an embassy that included many gifts, most prominent among them a great elephant, the first in Rome since imperial times. The pontiff adored this elephant and showered it with attention and gifts. But despite his love and care, the elephant, which was called Hanno, became deathly ill. The Pope summoned doctors, who administered a 500-pound purgative to the elephant, but all to no avail. The animal died and the Pope went into mourning. To console himself he summoned the great painter Raphael and ordered him to create a life-sized painting of Hanno above the animal's tomb, bearing the Inscription, what nature took away, Raphael has with his art restored. Fear, which always magnifies objects, gives a body to all their fancies, which takes for its form whatever they conceive to exist in their enemies' thoughts, so that fearful persons seldom fail to fall into real inconveniences, occasioned by imaginary dangers. And the Duke, whose predominant character was to be always full of fear and of distrust, was, of all men I have ever seen, the most capable of falling into false steps, by the dread he had of falling into them, being in that like unto hares. Cardinal de Retz, 1613-1679 Over the next few days, a pamphlet circulated throughout Rome that caused great merriment and laughter. Entitled, The Last Will and Testament of the Elephant Hanno, it read, in part, to my heir the Cardinal Santa Croce, I give my knees, so that he can imitate my genuflections. To my heir Cardinal Santi Quattro, I give my jaws, so that he can more readily devour all of Christ's revenues. To my heir Cardinal Medici, I give my ears, so that he can hear everyone's doings. To Cardinal Grassi, who had a reputation for lechery, the elephant bequeathed the appropriate, oversized part of his own anatomy. On and on the anonymous pamphlet went, sparing none of the great in Rome, not even the Pope. With each one it took aim at their best-known weakness. The pamphlet ended with verse, See to it that Aretino is your friend slash for he is a bad enemy to have, slash his words alone could ruin the high Pope slash so God guard everyone from his tongue. Interpretation with one short pamphlet, Aretino, son of a poor shoemaker and a servant himself, hurled himself to fame. Everyone in Rome rushed to find out who this daring young man was. Even the Pope, amused by his audacity, sought him out and ended up giving him a job in the papal service. Over the years he came to be known as the scourge of princes, and his biting tongue earned him the respect and fear of the great, from the King of France to the Habsburg Emperor. The Aretino strategy is simple, when you are as small and obscure as David was, you must find a Goliath to attack. The larger the target, the more attention you gain. The bolder the attack, the more you stand out from the crowd, and the more admiration you earn. Society is full of those who think daring thoughts but lack the guts to print and publicize them. Voice what the public feels, the expression of shared feelings is always powerful. Search out the most prominent target possible and sling your boldest shot. The world will enjoy the spectacle, and will honor the underdog, you, that is, with glory and power. The boy and the nettle a boy playing in the fields got stung by a nettle. He ran home to his mother, telling her that he had but touched that nasty weed, and it had stung him. It was just your touching it, my boy, said the mother, that caused it to sting you, 
the next time you meddle with a nettle, grasp it tightly, and it will do you no hurt. Do boldly what you do at all. Fables, Aesop, 6th century BC. Keys to power most of us are timid. We want to avoid tension and conflict and we want to be liked by all. We may contemplate a bold action but we rarely bring it to life. We are terrified of the consequences, of what others might think of us, of the hostility we will stir up if we dare go beyond our usual place. Although we may disguise our timidity as a concern for others, a desire not to hurt or offend them, in fact it is the opposite, we are really self-absorbed, worried about ourselves and how others perceive us. Boldness, on the other hand, is outer-directed, and often makes people feel more at ease, since it is less self-conscious and less repressed. This can be seen most clearly in seduction. All great seducers succeed through effrontery. Casanova's boldness was not revealed in a daring approach to the woman he desired, or in intrepid words to flatter her, it consisted in his ability to surrender himself to her completely and to make her believe he would do anything for her, even risk his life, which in fact he sometimes did. The woman on whom he lavished this attention understood that he held nothing back from her. This was infinitely more flattering than compliments. At no point during the seduction would he show hesitation or doubt, simply because he never felt it. How to be victorious in love but with those who have made an impression upon your heart, I have noticed that you are timid. This quality might affect a bourgeois, but you must attack the heart of a woman of the world with other weapons. I tell you on behalf of women, there is not one of us who does not prefer a little rough handling to too much consideration. Men lose through blundering more hearts than virtue saves. The more timidity a lover shows with us the more it concerns our pride to goad him on, the more respect he has for our resistance, the more respect we demand of him. We would willingly say to you men, ah, in pity's name do not suppose us to be so very virtuous, you are forcing us to have too much of it. We are continually struggling to hide the fact that we have permitted ourselves to be loved. Put a woman in a position to say that she has yielded only to a species of violence, or to surprise, persuade her that you do not undervalue her, and I will answer for her heart. A little more boldness on your part would put you both at your ease. Do you remember what M. de la Rochefoucauld told you lately, a reasonable man in love may act like a madman, but he should not and cannot act like an idiot. Life, Letters, and Epicurean Philosophy of Ninon de Lanclo, Ninon de Lanclo, 1620-1705. Part of the charm of being seduced is that it makes us feel engulfed, temporarily outside of ourselves and the usual doubts that permeate our lives. The moment the seducer hesitates, the charm is broken, because we become aware of the process, of their deliberate effort to seduce us, of their self-consciousness. Boldness directs attention outward and keeps the illusion alive. It never induces awkwardness or embarrassment. And so we admire the bold, and prefer to be around them, because their self-confidence infects us and draws us outside our own realm of inwardness and reflection. Few are born bold. Even Napoleon had to cultivate the habit on the battlefield, where he knew it was a matter of life and death. In social settings he was awkward and timid, but he overcame this and practiced boldness in every part of his life because he saw its tremendous power, how it could literally enlarge a man, even one who, like Napoleon, was in fact conspicuously small. We also see this change in Ivan the Terrible, a harmless boy suddenly transforms himself into a powerful young man who commands authority, simply by pointing a finger and taking bold action. You must practice and develop your boldness. You will often find uses for it. The best place to begin is often the delicate world of negotiation, particularly those discussions in which you are asked to set your own price. How often we put ourselves down by asking for too little. When Christopher Columbus proposed that the Spanish court finance his voyage to the Americas, he also made the insanely bold demand that he be called Grand Admiral of the Ocean. The court agreed. The price he set was the price he received, 
he demanded to be treated with respect, and so he was. Henry Kissinger too knew that in negotiation, bold demands work better than starting off with piecemeal concessions and trying to meet the other person halfway. Set your value high, and then, as Count Lustig did, set it higher. Understand, if boldness is not natural, neither is timidity. It is an acquired habit, picked up out of a desire to avoid conflict. If timidity has taken hold of you, then, root it out. Your fears of the consequences of a bold action are way out of proportion to reality, and in fact the consequences of timidity are worse. Your value is lowered and you create a self-fulfilling cycle of doubt and disaster. Remember, the problems created by an audacious move can be disguised, even remedied, by more and greater audacity. Image, the lion and the hare. The lion creates no gaps in his way, his movements are too swift, his jaws too quick and powerful. The timid hare will do anything to escape danger, but in its haste to retreat and flee, it backs into traps, hops smack into its enemy's jaws. Authority, I certainly think that it is better to be impetuous than cautious, for fortune is a woman, and it is necessary, if you wish to master her, to conquer her by force, and it can be seen that she lets herself be overcome by the bold rather than by those who proceed coldly. And therefore, like a woman, she is always a friend to the young, because they are less cautious, fiercer, and master her with greater audacity. Niccolo Machiavelli, 1469-1527 Reversal boldness should never be the strategy behind all of your actions. It is a tactical instrument, to be used at the right moment. Plan and think ahead. And make the final element the bold move that will bring you success. In other words, since boldness is a learned response, it is also one that you learn to control and utilize at will. To go through life armed only with audacity would be tiring and also fatal. You would offend too many people, as is proven by those who cannot control their boldness. One such person was Lola Montes, her audacity brought her triumphs and led to her seduction of the King of Bavaria. But since she could never reign in her boldness, it also led to her downfall, in Bavaria, in England, wherever she turned. It crossed the border between boldness and the appearance of cruelty, even insanity. Ivan the Terrible suffered the same fate. When the power of boldness brought him success, he stuck to it, to the point where it became a lifelong pattern of violence and sadism. He lost the ability to tell when boldness was appropriate and when it was not. Timidity has no place in the realm of power, you will often benefit. However, by being able to feign it. At that point, of course, it is no longer timidity but an offensive weapon, you are luring people in with your show of shyness all the better to pounce on them boldly later. Law 29 Plan all the way to the end. Judgment the ending is everything. Plan all the way to it, taking into account all the possible consequences, obstacles, and twists of fortune that might reverse your hard work and give the glory to others. By planning to the end you will not be overwhelmed by circumstances and you will know when to stop. Gently guide fortune and help determine the future by thinking far ahead. Transgression of the law in 1510 A ship set out from the island of Hispaniola, now Haiti and the Dominican Republic, for Venezuela, where it was to rescue a besieged Spanish colony. Several miles out of port, a stowaway climbed out of a provision chest, Vasco Nunez de Balboa, a noble Spaniard who had come to the New World in search of gold but had fallen into debt and had escaped his creditors by hiding in the chest. There are very few men, and they are the exceptions, who are able to think and feel beyond the present moment. Karl von Clausewitz, 1780-1831 Balboa had been obsessed with gold ever since Columbus had returned to Spain from his voyages with tales of a fabulous but as yet undiscovered kingdom called El Dorado. Balboa was one of the first adventurers to come in search of Columbus's land of gold, and he had decided from the beginning that he would be the one to find it, through sheer audacity and single-mindedness. Now that he was free of his creditors, nothing would stop him. 
The two frogs two frogs dwelt in the same pool. The pool being dried up under the summer's heat, they left it, and set out together to seek another home. As they went along they chanced to pass a deep well, amply supplied with water, on seeing which one of the frogs said to the other, let us descend and make our abode in this well, it will furnish us with shelter and food. The other replied with greater caution, but suppose the water should fail us, how can we get out again from so great a depth? Do nothing without a regard to the consequences. Fables, Aesop, 6th century BC Unfortunately the ship's owner, a wealthy jurist named Francisco Fernandez de Enciso, was furious when told of the stowaway, and he ordered that Balboa be left on the first island they came across. Before they found any island, however, Enciso received news that the colony he was to rescue had been abandoned. This was Balboa's chance. He told the sailors of his previous voyages to Panama, and of the rumors he had heard of gold. In the area. The excited sailors convinced Enciso to spare Balboa's life, and to establish a colony in Panama. Weeks later they named their new settlement Darien. Darien's first governor was Enciso, but Balboa was not a man to let others steal the initiative. He campaigned against Enciso among the sailors, who eventually made it clear that they preferred him as governor. Enciso fled to Spain, fearing for his life. Months later, when a representative of the Spanish crown arrived to establish himself as the new, official governor of Darien, he was turned away. On his return voyage to Spain, this man drowned, the drowning was accidental, but under Spanish law, Balboa had murdered the governor and usurped his position. Balboa's bravado had got him out of scrapes before, but now his hopes of wealth and glory seemed doomed. To lay claim to El Dorado, should he discover it, he would need the approval of the Spanish king, which, as an outlaw, he would never receive. There was only one solution. Panamanian. Indians had told Balboa of a vast ocean on the other side of the Central American Isthmus, and had said that by traveling south upon this western coast, he would reach a fabulous land of gold, called by a name that to his ears sounded like, Bairu. Balboa decided he would cross the treacherous jungles of Panama and become the first European to bathe his feet in this new ocean. From there he would march on El Dorado. If he did this on Spain's behalf, he would obtain the eternal gratitude of the king, and would secure his own reprieve, only he had to act before Spanish authorities came to arrest him. In 1513, then, Balboa set out, with 190 soldiers. Halfway across the isthmus, some 90 miles wide at that point, only 60 soldiers remained, many having succumbed to the harsh conditions, the blood-sucking insects, the torrential rainfall, fever. Finally, from a mountaintop, Balboa became the first European to lay eyes on the Pacific Ocean. Days Later he marched in his armor into its waters, bearing the banner of Castile and claiming all its seas, lands, and islands in the name of the Spanish throne. Look to the end, no matter what it is you are considering. Often enough, God gives a man a glimpse of happiness, and then utterly ruins him. The Histories, Herodotus, 5th century BC Indians from the area greeted Balboa with gold, jewels, and precious pearls, the like of which he had never seen. When he asked where these had come from, the Indians pointed south, to the land of the Incas. But Balboa had only a few soldiers left. For the moment, he decided, he should return to Darien, send the jewels and gold to Spain as a token of goodwill, and ask for a large army to aid him in the conquest of El Dorado. When news reached Spain of Balboa's bold crossing of the Isthmus, his discovery of the Western Ocean, and his planned conquest of El Dorado, the former criminal became a hero. He was instantly proclaimed governor of the new land. But before the king and queen received word of his discovery, they had already sent a dozen ships, under the command of a man named Pedro Arias de Vila, Pedrarius, with orders to arrest Balboa for murder and to take command of the colony. By the time Pedrarius arrived in Panama, he had learned that Balboa had been pardoned, and that he was to 
share the governorship with the former outlaw. The king, the Sufi, and the surgeon in ancient times a king of Tartary was out walking with some of his noblemen. At the roadside was an Abdul, a wandering Sufi, who cried out, Whoever will give me a hundred dinars, I will give him some good advice. The king stopped, and said, Abdul, what is this good advice for a hundred dinars? Sir, answered the Abdul, order the sum to be given to me, and I will tell it you immediately. The king did so, expecting to hear something extraordinary. The dervish said to him, My advice is this, never begin anything until you have reflected what will be the end of it. At this the nobles and everyone else present laughed, saying that the Abdul had been wise to ask for his money in advance. But the king said, You have no reason to laugh at the good advice this Abdul has given me. No one is unaware of the fact that we should think well before doing anything. But we are daily guilty of not remembering, and the consequences are evil. I very much value this dervish's advice. The king decided to bear the advice always in his mind, and commanded it to be written in gold on the walls and even engraved on his silver plate. Not long afterward a plotter desired to kill the king. He bribed the royal surgeon with a promise of the prime ministership if he thrust a poisoned lancet into the king's arm. When the time came to let some of the king's blood, a silver basin was placed to catch the blood. Suddenly the surgeon became aware of the words engraved upon it, never begin anything until you have reflected what will be the end of it. It was only then that he realized that if the plotter became king he could have the surgeon killed instantly, and would not need to fulfill his bargain. The king, seeing that the surgeon was now trembling, asked him what was wrong with him. And so he confessed the truth, at that very moment. The plotter was seized, and the king sent for all the people who had been present when the Abdul gave his advice, and said to them, Do you still laugh at the dervish? Caravan of Dreams, Idris Shah, 1968 All the same, Balboa felt uneasy. Gold was his dream, El Dorado his. Only desire. In pursuit of this goal he had nearly died many times over, and to share the wealth and glory with a newcomer would be intolerable. He also soon discovered that Pedrarias was a jealous, bitter man, and equally unhappy with the situation. Once again, the only solution for Balboa was to seize the initiative by proposing to cross the jungle with a larger army, carrying shipbuilding materials and tools. Once on the Pacific coast, he would create an armada with which to conquer the Incas. Surprisingly enough, Pedrarias agreed to the plan, perhaps sensing it would never work. Hundreds died in this second march through the jungle, and the timber they carried rotted in the torrential rains. Balboa, as usual, was undaunted, no. Power in the world could thwart his plan, and on arriving at the Pacific he began to cut down trees for new lumber. But the men remaining to him were too few and too weak to mount an invasion, and once again Balboa had to return to Darien. Pedrarias had in any case invited Balboa back to discuss a new plan, and on the outskirts of the settlement, the explorer was met by Francisco Pizarro, an old friend who had accompanied him on his first crossing of the Isthmus. But this was a trap, leading 100 soldiers, Pizarro surrounded his former friend, arrested him, and returned him to Pedrarias, who tried him on charges of rebellion. A few days later Balboa's head fell into a basket, along with those of his most trusted followers. Years later Pizarro himself reached Peru, and Balboa's deeds were forgotten. Interpretation Most men are ruled by the heart, not the head. Their plans are vague, and when they meet obstacles they improvise. But improvisation will only bring you as far as the next crisis, and is never a substitute for thinking several steps ahead and planning to the end. Balboa had a dream of glory and wealth, and a vague plan to reach it. Yet his bold deeds, and his discovery of the Pacific, are largely forgotten, for he committed what in the world of power is the ultimate sin, he went part way, 
leaving the door open for others to take over. A real man of power would have had the prudence to see the dangers in the distance, the rivals who would want to share in the conquests, the vultures that would hover once they heard the word gold. Balboa should have kept his knowledge of the Incas secret until after he had conquered Peru. Only then would his wealth, and his head, have been secure. Once Pedrarias arrived on the scene, a man of power and prudence would have schemed to kill or imprison him, and to take over the army he had brought for the conquest of Peru. But Balboa was locked in the moment, always reacting emotionally, never thinking ahead. What good is it to have the greatest dream in the world if others reap the benefits and the glory? Never lose your head over a vague, open-ended dream, plan to the end. Observance of the law In 1863 the Prussian premier Otto von Bismarck surveyed the chessboard of European power as it then stood. The main players were England, France, and Austria. Prussia itself was one of several states in the loosely allied German Federation. Austria, dominant member of the Federation, made sure that the other German states remained weak, divided and submissive. Bismarck believed that Prussia was destined for something far greater than servant boy to Austria. This is how Bismarck played the game. His first move was to start a war with lowly Denmark, in order to recover the former Prussian lands of Schleswig-Holstein. He knew that these rumblings of Prussian independence might worry France and England, so he enlisted Austria in the war, claiming that he was recovering Schleswig-Holstein for their benefit. In a few months, after the war was decided, Bismarck demanded that the newly conquered lands be made part of Prussia. The Austrians of course were furious, but they compromised, first they agreed to give the Prussian Schleswig, and a year later they sold them Holstein. The world began to see that Austria was weakening and that Prussia was on the rise. Bismarck's next move was his boldest. In 1866 he convinced King William of Prussia to withdraw from the German Federation, and in doing so to go to war with Austria itself. King William's wife, his son the Crown Prince, and the princes of the other German kingdoms vehemently opposed such a war. But Bismarck, undaunted, succeeded in forcing the conflict, and Prussia's superior army defeated the Austrians in the brutally short Seven Weeks War. The king and the Prussian generals then wanted to march on Vienna, taking as much land from Austria as possible. But Bismarck stopped them, now he presented himself as on the side of peace. The result was that he was able to conclude a treaty with Austria that granted Prussia and the other German states total autonomy. Bismarck could now position Prussia as the dominant power in Germany and the head of a newly formed North German Confederation. He who asks fortune tellers the future unwittingly forfeits an inner intimation of coming events that is a thousand times more exact than anything they may say. Walter Benjamin, 1892-1940 The French and the English began to compare Bismarck to Attila the Hun, and to fear that he had designs on all of Europe. Once he had started on the path to conquest, there was no telling where he would stop. And, indeed, Three years later Bismarck provoked a war with France. First he appeared to give his permission to France's annexation of Belgium, then at the last moment he changed his mind. Playing a cat-and-mouse game, he infuriated the French emperor, Napoleon III, and stirred up his own king against the French. To no one's surprise, war broke out in 1870. The newly formed German Federation enthusiastically joined in the war on France, and once again the Prussian military machine and its allies destroyed the enemy army in a matter of months. Although Bismarck opposed taking any French land, the generals convinced him that Alsace-Lorraine would become part of the Federation. Now all of Europe feared the next move of the Prussian monster, led by Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor. And in fact a year later Bismarck founded the German Empire, with the Prussian king as the newly crowned emperor and Bismarck himself a prince. But then something strange happened, Bismarck instigated no more wars. And while the other European powers grabbed up land for colonies in other continents, he severely limited Germany's colonial acquisitions. He did not want more land for Germany, 
but more security. For the rest of his life he struggled to maintain peace in Europe and to prevent further wars. Everybody assumed he had changed, mellowing with the years. They had failed to understand, this was the final move of his original plan. Interpretation There is a simple reason why most men never know when to come off the attack, they form no concrete idea of their goal. Once they achieve victory they only hunger for more. To stop, to aim for a goal and then keep to it, seems almost inhuman, in fact, yet nothing is more critical to their maintenance of power. The person who goes too far in his triumphs creates a reaction that inevitably leads to a decline. The only solution is to plan for the long run. Foresee the future with as much clarity as the gods on Mount Olympus, who look through the clouds and see the ends of all things. From the beginning of his career in politics, Bismarck had one goal, to form an independent German state led by Prussia. He instigated the war with Denmark not to conquer territory but to stir up Prussian nationalism and unite the country. He incited the war with Austria only to gain Prussian independence. This was why he refused to grab Austrian territory. And he fomented the war with France to unite the German kingdoms against a common enemy, and thus to prepare for the formation of a united Germany. Once this was achieved, Bismarck stopped. He never let triumph go to his head, was never tempted by the siren call of more. He held the reins. Tightly, and whenever the generals, or the king, or the Prussian people demanded new conquests, he held them back. Nothing would spoil the beauty of his creation, certainly not a false euphoria that pushed those around him to attempt to go past the end that he had so carefully planned. Experience shows that, if one foresees from far away the designs to be undertaken, one can act with speed when the moment comes to execute them. Cardinal Richelieu, 1585-1642 Keys to power According to the cosmology of the ancient Greeks, the gods were thought to have complete vision into the future. They saw everything to come, right down to the intricate details. Men, on the other hand, were seen as victims of fate, trapped in the moment in their emotions, unable to see beyond immediate dangers. Those heroes, such as Odysseus, who were able to look beyond the present and plan several steps ahead, seemed to defy fate, to approximate the gods in their ability to determine the future. The comparison is still valid, those among us who think further ahead and patiently bring their plans to fruition seem to have a godlike power. Because most people are too imprisoned in the moment to plan with this kind of foresight, the ability to ignore immediate dangers and pleasures. Translates into power. It is the power of being able to overcome the natural human tendency to react to things as they happen, and instead to train oneself to step back, imagining the larger things taking shape beyond one's immediate vision. Most people believe that they are in fact aware of the future, that they are planning and thinking ahead. They are usually deluded, what they are really doing is succumbing to their desires, to what they want the future to be. Their plans are vague, based on their imaginations rather than their reality. They may believe they are thinking all the way to the end, but they are really only focusing on the happy ending, and deluding themselves by the strength of their desire. In 415 BC, the ancient Athenians attacked Sicily, believing their expedition would bring them riches, power, and a glorious ending to the 16-year Peloponnesian War. They did not consider the dangers of an invasion so far from home, they did not foresee that the Sicilians would fight all the harder since the battles were in their own homeland, or that all of Athens's enemies would band together against them, or that war would break out on several fronts, stretching their forces way too thin. The Sicilian expedition was a complete disaster, leading to the destruction of one of the greatest civilizations of all time. The Athenians were led into this disaster by their hearts, not their minds. They saw only the chance of glory, not the dangers that loomed in the distance. Cardinal de Retz, the 17th century Frenchman who prided himself on his insights into human schemes and why they mostly fail, analyzed this phenomenon. In the course of a rebellion he spearheaded against the French monarchy in 1651, the young king, Louis XIV, 
and his court had suddenly left Paris and established themselves in a palace outside the capital. The presence of the king so close to the heart of the revolution had been a tremendous burden on the revolutionaries, and they breathed a sigh of relief. This later proved their downfall, however, since the court's absence from Paris gave it much more room to maneuver. The most ordinary cause of people's mistakes, Cardinal de Retz later wrote, is their being too much frightened at the present danger, and not enough so at that which is remote. The dangers that are remote, that loom in the distance, if we can see them as they take shape, how many mistakes we avoid. How many plans we would instantly abort if we realized we were avoiding a small danger only to step into a larger one. So much of power is not what you do but what you do not do, the rash and foolish actions that you refrain from before they get you into trouble. Plan in detail before you act, do not let vague plans lead you into trouble. Will this have unintended consequences? Will I stir up new enemies? Will someone else take advantage of my labors? Unhappy endings are much more common than happy ones, do not be swayed by the happy ending in your mind. The French elections of 1848 came down to a struggle between Louis Adolphe Thiers, the man of order, and General Louis Eugene Cavaignac, the rabble rouser of the right. When Thiers realized he was hopelessly behind in this high stakes race, he searched desperately for a solution. His I fell on Louis Bonaparte, grand nephew of the great General Napoleon, and a lowly deputy in the parliament. This Bonaparte seemed a bit of an imbecile, but his name alone could get him elected in a country yearning for a strong ruler. He would be Thiers' puppet and eventually would be pushed off stage. The first part of the plan worked to perfection, and Napoleon was elected by a large margin. The problem was that Thiers had not foreseen one simple fact, this imbecile was in fact a man of enormous ambition. Three years later he dissolved parliament, declared himself emperor, and ruled France for another 18 years, much to the horror of Thiers and his party. The ending is everything. It is the end of the action that determines who gets the glory, the money, the prize. Your conclusion must be crystal clear, and you must keep it constantly in mind. You must also figure out how to ward off the vultures circling overhead, trying to live off the carcass of your creation. And you must anticipate the many possible crises that will tempt you to improvise. Bismarck overcame these dangers because he planned to. The end, kept on course through every crisis, and never let others steal the glory. Once he had reached his stated goal, he withdrew into his shell like a turtle. This kind of self-control is godlike. When you see several steps ahead, and plan your moves all the way to the end, you will no longer be tempted by emotion or by the desire to improvise. Your clarity will rid you of the anxiety and vagueness that are the primary reasons why so many fail to conclude their actions successfully. You see the ending and you tolerate no deviation. Image, the gods on Mount Olympus. Looking down on human actions from the clouds, they see in advance the endings of all the great dreams that lead to disaster and tragedy. And they laugh at our inability to see beyond the moment, and at how we delude ourselves. Authority, how much easier it is never to get in than to get yourself out. We should act contrary to the reed which, when it first appears, throws up a long straight stem but afterwards, as though it were exhausted, makes several dense knots, indicating that it no longer has its original vigor and drive. We must rather begin gently and coolly, saving our breath for the encounter and our vigorous thrusts for finishing off the job. In their beginnings it is we who guide affairs and hold them in our power, but so often once they are set in motion, it is they which guide us and sweep us along. Montaigne, 1533-1592 Reversal It is a cliché among strategists that your plan must include alternatives and have a degree of flexibility. That is certainly true. If you are locked into a plan too rigidly, you will be unable to deal with sudden shifts of fortune. Once you have examined the future possibilities and decided on your target, you must build in alternatives and be open to new routes toward your goal. 
Most people, however, lose less from overplanning and rigidity than from vagueness and a tendency to improvise constantly in the face of circumstance. There is no real purpose in contemplating a reversal to this law, then, for no good can come from refusing to think far into the future and planning to the end. If you are clear and far-thinking enough, you will understand that the future is uncertain, and that you must be open to. Adaptation Only having a clear objective and a far-reaching plan allows you That freedom Law 30 Make your accomplishments seem Effortless Judgment your actions must seem natural and executed with ease. All the toil and practice that go into them, and also all the clever tricks, must be concealed. When you act, act effortlessly, as if you could do much more. Avoid the temptation of revealing how hard you work, it only raises questions. Teach no one your tricks or they will be used against you. Observance of the law I the Japanese tea ceremony called Chanoyu, hot water for tea, has origins in ancient times, but it reached its peak of refinement in the 16th century under its most renowned practitioner, Sen no Rikyu. Although not from a noble family, Rikyu rose to great power, becoming the preferred tea master of the Emperor Hideyoshi, and an important advisor on aesthetic and even political matters. For Rikyu, the secret of success consisted in appearing natural, concealing the effort behind one's work. Kano Tanyu Master artist Date Masamune once sent for Tanyu to decorate a pair of gold screens seven feet high. The artist said he thought black and white sketches would suit them, and went home again after considering them carefully. The next morning he came early and made a large quantity of ink into which he dipped a horseshoe he had brought with him, and then proceeded to make impressions of this all over one of the screens. Then, with a large brush, he drew a number of lines across them. Meanwhile Massimian had come in to watch his work, and at this he could contain his irritation no longer, and muttering, what a beastly mess, he strode away to his own apartments. The retainers told Tanyu he was in a very bad temper indeed. He shouldn't look on while I am at work, then, replied the painter, he should wait till it is finished. Then he took up a smaller brush and dashed in touches here and there, and as he did so the prince of. The horseshoe turned into crabs, while the big broad strokes became rushes. He then turned to the other screen and splashed drops of ink all over it, and when he had added a few brush strokes here and there they became a flight of swallows over willow trees. When Massimian saw the finished work he was as overjoyed at the artist's skill as he had previously been annoyed at the apparent mess he was making of the screens. Siten Owayu the Japanese Tea Ceremony A. L. Sadler, 1962 One day Rikyu and his son went to an acquaintance's house for a tea ceremony. On the way in, the son remarked that the lovely antique-looking gate at their host's house gave it an evocatively lonely appearance. I don't think so, replied his father, it looks as though it had been brought from some mountain temple a long way off, and as if the labor required to import it must have cost a lot of money. If the owner of the house had put this much effort into one gate, it would show in his tea ceremony, and indeed Sin no Rikyu had to leave the ceremony early, unable to endure the affectation and effort it inadvertently revealed. On another evening, while having tea at a friend's house, Rikyu saw his host go outside, hold up a lantern in the darkness, cut a lemon off a tree, and bring it in. This charmed Rikyu, the host needed a relish for the dish he was serving, and had spontaneously gone outside to get one. But when the man offered the lemon with some Osaka rice cake, Rikyu realized that he had planned the cutting of the lemon all along, to go with this expensive delicacy. The gesture no longer seemed spontaneous, it was a way for the host to prove his cleverness. He had accidentally revealed how hard he was trying. Having seen enough, Rikyu politely declined the cake, excused himself, and left. Emperor Hideyoshi once planned to visit Rikyu for a tea ceremony. On the night before he was to come, snow began to fall. Thinking quickly, Rikyu laid round cushions that fit exactly on each of the stepping stones that led through the garden to his house. Just before dawn, he rose, saw that. It had stopped snowing, 
and carefully removed the cushions. When Hideyoshi arrived, he marveled at the simple beauty of the sight, the perfectly round stepping stones, unencumbered by snow, and noticed how it called no attention to the manner in which Rikyu had accomplished it, but only to the polite gesture itself. After Sen no Rikyu died, his ideas had a profound influence on the practice of the tea ceremony. The Tokugawa Shogun Yorinobu, son of the great Emperor Ayasu, was a student of Rikyu's teachings. In his garden he had a stone lantern made by a famous master, and Lord Sakai Tadakatsu asked if he could come by one day to see it. Yorinobu replied that he would be honored, and commanded his gardeners to put everything in order for the visit. These gardeners, unfamiliar with the precepts of Chanoyu, thought the stone lantern misshapen, its windows being too small for the present taste. They had a local workman enlarge the windows. A few days before Lord Sakai's visit, Yorinobu toured the garden. When he saw the altered windows he exploded with rage, ready to impale on his sword the fool who had ruined the lantern, upsetting its natural grace and destroying the whole purpose of Lord Sakai's visit. When Yorinobu calmed down, however, he remembered that he had originally bought two of the lanterns, and that the second was in his garden on the island of Kishu. At great expense, he hired a whale boat and the finest rowers he could find, ordering them to bring the lantern to him within two days, a difficult feat at best. But the sailors rowed day and night, and with the luck of a good wind they arrived just in time. To Yorinobu's delight, this stone lantern was more magnificent than the first, for it had stood untouched for twenty years in a bamboo thicket, acquiring a brilliant antique appearance and a delicate covering of moss. When Lord Sakai arrived, later that same day, he was awed by the lantern, which was more magnificent than he had imagined, so graceful and at one with the elements. Fortunately he had no idea what time and effort it had cost Yorinobu to create this sublime effect. The wrestling master There was once a wrestling master who was versed in 360 feints and holds. He took a special liking to one of his pupils, to whom he taught 359 of them over a period of time. Somehow he never got around to the last trick. As months went by the young man became so proficient in the art that he bested everyone who dared to face him in the ring. He was so proud of his prowess that one day he boasted before the sultan that he could readily whip his master, were it not out of respect for his age and gratitude for his tutelage. The sultan became incensed at this irreverence and ordered an immediate match with the royal court in attendance. At the gong the youth barged forward with a lusty yell, only to be confronted with the unfamiliar 360th feint. The master seized his former pupil, lifted him high above his head, and flung him crashing to the ground. The sultan and the assembly let out a loud cheer. When the sultan asked the master how he was able to overcome such a strong opponent, the master confessed that he had reserved a secret technique for himself for just such a contingency. Then he related the lamentation of a master of archery, who taught everything he knew. No one has learned archery from me, the poor fellow complained, who has not tried to use me as a butt in the end. A story of Sadi, as told in The Craft of Power, R. G. H. Siu, 1979. Interpretation to Sen no Rikyu, the sudden appearance of something naturally, almost accidentally graceful was the height of beauty. This beauty came without warning and seemed effortless. Nature created such things by its own laws and processes, but men had to create their effects through labor and contrivance. And when they showed the effort of producing the effect, the effect was spoiled. The gate came from too far away, the cutting of the lemon looked contrived. You will often have to use tricks and ingenuity to create your effects, the cushions in the snow, the men rowing all night but your audience must never suspect the work or the thinking that has gone into them. Nature does not reveal its tricks, and what imitates nature by appearing effortless approximates nature's power. Observance of the law to the great escape artist Harry Houdini once advertised his act as, the impossible possible. 
And indeed those who witnessed his dramatic escapes felt that what he did on stage contradicted common sense ideas of human capacity. One evening in 1904, an audience of 4,000 Londoners filled a theatre to watch Houdini accept a challenge, to escape from a pair of manacles billed as the strongest ever invented. They contained six sets of locks and nine tumblers in each cuff, a Birmingham maker had spent five years constructing them. Experts who examined them said they had never seen anything so intricate, and this intricacy was thought to make them impossible to escape. The crowd watched the experts secure the manacles on Houdini's wrists. Then the escape artist entered a black cabinet on stage. The minutes went by, the more time passed, the more certain it seemed that these manacles would be the first to defeat him. At one point he emerged from the cabinet and asked that the cuffs be temporarily removed so that he could take off his coat, it was hot inside. The challengers refused, suspecting his request was a trick to find out how the locks worked. Undeterred, and without using his hands, Houdini managed to lift the coat over his shoulders, turn it inside out, remove a penknife from his vest pocket with his teeth, and, by moving his head, cut the coat off his arms. Freed from the coat, he stepped back into the cabinet, the audience roaring with approval at his grace and dexterity. Finally, having kept the audience waiting long enough, Houdini emerged from the cabinet a second time, now with his hands free, the manacles raised high in triumph. To this day no one knows how he managed the escape. Although he had taken close to an hour to free himself, he had never looked concerned, had shown no sign of doubt. Indeed it seemed by the end that he had drawn out the escape as a way to heighten the drama, to make the audience worry, for there was no other sign that the performance had been anything but easy. The complaint about the heat was equally part of the act. The spectators of this and other Houdini performances must have felt he was toying with them, these manacles are nothing, he seemed to say, I could have freed myself a lot sooner, and from a lot worse. Over the years, Houdini escaped from the chained carcass of an embalmed sea monster, a half-octopus, half-whale-like beast that had beached near Boston, he had himself sealed inside an enormous envelope from which he emerged without breaking the paper, he passed through brick walls, he wriggled free from straitjackets while dangling high in the air, he leaped from bridges into icy waters, his hands manacled and his legs in chains, he had himself submerged in glass cases full of water, hands padlocked, while the audience watched in amazement as he worked himself free, struggling for close to an hour apparently without breathing. Each time he seemed to court certain death yet survived with superhuman aplomb. Meanwhile, he said nothing about his methods, gave no clues as to how he accomplished any of his tricks, he left his audiences and critics speculating, his power and reputation enhanced by their struggles with the inexplicable. Perhaps the most baffling trick of all was making a 10,000-pound elephant disappear before an audience's eyes, a feat he repeated on stage for over 19 weeks. No one has ever really explained how he did this, for in the auditorium where he performed the trick, there was simply nowhere for an elephant to hide. The effortlessness of Houdini's escapes led some to think he used occult forces, his superior psychic abilities giving him special control over his body. But a German escape artist named Clopini claimed to know Houdini's secret, he simply used elaborate gadgets. Clopini also claimed to have defeated Houdini in a handcuff challenge in Holland. Houdini did not mind all kinds of speculation floating around about his methods, but he would not tolerate an outright lie, and in 1902 he challenged Clopini to a handcuff duel. Clopini accepted. Through a spy, he found out the secret word to unlock a pair of French combination lock cuffs that Houdini liked to use. His plan was to choose these cuffs to escape from on stage. This would definitively debunk Houdini, his genius simply lay in his use of mechanical gadgets. On the night of the challenge, just as Clopini had planned, Houdini offered him a choice of cuffs and he selected the ones with the combination lock. He was even able to disappear with them behind a screen to make a quick test, and re-emerged seconds later, confident of victory. Acting as if he sensed fraud, 
Houdini refused to lock Clopini in the cuffs. The two men argued and began to fight, even wrestling with each other on stage. After a few minutes of this, and apparently angry, frustrated Houdini gave up and locked Clopini in the cuffs. For the next few minutes Clopini strained to get free. Something was wrong, minutes earlier he had opened the cuffs behind the screen, now the same code no longer worked. He sweated, racking his brains. Hours went by, the audience left, and finally an exhausted and humiliated Clopini gave up and asked to be released. The cuffs that Clopini himself had opened behind the screen with the word CLEFS, French for keys, now clicked open only with the word FRAUD. Clopini never figured out how Houdini had accomplished this uncanny feat. Keep the extent of your abilities unknown. The wise man does not allow his knowledge and abilities to be sounded to the bottom, if he desires to be honored by all. He allows you to know them but not to comprehend them. No one must know the extent of his abilities, lest he be disappointed. No one ever has an opportunity of fathoming him entirely. For guesses and doubts about the extent of his talents arouse more veneration than accurate knowledge of them, be they ever so great. Baltasar Gratian, 1601-1658 Interpretation Although we do not know for certain how Houdini accomplished many of his most ingenious escapes, one thing is clear, it was not the occult, or any kind of magic, that gave him his powers, but hard work and endless practice, all of which he carefully concealed from the world. Houdini never left anything to chance, day and night he studied the workings of locks, researched centuries-old sleight-of-hand tricks, pored over books on mechanics, whatever he could use. Every moment not spent researching he spent working his body, keeping himself exceptionally limber, and learning how to control his muscles and his breathing. Early on in Houdini's career, an old Japanese performer whom he toured with taught him an ancient trick, how to swallow an ivory ball, then bring it back up. He practiced this endlessly with a small peeled potato tied to a string, up and down he would manipulate the potato with his throat. Muscles, until they were strong enough to move it without the string. The Organizers of the London Handcuff Challenge had searched Houdini's body thoroughly beforehand, but no one could check the inside of his throat, where he could have concealed small tools to help him escape. Even so, Clopini was fundamentally wrong, it was not Houdini's tools but his practice, work, and research that made his escapes possible. Clopini, in fact, was completely outwitted by Houdini, who set the whole thing up. He let his opponent learn the code to the French cuffs, then baited him into choosing those cuffs on stage. Then, during the two men's tussle, the dexterous Houdini was able to change the code to FRAUD. He had spent weeks practicing this trick, but the audience saw none of the sweat and toil behind the scenes. Nor was Houdini ever nervous, he induced nervousness in others. He deliberately dragged out the time it would take to escape, as a way of heightening the drama, and making the audience squirm. His escapes from death, always graceful and easy, made him look like a superman. As a person of power, you must research and practice endlessly before appearing in public, on stage or anywhere else. Never expose the sweat and labor behind your poise. Some think such exposure will demonstrate their diligence and honesty, but it actually just makes them look weaker, as if anyone who practiced and worked at it could do what they had done, or as if they weren't really up to the job. Keep your effort and your tricks to yourself and you seem to have the grace and ease of a god. One never sees the source of a god's power revealed, one only sees its effects. A line, of poetry, will take us hours maybe, yet if it does not seem a moment's thought, our stitching and unstitching has been naught. Adam's Curse, William Butler Yeats, 1865-1939 Key's two power humanity's first notions of power came from primitive encounters with nature, the flash of lightning in the sky, a sudden flood, the speed and ferocity of a wild animal. These forces required no thinking, no planning, they awed us by their sudden appearance, their gracefulness, and their power over life and death. 
and this remains the kind of power we have always wanted to imitate. Through science and technology we have recreated the speed and sublime power of nature, but something is missing, our machines are noisy and jerky, they reveal their effort. Even the very best creations of technology cannot root out our admiration for things that move easily and effortlessly. The power of children to bend us to their will comes from a kind of seductive charm that we feel in the presence of a creature less reflective and more graceful than we are. We cannot return to such a state, but if we can create the appearance of this kind of ease, we elicit in others the kind of primitive awe that nature has always evoked in who mankind. One of the first European writers to expound on this principle came from that most unnatural of environments, the Renaissance court. In the Book of the Courtier, published in 1528, Baldassare Castiglione describes the highly elaborate and codified manners of the perfect court citizen. And yet, Castiglione explains, the courtier must execute these gestures with what he calls sprezzatura, the capacity to make the difficult seem easy. He urges the courtier to practice in all things a certain nonchalance which conceals all artistry and makes whatever one says or does seem uncontrived and effortless. We all admire the achievement of some unusual feat, but if it is accomplished naturally and gracefully, our admiration increases tenfold, whereas, to labor at what one is doing and, to make bones over it, shows an extreme lack of grace and causes everything, whatever it's worth, to be discounted. Much of the idea of sprezzatura came from the world of art. All the great Renaissance artists carefully kept their works under wraps. Only the finished masterpiece could be shown to the public. Michelangelo forbade even popes to view his work in process. A Renaissance artist was always careful to keep his studios shut to patrons and public alike, not out of fear of imitation, but because to see the making of the works would mar the magic of their effect, and their studied atmosphere of ease and natural beauty. The Renaissance painter Vasari, also the first great art critic, ridiculed the work of Paolo Uccello, who was obsessed with the laws of perspective. The effort Uccello spent on improving the appearance of perspective was too obvious in his work, it made his paintings ugly and labored, overwhelmed by the effort of their effects. We have the same response when we watch performers who put too much effort into their act, seeing them trying so hard breaks the illusion. It also makes us uncomfortable. Calm, graceful performers, on the other hand, set us at ease, creating the illusion that they are not acting but being natural in themselves, even when everything they are doing involves labor and practice. The idea of sprezzatura is relevant to all forms of power, for power depends vitally on appearances and the illusions you create. Your public actions are like artworks, they must have visual appeal, must create anticipation, even entertain. When you reveal the inner workings of your creation, you become just one more mortal among others. What is understandable is not awe-inspiring, we tell ourselves we could do as well if we had the money and time. Avoid the temptation of showing how clever you are, it is far more clever to conceal the mechanisms of your cleverness. Talleyrand's application of this concept to his daily life greatly enhanced the aura of power that surrounded him. He never liked to work too hard, so he made others do the work for him, the spying, the research, the detailed analyses. With all this labor at his disposal, he himself never seemed to strain. When his spies revealed that a certain event was about to take place, he would talk in social conversation as if he sensed its imminence. The result was that people thought he was clairvoyant. His short pithy statements and witticisms always seemed to summarize a situation perfectly, but they were based on much research and thought. To those in government, including Napoleon himself, Talleyrand gave the impression of immense power, an effect entirely dependent on the apparent ease with which he accomplished his feats. There is another reason for concealing your shortcuts and tricks, when you let this information out, you give people ideas they can use against you. You lose the advantages of keeping silent. We tend to want the world to know what we have done, we want our vanity gratified by having our hard work and cleverness applauded and we may even want sympathy for the 
hours it has taken to reach our point of artistry. Learn to control this propensity to blab, for its effect is often the opposite of what you expected. Remember, the more mystery surrounds your actions, the more awesome your power seems. You appear to be the only one who can do what you do, and the appearance of having an exclusive gift is immensely powerful. Finally, because you achieve your accomplishments with grace and ease, people believe that you could always do more if you tried harder. This elicits not only admiration but a touch of fear. Your powers are untapped, no one can fathom their limits. Image, the racehorse. From up close we would see the strain, the effort to control the horse, the labored, painful breathing. But from the distance where we sit and watch, it is all gracefulness, flying through the air. Keep others at a distance and they will only see the ease with which you move. Authority, for whatever action, nonchalance, accompanies, no matter how trivial it is, it not only reveals the skill of the person doing it but also very often causes it to be considered far greater than it really is. This is because it makes the onlookers believe that a man who performs well with so much facility must possess even greater skill than he does. Baldassare Castiglione, 1478-1529 Reversal The secrecy with which you surround your actions must seem light-hearted in spirit. A zeal to conceal your work creates an unpleasant, almost paranoiac impression, you are taking the game too seriously. Houdini was careful to make the concealment of his trick seem a game, all part of the show. Never show your work until it is finished, but if you put too much effort into keeping it under wraps you will be like the painter Pontormo, who spent the last years of his life hiding his frescoes from the public eye and only succeeded in driving himself mad. Always keep your sense of humor about yourself. There are also times when revealing the inner workings of your projects can prove worthwhile. It all depends on your audience's taste, and on the times in which you operate. P.T. Barnum recognized that his public wanted to feel involved in his shows, and that understanding his tricks delighted them, partly, perhaps, because implicitly debunking people who kept there. Sources of power hidden from the masses appealed to America's democratic spirit. The public also appreciated the showman's humor and honesty. Barnum took this to the extreme of publicizing his own humbuggery in his popular autobiography, written when his career was at its height. As long as the partial disclosure of tricks and techniques is carefully planned, rather than the result of an uncontrollable need to blab, it is the ultimate in cleverness. It gives the audience the illusion of being superior and involved, even while much of what you do remains concealed from them. Law 31 Control the options, get others to Play with the cards you deal Judgment The best deceptions are the ones that seem to give the other person a choice, your victims feel they are in control, but are actually your puppets. Give people options that come out in your favor whichever one they choose. Force them to make choices between the lesser of two evils, both of which serve your purpose. Put them on the horns of a dilemma, they are gored wherever they turn. Observance of the law I from early in his reign, Ivan IV, later known as Ivan the Terrible, had to confront an unpleasant reality, the country desperately needed reform, but he lacked the power to push it through. The greatest limit to his authority came from the boyars, the Russian princely class that dominated the country and terrorized the peasantry. The German Chancellor Bismarck, enraged at the constant criticisms from Rudolf Firko, the German pathologist and liberal politician, had his seconds call upon the scientist to challenge him to a duel. As the challenged party, I have the choice of weapons, said Firko, and I choose these. He held aloft two large and apparently identical sausages. One of these, he went on, is infected with deadly germs, the other is perfectly sound. Let His Excellency decide which one he wishes to eat, and I will eat the other. Almost immediately the message came back that the Chancellor had decided to cancel the duel. The Little, Brown Book of Anecdotes, Clifton Fadiman, ed., 1985. In 1553, at the age of 23, Ivan fell ill. 
Lying in bed, nearing death, he asked the boyars to swear allegiance to his son as the new czar. Some hesitated, some even refused. Then and there Ivan saw he had no power over the boyars. He recovered from his illness, but he never forgot the lesson, the boyars were out to destroy him. And indeed in the years to come, many of the most powerful of them defected to Russia's main enemies, Poland and Lithuania, where they plotted their return and the overthrow of the Tsar. Even one of Ivan's closest friends, Prince Andrei Kurbsky, suddenly turned against him, defecting to Lithuania in 1564, and becoming the strongest of Ivan's enemies. When Kurbsky began raising troops for an invasion, the royal dynasty seemed suddenly more precarious than ever. With emigre nobles fomenting invasion from the west, Tartars bearing down from the east, and the boyars. Stirring up trouble within the country, Russia's vast size made it a nightmare. To defend. In whatever direction Ivan struck, he would leave himself vulnerable on the other side. Only if he had absolute power could he deal with this many-headed hydra. And he had no such power. Ivan brooded until the morning of December 3, 1564, when the citizens of Moscow awoke to a strange sight. Hundreds of sleds filled the square before the Kremlin, loaded with the Tsar's treasures and with provisions for the entire court. They watched in disbelief as the Tsar and his court boarded the sleds and left town. Without explaining why, he established himself in a village south of Moscow. For an entire month a kind of terror gripped the capital, for the Muscovites feared that Ivan had abandoned them to the bloodthirsty boyars. Shops closed up and riotous mobs gathered daily. Finally, on January 3 of 1565, a letter arrived from the Tsar, explaining that he could no longer bear the boyars' betrayals and had decided to abdicate once and for all. Read aloud in public, the letter had a startling effect, merchants end. Commoners blamed the boyars for Ivan's decision, and took to the streets, terrifying the nobility with their fury. Soon a group of delegates representing the church, the princes, and the people made the journey to Ivan's village, and begged the Tsar, in the name of the Holy Land of Russia, to return to the throne. Ivan listened but would not change his mind. After days of hearing their pleas, however, he offered his subjects a choice, either they grant him absolute powers to govern as he pleased, with no interference from the boyars, or they find a new leader. Faced with a choice between civil war and the acceptance of despotic power, almost every sector of Russian society opted for a strong czar, calling for Ivan's return to Moscow and the restoration of law and order. In February, with much celebration, Ivan returned to Moscow. The Russians could no longer complain if he behaved dictatorially, they had given him this power themselves. The liar once upon a time there was a king of Armenia, who, being of a curious turn of mind and in need of some new diversion, sent his heralds throughout the land to make the following proclamation, hear this. Whatever man among you can prove himself the most outrageous liar in Armenia shall receive an apple made of pure gold from the hands of his majesty the king. People began to swarm to the palace from every town and hamlet in the country, people of all ranks and conditions, princes, merchants, farmers, priests, rich and poor, tall and short, fat and thin. There was no lack of liars in the land, and each one told his tale to the king. A ruler, however, has heard practically every sort of lie, and none of those now told him convinced the king that he had listened to the best of them. The king was beginning to grow tired of his new sport and was thinking of calling the whole contest off without declaring a winner, when there appeared before him a poor, ragged man, carrying a large earthenware pitcher under his arm. What can I do? For you? asked his majesty. Sire, said the poor man, slightly bewildered. Surely you remember. You owe me a pot of gold, and I have come to collect it. You are a perfect liar, sir, exclaimed the king. I owe you no money. A perfect liar, am I, said the poor man. Then give me the golden apple. The king, realizing that the man was trying to trick him, started to hedge. No, no. You are not a liar. Then give me the pot of gold you owe me, sire, 
said the man. The king saw the dilemma. He handed over the golden apple. Armenian Folk Tales and Fables, retold by Charles Downing, 1993. Interpretation Ivan the Terrible faced a terrible dilemma, to give in to the boyars would lead to certain destruction, but civil war would bring a different kind of ruin. Even if Ivan came out of such a war on top, the country would be devastated and its divisions would be stronger than ever. His weapon of choice in the past had been to make a bold, offensive move. Now, however, that kind of move would turn against him, the more boldly he confronted his enemies, the worse the reactions he would spark. The main weakness of a show of force is that it stirs up resentment and eventually leads to a response that eats at your authority. Ivan, immensely creative in the use of power, saw clearly that the only path to the kind of victory he wanted was a false withdrawal. He would not force the country over to his position, he would give it options, either his abdication, and certain anarchy, or his accession to absolute power. To back up his move, he made it clear that he preferred to abdicate, call my bluff, he said, and watch what happens. No one called his bluff. By withdrawing for just a month, he showed the country a glimpse of the nightmares that would follow his abdication, Tartar invasions, civil war, ruin. All of these did eventually come to pass after Ivan's death, in the infamous, Time of the Troubles. Withdrawal and disappearance are classic ways of controlling the Options You give people a sense of how things will fall apart without you, and you offer them a choice, I stay away and you suffer the consequences, or I return under circumstances that I dictate. In this method of controlling people's options, they choose the option that gives you power because the alternative is just too unpleasant. You force their hand, but indirectly, they seem to have a choice. Whenever people feel they have a choice, they walk into your trap that much more easily. Observance of the law too as a 17th century French courtesan, Ninon de L'Enclos found that her life had certain pleasures. Her lovers came from royalty and aristocracy, and they paid her well, entertained her with their wit and intellect, satisfied her rather demanding sensual needs, and treated her almost as an equal. Such a life was infinitely preferable to marriage. In 1643, however, Ninon's mother died suddenly, leaving her, at the age of 23, totally alone in the world, no family, no dowry, nothing to fall back upon. A kind of panic overtook her and she entered a convent, turning her back on her illustrious lovers. A year later she left the convent and moved to Lyons. When she finally reappeared in Paris, in 1648, lovers and suitors flocked to her door in greater numbers than ever before, for she was the wittiest and most spirited courtesan of the time and her presence had been greatly missed. Ninon's followers quickly discovered, however, that she had changed her old way of doing things, and had set up a new system of options. The dukes, seigneurs, and princes who wanted to pay for her services could continue to do so, but they were no longer in control, she would sleep with them when she wanted, according to her whim. All their money bought them was a possibility. If it was her pleasure to sleep with them only once a month, so be it. Those who did not want to be what Ninon called a payeur could join the large and growing group of men she called her martyrs, men who visited her apartment principally for her friendship, her biting wit, her lute playing, and the company of the most vibrant minds of the period, including Moliere, La Rochefoucauld, and Saint Evermond. The martyrs, too, however, entertained a possibility, she would regularly select from them a favori a man who would become her lover without having to pay, and to whom she would abandon herself completely for as long as she so desired, a week, a few months, rarely longer. A payeur could not become a favori, but a martyr had no guarantee of becoming one, and indeed could remain disappointed for an entire lifetime. The poet Charleville, for example, never enjoyed Ninon's favors, but never stopped coming to visit, he did not want to do without her company. As word of this system reached polite French society, Ninon became the object of intense hostility. Her reversal of the position of the courtesan scandalized the queen mother and her court. Much to their horror, however, 
it did not discourage her male suitors, indeed it only increased their numbers and intensified their desire. It became an honor to be a payeur, helping Ninan to maintain her lifestyle and her glittering salon. Accompanying her sometimes to the theater, and sleeping with her when she chose. Even more distinguished were the martyrs, enjoying her company without paying for it and maintaining the hope, however remote, of some day becoming her favori. That possibility spurred on many a young nobleman, as word spread that none among the courtesans could surpass Ninon in the art of love. And so the married and the single, the old and the young, entered her web and chose one of the two options presented to them, both of which amply satisfied her. Interpretation The life of the courtesan entailed the possibility of a power that was denied a married woman, but it also had obvious perils. The man who paid for the courtesan's services in essence owned her, determining when he could possess her and when, later on, he would abandon her. As she grew older, her options narrowed, as fewer men chose her. To avoid a life of poverty she had to amass her fortune while she was young. The courtesan's legendary greed, then, reflected a practical necessity, yet also lessened her allure, since the illusion of being desired is important to men, who are often alienated if their partner is too interested in their money. As the courtesan aged, then, she faced a most difficult fate. J. P. Morgan Sr. once told a jeweler of his acquaintance that he was interested in buying a pearl scarf pin. Just a few weeks later, the jeweler happened upon a magnificent pearl. He had it mounted in an appropriate setting and sent it to Morgan, together with a bill for $5,000. The following day the package was returned. Morgan's accompanying note read, I like the pin, but I don't like the price. If you will accept the enclosed check for $4,000, please send back the box with the seal unbroken. The enraged jeweler refused the check and dismissed the messenger in disgust. He opened up the box to reclaim the unwanted pin, only to find that it had been removed. In its place was a check for $5,000. The Little, Brown Book of Anecdotes, Clifton Fadiman, ed., 1985. Ninon de Lanclo had a horror of any kind of dependence. She early on tasted a kind of equality with her lovers, and she would not settle into a system that left her such distasteful options. Strangely enough, the system she devised in its place seemed to satisfy her suitors as much as it did her. The payers may have had to pay, but the fact that Ninon would only sleep with them when she wanted to gave them a thrill unavailable with every other courtesan, she was yielding out of her own desire. The martyr's avoidance of the taint of having to pay gave them a sense of superiority, as members of Ninon's fraternity of admirers, they also might someday experience the ultimate pleasure of being her favori. Finally, Ninon did not force her suitors into either category. They could choose which side they preferred, a freedom that left them a vestige of masculine pride. Such is the power of giving people a choice, or rather the illusion of one, for they are playing with cards you have dealt them. Where the alternative set up by Ivan the Terrible involved a certain risk, one option would have led to his losing his power, Ninon created a situation in which every option redounded to her favor. From the payeurs she received the money she needed to run her salon. And from the martyrs she gained the ultimate in power, she could surround herself with a bevy of admirers, a harem from which to choose her lovers. The system, though, depended on one critical factor, the possibility, however remote, that a martyr could become a favori. The illusion that riches, glory, or sensual satisfaction may someday fall into your victim's lap is an irresistible carrot to include in your list of choices. That hope, however slim, will make men accept the most ridiculous situations, because it leaves them the all-important option of a dream. The illusion of choice, married to the possibility of future good fortune, will lure the most stubborn sucker into your glittering web. Keys to power words like freedom, options, and choice evoke a power of possibility far beyond the reality of the benefits they entail. When examined closely, the choices we have, in the marketplace, in elections, in our jobs, tend to have noticeable limitations, 
they are often a matter of a choice simply between A and B, with the rest of the alphabet out of the picture. Yet as long as the faintest mirage of choice flickers on, we rarely focus on the missing options. We choose to believe that the game is fair, and that we have our freedom. We prefer not to think too much about the depth of our liberty to choose. This unwillingness to probe the smallness of our choices stems from the fact that too much freedom creates a kind of anxiety. The phrase, unlimited. Options sounds infinitely promising, but unlimited options would actually paralyze us and cloud our ability to choose. Our limited range of choices comforts us. This supplies the clever and cunning with enormous opportunities for deception. For people who are choosing between alternatives find it hard to believe they are being manipulated or deceived, they cannot see that you are allowing them a small amount of free will in exchange for a much more powerful imposition of your own will. Setting up a narrow range of choices, then, should always be a part of your deceptions. There is a saying, if you can get the bird to walk into the cage on its own, it will sing that much more prettily. The following are among the most common forms of controlling the options. Color the choices. This was a favored technique of Henry Kissinger. As President Richard Nixon's Secretary of State, Kissinger considered himself better informed than his boss, and believed that in most situations he could make the best decision on his own. But if he tried to determine policy, he would offend or perhaps enrage a notoriously insecure man. So Kissinger would propose three or four choices of action for each situation, and would present them in such a way that the one he preferred always seemed the best solution compared to the others. Time after time, Nixon fell for the bait, never suspecting that he was moving where Kissinger pushed him. This is an excellent device to use on the insecure master. Force the resistor. One of the main problems faced by Dr. Milton H. Erickson, a pioneer of hypnosis therapy in the 1950s, was the relapse. His patients might seem to be recovering rapidly, but their apparent susceptibility to the therapy masked a deep resistance, they would soon relapse into old habits, blame the doctor, and stop coming to see him. To avoid this, Erickson began ordering some patients to have a relapse, to make themselves feel as bad as when they first came in, to go back to. Square 1 Faced with this option, the patients would usually choose to avoid the relapse, which, of course, was what Erickson really wanted. This is a good technique to use on children and other willful people who enjoy doing the opposite of what you ask them to, push them to choose what you want them to do by appearing to advocate the opposite. Alter the playing field. In the 1860s, John D. Rockefeller set out to create an oil monopoly. If he tried to buy up the smaller oil companies they would figure out what he was doing and fight back. Instead, he began secretly buying up the railway companies that transported the oil. When he then attempted to take over a particular company, and met with resistance, he reminded them of their dependence on the rails. Refusing them shipping, or simply raising their fees, could ruin their business. Rockefeller altered the playing field so that the only options the small oil producers had were the ones he gave them. In this tactic your opponents know their hand is being forced, but it doesn't matter. The technique is effective against those who resist at all costs. The Shrinking Options The late 19th century art dealer Ambrose Vollard perfected this technique. Customers would come to Vollard's shop to see some saisons. He would show three paintings, neglect to mention a price, and pretend to doze off. The visitors would have to leave without deciding. They would usually come back the next day to see the paintings again, but this time Vollard would pull out less interesting works, pretending he thought they were the same ones. The baffled customers would look at the new offerings, leave to think them over, and return yet again. Once again the same thing would happen. Vollard would show paintings of lesser quality still. Finally the buyers would realize they had better grab what he was showing them, because tomorrow they would have to settle for something worse, perhaps at even higher prices. A variation on this technique is to raise the price every time the buyer hesitates and another day goes by. This is an excellent negotiating ploy to use on the chronically indecisive, 
who will fall for the idea that they are getting a better deal today than if they wait till tomorrow. The weak man on the precipice. The weak are the easiest to maneuver by controlling their options. Cardinal de Retz, the great 17th century provocateur, served as an unofficial assistant to the Duke of Orleans, who was notoriously indecisive. It was a constant struggle to convince the Duke to take action, he would hem and haw, weigh the options, and wait till the last moment, giving everyone around him an ulcer. But Retz discovered a way to handle him, he would describe all sorts of dangers, exaggerating them as much as possible, until the duke saw a yawning abyss in every direction except one, the one Retz was pushing him to take. This tactic is similar to, color the choices, but with the weak you have to be more aggressive. Work on their emotions, use fear and terror to propel them into action. Try reason and they will always find a way to procrastinate. Brothers in crime. This is a classic con artist technique, you attract your victims to some criminal scheme, creating a bond of blood and guilt between you. They participate in your deception, commit a crime, or think they do, see the story of Sam Giesel in Law 3, and are easily manipulated. Serge Stavisky, the great French con artist of the 1920s, so entangled the government in his scams and swindles that the state did not dare to prosecute him, and chose to leave him alone. It is often wise to implicate in your deceptions the very person who can do you the most harm if you fail. Their involvement can be subtle, even a hint of their involvement will narrow their options and by their silence. The Horns of a Dilemma This idea was demonstrated by General William Sherman's infamous march through Georgia during the American Civil War. Although the Confederates knew what direction Sherman was heading, in, they never knew if he would attack from the left or the right, for he divided his army into two wings, and if the rebels retreated from one wing they found themselves facing the other. This is a classic trial lawyer's technique, the lawyer leads the witnesses to decide between two possible explanations of an event, both of which poke a hole in their story. They have to answer the lawyer's questions, but whatever they say they hurt themselves. The key to this move is to strike quickly deny the victim the time to think of an escape. As they wriggle between the horns of the dilemma, they dig their own grave. Understand, in your struggles with your rivals, it will often be necessary for you to hurt them. And if you are clearly the agent of their punishment, expect a counterattack, expect revenge. If, however, they seem to themselves to be the agents of their own misfortune, they will submit quietly. When Ivan left Moscow for his rural village, the citizens asking him to return agreed to his demand for absolute power. Over the years to come, they resented him less for the terror he unleashed on the country, because, after all, they had granted him his power themselves. This is why it is always good to allow your victims their choice of poison, and to cloak your involvement in providing it to them as far as possible. Image, The Horns of the Bull the bull backs you into the corner with its horns, not a single horn, which you might be e able to escape, but a pair of horns that trap you within their hold. Run right or run left, either way you move into their piercing ends and are gored. Authority, for the wounds and every other evil that men inflict upon themselves spontaneously, and of their own choice, are in the long run less painful than those inflicted by others. Niccolo Machiavelli 1469-1527 Reversal controlling the options has one main purpose, to disguise yourself as the agent of power and punishment. The tactic works best, then, for those whose power is fragile, and who cannot operate too openly without incurring suspicion, resentment, and anger. Even as a general rule, however, it is rarely wise to be seen as exerting power directly and forcefully, no matter how secure or strong you are. It is usually more elegant and more effective to give people the illusion of choice. On the other hand, by limiting other people's options you sometimes limit your own. There are situations in which it is to your advantage to allow your rivals a large degree of freedom, as you watch them operate, you give yourself rich opportunities to spy, gather information, and plan your deceptions. The 19th-century banker James Rothschild liked this method, 
he felt that if he tried to control his opponent's movements, he lost the chance to observe their strategy and plan a more effective course. The more freedom he allowed them in the short term, the more forcefully he could act against them in the long run. Law 32. Play to people's fantasies Judgment the truth is often avoided because it is ugly and unpleasant. Never appeal to truth and reality unless you are prepared for the anger that comes from disenchantment. Life is so harsh and distressing that people who can manufacture romance or conjure up fantasy are like oases in the desert, everyone flocks to them. There is great power in tapping into the fantasies of the masses. Observance of the law of the city-state of Venice was prosperous for so long that its citizens felt their small republic had destiny on its side. In the Middle Ages and High Renaissance, its virtual monopoly on trade to the East made it the wealthiest city in Europe. Under a beneficent republican government, Venetians enjoyed liberties that few other Italians had ever known. Yet in the 16th century their fortunes suddenly changed. The opening of the New World transferred power to the Atlantic side of Europe, to the Spanish and Portuguese, and later the Dutch and English. Venice could not compete economically and its empire gradually dwindled. The final blow was the devastating loss of a prized Mediterranean possession, the island of Cyprus, captured from Venice by the Turks in 1570. The funeral of the lioness the lion having suddenly lost his queen, everyone hastened to show allegiance to the monarch, by offering consolation. These compliments, alas, served but to increase the widower's affliction. Due notice was given throughout the kingdom that the funeral would be performed at a certain time and place, the lion's officers were ordered to be in attendance, to regulate the ceremony, and place the company according to their respective rank. One may well judge no one absented himself. The monarch gave way to his grief, and the whole cave, lions having no other temples, resounded with his cries. After his example, all the courtiers roared in their different tones. A court is the sort of place where everyone is either sorrowful, gay, or indifferent to everything, just as the reigning prince may think fit, or if anyone is not actually, he at least tries to appear so, each endeavors to mimic the master. It is truly said that one mind animates a thousand bodies, clearly showing that human beings are mere machines. But let us return to our subject. The stag alone shed no tears. How could he, forsooth? The death of the queen avenged him, she had formerly strangled his wife and son. A courtier thought fit to inform the bereaved monarch, and even affirmed that he had seen the stag laugh. The rage of a king, says Solomon, is terrible, and especially that of a lion king. Pitiful forester, he exclaimed, darest thou laugh when all around are dissolved in tears? We will not soil our royal claws with thy profane blood. Do thou, brave wolf, avenge our queen, by immolating this traitor to her august manies. Hereupon the stag replied, Sire, the time for weeping is past, grief is here superfluous. Your revered spouse appeared to me but now, reposing on a bed of roses, I instantly recognized her. Friend, said she to me, have done with this funereal pomp, cease these useless tears. I have tasted a thousand delights in the Elysian fields, conversing with those who are saints like myself. Let the king's despair remain for some time unchecked, it gratifies me. Scarcely had he spoken, when everyone shouted, a miracle. A miracle. The stag, instead of being punished, received a handsome gift. Do but entertain a king with dreams, flatter him, and tell him a few pleasant fantastic lies, whatever his indignation against you may be, he will swallow the bait, and make you his dearest friend. Fables, Jean de L.A. Fontaine, 1621-1695 Now noble families went broke in Venice, and banks began to fold. A kind of gloom and depression settled over the citizens. They had known A glittering past, had either lived through it or heard stories about it from their elders. The closeness of the glory years was humiliating. The 
Venetians half believed that the goddess Fortune was only playing a joke on them, and that the old days would soon return. For the time being, though, what could they do? In 1589 rumors began to swirl around Venice of the arrival not far away of a mysterious man called I.L. Bragadino, a master of alchemy, a man who had won incredible wealth through his ability, it was said, to multiply gold through the use of a secret substance. The rumor spread quickly because a few years earlier, a Venetian nobleman passing through Poland had heard a learned man prophesy that Venice would recover her past glory and power if she could find a man who understood the alchemic art of manufacturing gold. And so, as word reached Venice of the gold this Bragadino possessed, he clinked gold coins continuously in his hands, and golden objects filled his palace, some began to dream, through him, their city would prosper again. Members of Venice's most important noble families accordingly went together to Brescia, where Bragadino lived. They toured his palace and watched in awe as he demonstrated his gold-making abilities, taking a pinch of seemingly worthless minerals and transforming it into several ounces of gold dust. The Venetian Senate prepared to debate the idea of extending an official invitation to Bragadino to stay in Venice at the city's expense, when word suddenly reached them that they were competing with the Duke of. Mantua for his services. They heard of a magnificent party in Bragadino's palace for the duke, featuring garments with golden buttons, gold watches, gold plates, and on and on. Worried they might lose Bragadino to Mantua, the Senate voted almost unanimously to invite him to Venice, promising him the mountain of money he would need to continue living in his luxurious style, but only if he came right away. Late that year the mysterious Bragadino arrived in Venice. With his piercing dark eyes under thick brows, and the two enormous black mastiffs that accompanied him everywhere, he was forbidding and impressive. He took up residence in a sumptuous palace on the island of the Judeca, with the Republic funding his banquets, his expensive clothes, and all his other whims. A kind of alchemy fever spread through Venice. On street corners, hawkers would sell coal, distilling apparatus, bellows, how-to books on the subject. Everyone began to practice alchemy, everyone except Bragadino. The alchemist seemed to be in no hurry to begin manufacturing the gold. That would save Venice from ruin. Strangely enough this only increased his popularity in following, people thronged from all over Europe, even Asia, to meet this remarkable man. Months went by, with gifts pouring into Bragadino from all sides. Still he gave no sign of the miracle that the Venetians confidently expected him to produce. Eventually the citizens began to grow impatient, wondering if he would wait forever. At first the senators warned them not to hurry him, he was a capricious devil, who needed to be cajoled. Finally, though, the nobility began to wonder too, and the Senate came under pressure to show a return on the city's ballooning investment. Bragadino had only scorn for the doubters, but he responded to them. He had, he said, already deposited in the city's mint the mysterious substance with which he multiplied gold. He could use this substance up all at once, and produce double the gold, but the more slowly the process took place, the more it would yield. If left alone for seven years, sealed in a casket, the substance would multiply the gold in the mint thirty times over. Most of the senators agreed to wait to reap the gold mine Bragadino promised. Others, however, were angry, seven more years of this man. Living royally at the public trough. And many of the common citizens of Venice echoed these sentiments. Finally the alchemist's enemies demanded he produce a proof of his skills, a substantial amount of gold, and soon. Lofty, apparently devoted to his art, Bragadino responded that Venice, in its impatience, had betrayed him, and would therefore lose his services. He left town, going first to nearby Padua, then, in 1590, to Munich, at the invitation of the Duke of Bavaria, who, like the entire city of Venice, had known great wealth but had fallen into bankruptcy through his own profligacy, 
and hoped to regain his fortune through the famous alchemist services. And so Bragadino resumed the comfortable arrangement he had known in Venice, and the same pattern repeated itself. Interpretation The young Cypriot Mamugna had lived in Venice for several years before reincarnating himself as the alchemist Bragadino. He saw how gloom had settled on the city, how everyone was hoping for a redemption from some indefinite source. While other charlatans mastered everyday cons based on sleight of hand, Mamugna mastered human nature. With Venice as his target from the start, he traveled abroad, made some money through his alchemy. Scams, and then returned to Italy, setting up shop in Brescia. There he created a reputation that he knew would spread to Venice. From a distance, in fact, his aura of power would be all the more impressive. At first Mamugna did not use vulgar demonstrations to convince people of his alchemic skill. His sumptuous palace, his opulent garments, the clink of gold in his hands, all these provided a superior argument to anything rational. And these established the cycle that kept him going, his obvious wealth confirmed his reputation as an alchemist, so that patrons like the Duke of Mantua gave him money, which allowed him to live in wealth, which reinforced his reputation as an alchemist, and so on. Only once this reputation was established, and dukes and senators were fighting over him, did he resort to the trifling necessity of a demonstration. By then, however, people were easy to deceive, they wanted to believe. The Venetian senators, who watched him multiply gold wanted to believe so badly that they failed. To notice the glass pipe up his sleeve, from which he slipped gold dust into his pinches of minerals. Brilliant and capricious, he was the alchemist of their fantasies, and once he had created an aura like this, no one noticed his simple deceptions. If you want to tell lies that will be believed, don't tell the truth that won't. Emperor Tokugawa Ayasu of Japan, 17th century Such is the power of the fantasies that take root in us, especially in times of scarcity and decline. People rarely believe that their problems arise from their own misdeeds and stupidity. Someone or something out there is to blame, the other, the world, the gods, and so salvation comes from the outside as well. Had Bragadino arrived in Venice armed with a detailed analysis of the reasons behind the city's economic decline, and of the hard-nosed steps that it could take to turn things around, he would have been scorned. The reality was too ugly and the solution too painful, mostly the kind of hard work that the citizens' ancestors had mustered to create an empire. Fantasy, on the other hand, in this case the romance of alchemy, was easy to understand and infinitely more palatable. To gain power, you must be a source of pleasure for those around you, and pleasure comes from playing to people's fantasies. Never promise a gradual improvement through hard work, rather, promise the moon, the great and sudden transformation, the pot of gold. No man need despair of gaining converts to the most extravagant hypothesis who has art enough to represent it in favorable colors. David Hume, 1711-1776 Key's two-power fantasy can never operate alone. It requires the backdrop of the humdrum and the mundane. It is the oppressiveness of reality that allows fantasy to take root and bloom. In 16th century Venice, the reality was one of decline and loss of prestige. The corresponding fantasy described a sudden recovery of past glories through the miracle of alchemy. While the reality only got worse, the Venetians inhabited a happy dream world in which their city restored its fabulous wealth and power overnight, turning dust into gold. The person who can spin a fantasy out of an oppressive reality has access to untold power. As you search for the fantasy that will take hold of the masses, then, keep your eye on the banal truths that weigh heavily on us all. Never be distracted by people's glamorous portraits of themselves and their lives, search and dig for what really imprisons them. Once you find that, you have the magical key that will put great power in your hands. Although times and people change, let us examine a few of the oppressive realities that endure, and the opportunities for power they provide. The reality, change is slow and gradual. It requires hard work, a bit of luck, a fair amount of self-sacrifice, and a lot of patience. 
The fantasy, a sudden transformation will bring a total change in one's fortunes, bypassing work, luck, self-sacrifice, and time in one fantastic stroke. This is of course the fantasy par excellence of the charlatans who prowl among us to this day, and was the key to Bragadino's success. Promise a great and total change, from poor to rich, sickness to health, misery to ecstasy, and you will have followers. How did the great 16th century German quack Leonard Thurneiser become the court physician for the elector of Brandenburg without ever studying medicine? Instead of offering amputations, leeches, and foul tasting purgatives, the medicaments of the time, Thurneiser offered sweet tasting elixirs and promised instant recovery. Fashionable courtiers especially wanted his solution of drinkable gold, which cost a fortune. If some inexplicable illness assailed you, Thurneiser would consult a horoscope and prescribe a talisman. Who could resist such a fantasy, health and well being without sacrifice and pain? The reality, the social realm has hard set codes and boundaries. We understand these limits and know that we have to move within the same familiar circles, day in and day out. The fantasy, we can enter a totally new world with different codes and the promise of adventure. In the early 1700s, all London was abuzz with talk of a mysterious stranger, a young man named George Salmanazar. He had arrived from what was to most Englishmen a fantastical land, the island of Formosa, now Taiwan, off the coast of China. Oxford University engaged Salmanazar to teach the island's language, a few years later he translated the Bible into Formosan, then wrote a book, an immediate bestseller, on Formosa's history and geography. English royalty wined and dined the young man, and everywhere he went he entertained his hosts with wondrous stories of his homeland, and its bizarre customs. After Salmanazar died, however, his will revealed that he was in fact merely a Frenchman with a rich imagination. Everything he had said about Formosa, its alphabet, its language, its literature, its entire culture, he had invented. He had built on the English public's ignorance of the place to concoct an elaborate story that fulfilled their desire for the exotic and strange. British culture's rigid control of people's dangerous dreams gave him the perfect opportunity to exploit their fantasy. The fantasy of the exotic, of course, can also skirt the sexual. It must not come too close, though, for the physical hinders the power of fantasy, it can be seen, grasped, and then tired of, the fate of most courtesans. The bodily charms of the mistress only whet the master's appetite for more and different pleasures, a new beauty to adore. To bring power, fantasy must remain to some degree unrealized, literally unreal. The dancer Mata Hari, for instance, who rose to public prominence in Paris before World War I, had quite ordinary looks. Her power came from the fantasy she created of being strange and exotic, unknowable and indecipherable. The taboo she worked with was less sex itself than the breaking of social codes. Another form of the fantasy of the exotic is simply the hope for relief. From boredom. Con artists love to play on the oppressiveness of the working world, its lack of adventure. Their cons might involve, say, the recovery of lost Spanish treasure, with the possible participation of an alluring Mexican senorita and a connection to the president of a South American country, anything offering release from the humdrum. The reality, society is fragmented and full of conflict. The fantasy, people can come together in a mystical union of souls. In the 1920s the con man Oscar Hartzell made a quick fortune out of the age-old Sir Francis Drake swindle, basically promising any sucker who happened to be surnamed Drake a substantial share of the long-lost Drake treasure to which Hartzell had access. Thousands across the Midwest fell for the scam, which Hartzell cleverly turned into a crusade against the government and everyone else who was trying to keep the Drake fortune out of the rightful hands of its heirs. There developed a mystical union of the oppressed Drakes, with emotional rallies and meetings. Promise such a union and you can gain much power, but it is a dangerous power that can easily turn against you. This is a fantasy for demagogues to play on. The reality, death. The dead cannot be brought back, the past cannot be changed. 
The fantasy, a sudden reversal of this intolerable fact. This con has many variations, but requires great skill and subtlety. The beauty and importance of the art of Vermeer have long been recognized, but his paintings are small in number, and are extremely rare. In the 1930s, though, Vermeers began to appear on the art market. Experts were called on to verify them, and pronounce them real. Possession of these new Vermeers would crown a collector's career. It was like the resurrection of Lazarus, in a strange way, Vermeer had been brought back to life. The past had been changed. Only later did it come out that the new Vermeers were the work of a middle-aged Dutch forger named Han van Meegeren. And he had chosen Vermeer for his scam because he understood fantasy, the paintings would seem real precisely because the public, and the experts as well, so desperately wanted to believe they were. Remember, the key to fantasy is distance. The distant has allure and promise, seems simple and problem-free. What you are offering, then, should be ungraspable. Never let it become oppressively familiar, it is the mirage in the distance, withdrawing as the sucker approaches. Never be too direct in describing the fantasy, keep it vague. As a forger of fantasies, let your victim come close enough to see and be tempted, but keep him far away enough that he stays dreaming and desiring. Image, the moon. Unattainable, always changing shape, disappearing and reappearing. We look at it, imagine, wonder, and pine, never familiar, continuous provoker of dreams. Do not offer the obvious. Promise the moon. Authority, a lie is an allurement, a fabrication, that can be embellished into a fantasy. It can be clothed in the raiments of a mystic conception. Truth is cold, sober fact, not so comfortable to absorb. A lie is more palatable. The most detested person in the world is the one who always tells the truth, who never romances. I found it far more interesting and profitable to romance than to tell the truth. Joseph Weil, a.k.a. The Yellow Kid, 1875-1976 Reversal If there is power in tapping into the fantasies of the masses, there is also danger. Fantasy usually contains an element of play, the public half realizes it is being duped, but it keeps the dream alive anyway, relishing the entertainment and the temporary diversion from the everyday that you are providing. So keep it light, never come too close to the place where you are actually expected to produce results. That place may prove extremely hazardous. After Bragadino established himself in Munich, he found that the sober-minded Bavarians had far less faith in alchemy than the temperamental Venetians. Only the Duke really believed in it, for he needed it desperately to rescue him from the hopeless mess he was in. As Bragadino played his familiar waiting game, accepting gifts and expecting patience, the public grew angry. Money was being spent and was yielding no results. In 1592 the Bavarians demanded justice, and eventually Bragadino found himself swinging from the gallows. As before, he had promised and had not delivered, but this time he had misjudged the forbearance of his hosts, and his inability to fulfill their fantasy proved fatal. One last thing, never make the mistake of imagining that fantasy is always fantastical. It certainly contrasts with reality, but reality itself is sometimes so theatrical and stylized that fantasy becomes a desire for simple things. The image Abraham Lincoln created of himself, for example, as a homespun country lawyer with a beard, made him the common man's president. P. T. Barnum created a successful act with Tom Thumb, a dwarf who dressed up as famous leaders of the past such as Napoleon, and lampooned them wickedly. The show delighted everyone, right up to Queen Victoria, by appealing to the fantasy of the time, enough of the vainglorious rulers of history, the common man knows best. Tom Thumb reversed the familiar pattern of fantasy in which the strange and unknown becomes the ideal. But the act still obeyed the law, for underlying it was the fantasy that the simple man is without problems, and is happier than the powerful and the rich. Both Lincoln and Tom Thumb played the commoner but carefully. Maintain their distance. 
Should you play with such a fantasy, you too must carefully cultivate distance and not allow your common persona to become too familiar or it will not project this fantasy.